Chapter 1 One day, when he was naughty, Mr. Bunsey looked over the hedge into Farmer Fred's field and saw it was full of fresh green lettuces. Mr. Bunsey, however, was not full of lettuces. This did not seem fair. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure Rats. They chased the dogs and bit the cats. They... But there was more to it than that. As the amazing Morris said, it was just a story about people and rats. And the difficult part of it was deciding who the people were and who were the rats. But Melissa Grimm said it was a story about stories. It began, part of it began, on the mail coach that came over the mountains from the distant cities of the plain. This was the part of the journey that the driver didn't like. The way wound through forests and around mountains on crumbling roads. There were deep shadows between the trees. Sometimes he thought things were following the coach, keeping just out of sight. It gave him the willies. And on this journey, the really big willy was that he could hear voices. He was sure of it. They were coming from behind him, from the top of the coach, and there was nothing there but the big oilcloth mail sacks and the young man's luggage. There was certainly nothing big enough for a person to hide inside, but occasionally he was sure he heard squeaky voices whispering. There was only one passenger at this point. He was a fair-haired young man, sitting all by himself inside the rocking coach and reading a book. He was reading slowly and aloud, and moving his finger over the words. Uberwald, he read aloud. That's Uberwald, said a small, squeaky but very clear voice. The dots make it a sort of long oo sound, but you're doing well. Uberwald? There's such a thing as too much pronunciation, kid, said another voice, which sounded half asleep. But you know the best thing about Uberwald? It's a long, long way from Stolat. It's a long way from Pseudopolis. It's a long way from anywhere where the head of the watch says he'll have us boiled alive if he ever catches us. And it's not very modern. Bad roads. Lots of mountains in the way. People don't move about much up here, so news doesn't travel very fast, see? And they probably don't have policemen. Kid, we can make a fortune here. Morris, said the boy carefully. Yes, kid. You don't think what we're doing is, you know, dishonest, do you? There was a pause before the voice said, How do you mean, dishonest? Well, we take their money, Morris. The coach rocked and bounced over a pothole. All right, said the unseen Morris, but what you've got to ask yourself is, Who do we take the money from, actually? Well, it's generally the mayor or the city council or someone like that. Right. And that means it's... What? I've told you this bit before. Er... Uh, it is government money, kid, said Morris patiently. Say it. Government money. Government money, said the boy obediently. Right. And what do governments do with money? Uh, they... they play soldiers, said Morris. They have wars. In fact, we probably stopped a lot of wars by taking the money and putting it where it can't do any harm. They put up statues to us if they thought about it. Some of those towns looked pretty poor, Morris, said the kid doubtfully. Hey, just the kind of places that don't need wars, then. Dangerous Beans says it's... The boy concentrated, and his lips moved before he said the word, as if he was trying out the pronunciation to himself. Uh, it's... Un-eth-ickle. That's right, Morris, said the squeaky voice. Dangerous Beans says we shouldn't live by trickery. Listen, Peaches, trickery is what humans are all about, said the voice of Morris. They're so keen on tricking one another all the time that they elect governments to do it for them. We give them value for money. They get a horrible plague of rats. They pay a rat piper. The rats all follow the kid out of town. Hoppity skip. End of plague. Everyone's happy that no one's whittling in the flower anymore. 
the government gets re-elected by a grateful population, general celebration all round. Money well spent, in my opinion. But there's only a plague because we make them think there is, said the voice of Peaches. Well, my dear, another thing all those little governments spend their money on is rat catchers, see? I don't know why I bother with a lot of you, I really don't. Yes, but we... They realised that the coach had stopped. Outside, in the rain, there was the jingle of harness. Then the coach rocked a little, and there was the sound of running feet. A voice from out of the darkness said, Are there any wizards in there? The occupants looked at one another in puzzlement. No, said the kid, the kind of no that means, Why are you asking? How about any witches? said the voice. No, no witches, said the kid. Right. Are there any heavily armed trolls employed by the mail coach company in there? I doubt it, said Morris. There was a moment's pause, filled with the sound of the rain. OK. How about werewolves? said the voice eventually. The speaker sounded as though he was working through a list. What do they look like? said the kid. Oh, well, they look perfectly normal right up to the point where they grow all like air and teeth and giant paws and leap through the window at you, said the voice. We've all got hair and teeth, said the kid. Is that any help? So you are werewolves then? No. Fine, fine. There was another pause filled with rain. OK, vampires, said the voice. It's a wet night. You wouldn't want to be flying in weather like this. Any vampires in there? No, said the kid. We're all perfectly harmless. Oh, boy, muttered Morris, and crawled under the seat. That's a relief, said the voice. You can't be too careful these days. There's a lot of funny people about. A crossbow was pushed through the window, and the voice said, Your money and your life. It's a two-for-one deal, see? The money's in the case on the roof, said Morris's voice from floor level. The highwayman looked around the dark interior of the coach. Who said that? He said. Er, uh, me, said the boy. I didn't see your lips move, kid. Er, uh, the money is on the roof, er, uh, in the case. But if I was you, I wouldn't. Ha! Huh. I just suspect you wouldn't, said the highwayman. His masked face disappeared from the window. The boy picked up the pipe that was lying on the seat beside him. It was the type still known as a penny whistle, although no one could remember when they'd ever cost only a penny. "'Play robbery with violence, kid,' said Morris quietly. "'Couldn't we just give him money?' said the voice of Peaches. It was a little voice. "'Money is for people to give us,' said Morris sternly. Above them they heard the scrape of the case on the roof of the coach as the highwayman dragged it down. The boy obediently picked up the flute and played a few notes. And now there were a number of sounds. There was a creak, a thud, a sort of scuffling noise, and then a very short scream. When there was silence, Morris climbed back onto the seat and poked his head out of the coach into the dark and rainy night. "'Good man,' he said. "'Sensible. The more you struggle, the harder they bite. Probably not broken skin yet. Good. Come forward a bit so I can see you.' But carefully, eh? We don't want anyone to panic, do we? The highwayman reappeared in the light of the coach lamps. He was walking very slowly and carefully, with his legs spread wide apart, and he was quietly whimpering. Ah, oh, there you are, said Morris cheerfully. Went straight up your trouser legs, did they? Typical rat trick. Just nod, because we don't want to set him off. No telling where it might end. The highwayman nodded very slowly. Then his eyes narrowed. "'You're a cat,' he mumbled. Then his eyes crossed, and he gasped. "'Did I say talk?' said Morris. "'I don't think I said talk, did I? "'Did the coachman run away, or did you kill him?' The man's face went blank. "'Ah, a quick learner. "'I like that in a highwayman,' said Morris. "'You can answer that question.' "'Run away,' said the highwayman hoarsely. Morris stuck his head back inside the coach. "'Why do you think?' he said. "'Coach, four horses, probably some valuables in the mailbags. Could be, oh, a thousand dollars or more. The kid could drive it. Worth a try?' "'That's stealing, Morris,' 
said Peaches. She was sitting on the seat beside the kid. She was a rat. Not stealing as such, said Morris. More finding. The drivers run away, so it's like salvage. Hey, that's right, we could turn it in for the reward. That's much better. Legal, too, shall we? People would ask too many questions, said Peaches. If we just leave it, someone yelp will steal it, wailed Morris. Some thief will take it away. Much better if we take it, eh? We're not thieves. We will leave it, Morris, said Peaches. In that case, let's steal the highwayman's horse, said Morris, as if the night wouldn't be properly finished unless they stole something. Stealing from a thief isn't stealing, because it cancels out. We can't stay here all night, said the kid to Peaches. He's got a point. That's right, said the highwayman urgently. You can't stay here all night. That's right, said a chorus of voices from his trousers. We can't stay here all night. Morris sighed and stuck his head out the window again. OK, he said. This is what we're going to do. You're going to stand very still, looking straight in front of you, and you won't try any tricks, because if you do, I've only got to say the word. Don't say the word, said the highwayman, even more urgently. Right, said Morris. And we'll take your horse as punishment, and you can have a coach, because that'll be stealing, and only thieves are allowed to steal. Fair enough? Anything you say, said the highwayman. And then he thought about this, and added hurriedly, But please don't say anything. He kept staring straight ahead. He saw the boy and the cat get out of the coach. He heard various sounds behind him as they took his horse, and he thought about his sword. All right, he was going to get a whole mail coach out of this deal, but there was such a thing as professional pride. All right, said the voice of the cat after a while. We're all going to leave now, and you've got to promise not to move until we're gone. Promise? You have my word as a thief, said the higher man, slowly lowering a hand to his sword. Right, we certainly trust you, said the voice of the cat. The man felt his trousers lighten as the rats poured out and scampered away, and he heard the jingle of harness. He waited a moment, then spun around, drew his sword and ran forward. Slightly forward, in any case. He wouldn't have hit the ground so hard if someone hadn't tied his bootlaces together. They said he was amazing. The amazing Morris, they said. He'd never meant to be amazing. It had just happened. He'd realised something was odd that day, just after lunch, when he'd looked into a reflection in a puddle and thought, That's me. He'd never been aware of himself before. Of course, it was hard to remember how he'd thought before he became amazing. It seemed to him that his mind had been just a kind of soup. And then there had been the rats that lived under the rubbish heap in one corner of his territory. He'd realised there was something educated about the rats when he jumped on one, and it had said, Can we talk about this? And part of his amazing new brain had told him, You couldn't eat someone who could talk. At least, not until you'd heard what they'd got to say. The rat had been Peaches. She wasn't like other rats, nor were dangerous beans. Donut enter. Dark tan. Ham and pork. Big savings. Toxie. And all the rest of them. But then, Morris wasn't like other cats any more. Other cats were, suddenly, stupid. Morris started to hang around with the rats instead. They were someone to talk to. He got on fine so long as he remembered not to eat anyone they knew. The rats spent a lot of time worrying about why they were suddenly so clever. Morris considered that this was a waste of time. Stuff happened. But the rats went on and on about whether it was something on the rubbish heap that they'd eaten, and even Morris could see that that wouldn't explain how he'd got changed, because he'd never eaten rubbish. And he certainly wouldn't eat any rubbish off that heap, seeing as where it came from. He considered that the rats were, quite frankly, dumb. Clever, OK, but dumb. Morris had lived on the streets for four years, and barely had any ears left and scars all over his nose, and he was smart. He swaggered so much when he walked that if he didn't slow down, he flipped himself over. When he fluffed out his tail, people had to step around it. He reckoned you had to be smart to live for four years on these streets, especially with all the dog gangs and freelance furriers. 
one wrong move, and you were lunch in a pair of gloves. Yes, you had to be smart. You also had to be rich. This took some explaining to the rats, but Morris had roamed the city and learned how things worked, and money, he said, was the key to everything. And then one day he'd seen the stupid-looking kid playing the flute with his cap in front of him for pennies, and he'd had an idea. An amazing idea. It just turned up, bang, all at once. Rats, flute, stupid-looking kid. And he'd said, Hey! Stupid-looking kid! How would you like to make your fortune, kid? I'm down here. Dawn was breaking when the highwayman's horse came out of the forests, over a pass, and was reined to a halt in a convenient wood. The river valley stretched out below, with a town hunched up against the cliffs. Morris clambered out of the saddlebag and stretched. The stupid-looking kid helped the rats out of the other bag. They'd spent the journey hunched up on the money, although they were too polite to say that this was because no one wanted to sleep in the same bag as the cat. "'What's the name of the town, kid?' he said, sitting on a rock and looking down at the town. Behind them, the rats were counting the money again, stacking it in piles beside its leather bag. They did this every day. Even though he had no pockets, there was something about Morris that made everyone want to check their change as often as possible. "'It's called Bad Blintz,' said the kid, referring to the guidebook. "'I am. Um, should we be going there if it's bad?' said Peaches, looking up from the counting. "'Ha! It's not called bad because it's bad!' said Morris. That's foreign language for bath, see. So it's really called bath blints, said Donut Enter. Na, na, they call it bath because... The amazing Morris hesitated, but only for a moment. Because they got a bath, see. Very backward place, this. Not many baths around. But they've got one, and they're very proud of it, so they want everyone to know. You probably have to buy tickets even to have a look at it. "'Is that true, Morris?' said Dangerous Beans. He asked the question quite politely, but it was clear that what he was really saying was, "'I don't think that is true, Morris.' "'Ah, yes. Dangerous Beans.' "'Dangerous Beans was difficult to deal with. Really, he shouldn't be. Back in the old days, Morris thought, he wouldn't even have eaten a rat so small and pale and generally ill-looking.' Morris stared down at the little albino rat with its snow-white fur and pinky eyes. Dangerous Beans did not stare back because he was too short-sighted. Of course, being nearly blind was not too much of a drawback to a species that spent most of its time in the darkness and had a sense of smell that was, as far as Morris could understand it, almost as good as sight and sound and speech all put together. For example, the rat always turned to face Morris and looked directly at him when he spoke. It was uncanny. Morris had known a blind cat that walked into doors a lot, but Dangerous Beans never did that. Dangerous Beans wasn't the head rat. That was Hammond Pork's job. Hammond Pork was big and fierce and a bit scabby, and he didn't much like having a new-fangled brain, and he certainly didn't like talking to a cat. He'd been quite old when the rats had changed, as they called it, and he'd said he was too old to change. He left talking to Morris to Dangerous Beans, who'd been born just after the change. And that little rat was clever. Incredibly clever. Too clever. Morris needed all his tricks when he was dealing with Dangerous Beans. "'It's amazing, the stuff I know,' said Morris, blinking slowly at him. "'Anyway, it's a nice-looking town. Looks rich to me. Now what we'll do is—' Um. Morris hated that sound— if there was a sound worse than Dangerous Beans asking one of his odd little questions, it was Peaches clearing her throat. It meant she was going to say something, very quietly, which was going to upset him. Yes, he said sharply. Do we really need to keep on doing this? she said. Well, of course, no, said Morris. I don't have to be here at all. I'm a cat, right? A cat with my talents? Ha! <laughs> I could have got myself a really cushy job with a conjurer, or a ventriloquist, maybe. There is no end of the things I could be doing, right? Because people like cats. But owing to being incredibly, you know, stupid and kind-hearted, 
I decided to help a bunch of rodents who are, let's be frank here, not exactly number one favorites with humans. Now, some of you, and here he cast a yellow eye towards dangerous beans, have some idea of going to some island somewhere and starting up a kind of rat civilization of your very own, which I think is very, you know, admirable. But for that you need... What did I tell you that you need? Money, Morris, said Dangerous Beans, but... Money, that's right, cause what can you get with money? He looked around the rats. It begins with a B, he prompted. Boats, Morris, but... And then there's all the tools you'll need, and food, of course. There's coconuts, said the stupid-looking kid who was polishing his flute. Oh, did someone speak, said Morris. What do you know about it, kid? You get coconuts, said the kid, on desert islands. A man selling them told me. How, said Morris. He wasn't too sure about coconuts. I don't know. You just get them. Oh, I suppose they grow on trees, do they? said Morris sarcastically. Sheesh, I just don't know what you lot would do without... Anyone, he glared at the group, begins with an M? You, Morris, said Dangerous Beans. But you see, what we think is really... Yes, said Morris. Ahem, said Peaches. Morris groaned. What dangerous beans means, said the female rat, is that all this stealing grains and cheese and gnawing holes in walls is, well, she looked up into Morris's yellow eyes, is not morally right. But it's what rats do, said Morris. But we feel we shouldn't, said dangerous beans. We should be making our own way in the world. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, said Morris, shaking his head. Ho for the island, eh? The kingdom of the rats. Not that I'm laughing at your dream, he added hastily. Everyone needs their little dreams. Morris truly believed that, too. If he knew what it was that people really, really wanted, you very nearly controlled them. Sometimes he wondered what the stupid-looking kid really, really wanted. Nothing, as far as Morris could tell, but to be allowed to play his flute and be left alone. But, well, it was like that thing with the coconuts. Every so often the kid would come out with something that suggested he'd been listening all along. People like that are hard to steer. But cats are good at steering people. A meow here, a purr there, a little gentle pressure with a claw. And Morris had never had to think about it before. Cats didn't have to think. They just had to know what they wanted. Humans had to do the thinking. That's what they were for. Morris thought about the good old days before his brain had started whizzing like a firework. He'd turn up at the door of the university kitchens and look sweet, and then the cooks would try to work out what he wanted. It was amazing. They'd say things like, Does you want a bowl of milk, then? Does you want a biscuit? Does you want these nice scraps, then? And all Morris would have to do was wait patiently until they got to a sound he recognised, like turkey legs or minced lamb. But he was sure he'd never eaten anything magical. There was no such thing as enchanted chicken giblets, were there? It was the rats who'd eaten the magical stuff. The dump they called home, and also called lunch, was round the back of the university. And it was a university for wizards, after all. The old Morris hadn't paid much attention to people who weren't holding bowls, but he was aware that the big men in pointy hats made strange things happen. And now he knew what happened to the stuff they used, too. It got tossed over the wall when they'd finished with it. All the old worn-out spell books and the stubs of the dribbly candles and the remains of the green bubbly stuff in the cauldrons all ended up on the big dump, along with the tin cans and old boxes and the kitchen waste. Well, the wizards had put up signs saying, dangerous and toxic, but the rats hadn't been able to read in those days, and they liked lens. Morris had never eaten anything off the dump. A good motto in life, he'd reckoned, was, don't eat anything that glows. But he'd become intelligent, too, at about the same time as the rats. It was a mystery. 
Since then, he'd done what cats always did. He steered people. Now some of the rats counted as people too, of course. But people were people, even if they had four legs and had called themselves names like Dangerous Beans, which is the kind of name you give yourself if you learn to read before you understood what all the words actually meant, and reading the warning notices and the labels on the old rusty cans gave you names you liked the sound of. The trouble with thinking was that once you started, you went on doing it. And as far as Morris was concerned, the rats were thinking a good deal too much. It was Peaches who was the worst. Morris's usual trick of just talking fast until people got confused didn't work on her at all. Ahem, she began, we think that this should be the last time. Morris stared. The other rats backed away slightly, but Peaches just stared back. This must be the very last time we do the silly plague of rats trick, said Peaches, and that's final. And what does Hammond Pork think about this? said Morris. He turned to the head rat who had been watching them. It was always a good idea appealing to Hammond Pork when Peaches was giving trouble, because he didn't like her very much. What do you mean, think? said Hammond Pork. I, sir, I think we should stop doing this trick, said Peaches, dipping her head nervously. Oh, you think too, do you? said Hammond Pork. Everyone's thinking these days. I think there's a good deal too much of this thinking. That's what I think. We never thought about thinking when I were a lad. We'd never get anything done if we thought first. He gave Morris a glare, too. Hammond Pork didn't like Morris. He didn't like most things that had happened since the change. In fact, Morris wondered how long Hammond Pork was going to last as leader. He didn't like thinking. He belonged to the days when a rat leader just had to be big and stroppy. The world was moving far too fast for him now, which made him angry. He wasn't so much leading now as being pushed. I, Dangerous Beans, sir, believes that we should be thinking of settling down, sir, said Peaches. Morris scowled. Hammond Pork wouldn't listen to Peaches, and she knew it, but Dangerous Beans was the nearest thing the rats had to a wizard, and even big rats listened to him. I thought we were going to get on a boat and find an island somewhere, said Hammond Pork. Very ratty places, boats, he added approvingly. Then he went on, with a slightly nervous and slightly annoyed look at Dangerous Beans, "'And people tell me that we need this money stuff, because now we can do all this thinking, we've got to be eff uh, eff uh, ethical, sir,' said Dangerous Beans, "'which sounds unratty to me. Not that my opinion counts for anything, it seems,' said Hammond Pork. "'We've got enough money, sir,' said Peaches. "'We've already got a lot of money. "'We have got a lot of money, haven't we, Morris?' "'It wasn't a question. "'It was a kind of accusation. "'Well, when you say a lot,' Morris began. "'And in fact we got more money than we thought,' said Peaches, "'still in the same tone of voice. "'It was very polite, but it just kept going, "'and it asked all the wrong questions. "'A wrong question for Morris was one that he didn't want anyone to ask.' Peaches gave her little cough again. The reason I say we've got more money, Morris, is that you said gold coins were shiny like the moon, and silver coins were shiny like the sun, and you'd keep all the silver coins. In fact, Morris, that's the wrong way around. It's the silver coins that are shiny like the moon. Morris thought a rude word in cat's language, which has a great many of them. What was the point of education, he thought, if people went out afterwards and used it? So we think, sir, said Dangerous Beans to Hammond Pork, that after this one last time we should share out the money and go our separate ways. Besides, it's getting dangerous to keep repeating the same trick. We should stop before it's too late. There's a river here. We should be able to get to the sea. An island with no humans or curl... Cats will be a good place, said Hammond Pork. Morris didn't let his smile fade, even though he knew what curl meant. And we wouldn't want to keep Morris from his wonderful new job with the conjurer, said Peaches. Morris's eyes narrowed. For a moment he came close to breaking his iron rule of not eating anyone that could talk. What about you, kid? he said, looking up at the stupid-looking kid. I don't mind, said the kid. Don't mind what, 
said Morris. Don't mind anything, really, said the kid, just so long as no one stops me playing. But you've got to think of the future, said Morris. I am, said the kid. I want to go on playing my flute in the future. It doesn't cost anything to play, but maybe the rats are right. We've had a couple of narrow squeaks, Morris. Morris gave the kid a sharp look to see if he was making a joke, but the kid had never done that kind of thing before. He gave up. Well, not exactly gave up. Morris hadn't got where he was by giving up on problems. He just put them to one side. After all, something always turned up. OK, fine, he said. We'll do it one more time and split the money three ways. Fine, not a problem. But if this is going to be the last time, let's make it one to remember, eh? He grinned. The rats, being rats, were not keen on seeing a grinning cat, but they understood that a difficult decision had been made. They breathed tiny sighs of relief. Are you happy with that, kid? said Morris. I can go and play my flute afterwards, said the kid. Absolutely. OK, said the kid. The money, shiny like the sun and shiny like the moon, was solemnly put back in its bag. The rats dragged the bag under the bushes and buried it. No one could bury money like rats, and it didn't pay to take too much into towns. Then there was the horse. It was a valuable horse, and Morris was very, very sorry to turn it loose. But as Peaches pointed out, it was a highwayman's horse, with very ornate saddle and bridle. Trying to sell it here could be dangerous. People would talk. It might attract the attention of the government. This was no time to have the watch on their tails. Morris walked to the edge of the rock, and looked down at the town, which was waking up under the sunrise. Let's make this the big one, then, eh? he said as the rats came back. I want to see maximum squeaking and making faces at people and whittling on stuff, OK? We think that whittling on stuff is not really... Dangerous Beans began, but... Ahem, said Peaches, and so Dangerous Beans went on. Oh, I suppose if it's the last time. I've whittled on everything since I was out of the nest, said Hammond Pork. Now they tell me it's not right. If that's what thinking means, I'm glad I don't do any... Let's leave them amazed, said Morris. Rats? They think they've seen rats in that town? After they've seen us, they'll be making up stories. Chapter 2 Mr. Bunsey had a lot of friends in Fairy Bottom, but what Mr. Bunsey was friendly with more than anything else was food. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure this was the plan, and it was a good plan. Even the rats, even Peaches, had to admit that it had worked. Everyone knew about plagues of rats. There were famous stories about the rat pipers who made their living going from town to town, getting rid of plagues of rats. Of course, there weren't just rat plagues. Sometimes there were plagues of accordion players, bricks tied up with string, or fish. But it was the rats everyone knew about. And that, really, was it. You didn't need many rats for a plague if they knew their business. One rat popping up here and there, squeaking loudly, taking a bath in the fresh cream and whittling in the flour, could be a plague all by themselves. After a few days of this, it was amazing how glad people were to see the stupid-looking kid with his magical rat pipe. And they were amazed when rats poured out of every hole to follow him out of town. They were so amazed about the fact that there were only a few hundred or so rats. They'd have been really amazed if they'd even found out that the rats and the piper met up with a cat somewhere in the bushes out of town and solemnly counted out the money. Bart Blintz was waking up when Morris entered with the kid. No one bothered them, although Morris got a lot of interest. This did not worry him. He knew he was interesting. Cats walked as if they owned the place anyway, and the world was full of stupid-looking kids, and people weren't rushing to see another one. It looked as though today was a market day, but there weren't many stalls, and they were mostly selling, well, junk, old pans, pots, used shoes, the kind of things people have to sell when they're short of money. Morris had seen plenty of markets on their journey through other towns, and he knew how they should go. There should be fat women selling chickens, he said, and people selling sweets for the kids and ribbons, tumblers and clowns, even weasel jugglers if you're lucky. There's nothing like that. 
"'There's hardly anything to buy by the look of it,' said the kid. "'I thought you said it was a rich town, Morris.' "'Well, it looked rich,' said Morris. "'All those big fields in the valley, all those bolts on the river. "'You'd think the streets would be paved with gold.' "'The kid looked up. "'Funny thing,' he said. "'What?' "'The people look poor,' he said. "'It's the buildings that look rich.' "'And they did. "'Morris wasn't an expert on architecture, "'but the wooden buildings had been carefully carved and painted. "'He noticed something else, too. "'There was nothing careful about the sign "'that had been nailed up on the nearest wall. "'It said, "'Rats. Wanted. Dead. Fifty pence per tail. "'Apply to the Rat Catchers. Care of the Rat House.' The kid was staring at it. "'They must really want to get rid of their rats here,' said Morris cheerfully. "'No one has ever offered a reward of half a dollar a tail,' said the kid. "'I told you this would be the big one,' said Morris. "'We'll be sitting on a pile of gold before the week's out.' "'What's a rat house?' said the kid, doubtfully. "'It can't be a house for rats, can it? And why is everyone staring at you?' "'I'm a handsome-looking cat,' said Morris. Even so, it was a little surprising. People were nudging one another and pointing at him. "'You'd think they'd never seen a cat before,' he muttered, staring at the big building across the street. It was a big, square building, surrounded by people, and the sign said, "'Rat House.' "'Oh, Rat House is just a local word for a—' "'Like the council house, the town hall,' he said. "'It's nothing to do with rats, amusing though it may be.' "'You really know a lot of words, Morris,' said the kid admiringly. "'I amaze myself sometimes,' said Morris. A queue of people were standing in front of one huge open door. Other people, who had presumably done whatever it was the queue was queuing to do, were emerging from another doorway in ones and twos. They were all carrying loaves of bread. "'Shall we queue up, too?' said the kid. "'I shouldn't think so,' said Morris carefully. "'Why not?' "'See those men on the door?' They look like watchmen. They got big truncheons, and everyone's showing them a bit of paper as they go past. I don't like the look of that, said Morris. That looks like government to me. We haven't done anything wrong, said the kid. Not here, anyway. You never know with governments, said Morris. Just stay here, kid. I'll take a look. People stared at Morris when he stalked into the building, but it seemed that in a town beset by rats a cat was quite popular, and no one was inclined to turn him out. A man did try to pick him up, but lost interest when Morris turned and clawed the back of his hand. The queue wound into a big hall and passed in front of a long trestle table. There each person showed their piece of paper to two women in front of a big tray of bread, and were given some bread. Then they moved on to a man with a vat of sausages, and got considerably less sausage. Watching over all this, and occasionally saying something to the food servers, was the mayor. Morris recognised him instantly, because he had a gold chain round his neck. He'd run across a lot of mares since working with the rats. This one was different from the rest. He was smaller, far more worried, and had got a bald spot that he tried to cover with three stands of hair. He was a lot thinner than the other mares Morris had seen, too. He didn't look as though he'd been bought by the ton. So... Food is scarce, Morris thought. They're having to ration it out. Looks like they'll be needing a piper any day now. Lucky for us, we arrived just in time. He walked out again, but this time a bit faster, because he realised that someone was playing a pipe. It was, as he feared, the kid. He'd do it if he left him alone for any length of time. He put his cap on the ground in front of him, and had even accumulated a few coins. The queue had bent around so that people could hear him, and one or two small children were dancing. Morris was only an expert on cat singing, which consists of standing two inches in front of another cat and screaming at them till they give in. Human music always sounded thin and watery to him, but people tapped their feet when they heard the kid play. They smiled for a while. Morris waited until the kid had finished the tune. While the queue was clapping, he sidled up behind the kid, brushed up against him and hissed, "'Well done, fish for brains. We're simply inconspicuous. Come on, let's go. Oh, grab the money, too.' He led the way across the square until he stopped so suddenly that the kid almost walked into him. "'Whoops, here comes some more government,' he said. "'And we know what these are, don't we?' The kid did. They were rat-catchers, two of them. 
Even here, they wore the long, dusty coats and battered black top hats of their profession. They each carried a pole over one shoulder, from which dangled a variety of traps. From the other shoulder hung a big bag, the kind you really wouldn't want to look inside. And each man had a terrier on a string. They were skinny, argumentative dogs, and they growled at Morris when they were dragged past. The queue cheered as the men approached, and clapped when they both reached into their bags and held up a couple of handfuls of what looked, to Morris, like black string. Two hundred to gay! shouted one of the rat-catchers. One of the terriers lunged at Morris, tugging frantically on his string. The cat didn't move. Probably only the stupid-looking kid heard him say, in a low voice, Heel, flea-bag, bad dog. The terrier's face screwed up in the horribly worried expression of a dog trying to have two thoughts at the same time. It knew cats shouldn't talk, and this cat had just talked. This posed a terrible problem. The dog sat down awkwardly and whined. Morris washed himself. It was a deadly insult. The rat-catcher, annoyed at such a cowardly performance from his dog, jerked it away, and dropped a few of the black strings. "'Rat's tails,' said the kid. "'They really must have a problem here.' "'A bigger one than you think,' said Morris, staring at the bunch of tails. "'Just pick those up when no one's looking, will you?' The kid waited until people weren't looking towards them, and reached down. Just as his fingers touched the tangle of tails, a large, shiny black boot trod heavily on it. "'Now you don't want to go touching them, young sir,' said a voice above him. "'You can get plague, you know, from rats. It makes your legs explode.' It was one of the rat-catchers. He gave the kid a big grin, but it was not a humorous one. It smelled of beer. "'That's right, young sir, and then your brains come down your nose.' said the other rat-catcher behind the kid. You wouldn't dare use your hanky, young sir, if you got the plague. My associate has, as usual, put his finger right on it, young sir, said the first rat-catcher, breathing more beer into the kid's face. Which is more than you'd be able to do, young sir, said rat-catcher too, because when you get the plague your fingers go all... Your legs haven't exploded, said the kid. Morris groaned. It was never a good idea to be rude to a smell of beer. But the rat-catchers were at a stage where, against all the odds, they thought they were funny. "'Ah, well said, young sir, but that's because lesson one at the Guild of Rat-catchers' school is not letting your legs explode,' said Rat-catcher one. "'Which is a good thing, cause the second lesson is upstairs,' said Rat-catcher two. "'Oh, I am a one, aren't I, young sir?' The other Rat-catcher picked up the bundle of black strings, and his smile faded as he stared at the kid. "'Ain't I seen you before, kid?' he said. "'And my advice to you is, keep your nose clean and don't say nothing to nobody about anything. Not a word. Understand?' The kid opened his mouth and then shut it hurriedly. The rat-catcher grinned his awful grin again. "'Ah, you'll catch on quick, young sir,' he said. "'Perhaps we'll see you around, eh?' The kid nodded. It seemed the best thing to do. Rat-catcher one leaned down until his red, pock-marked nose was an inch away from the kid's face. "'If you grow up, young sir,' he said. The rat-catchers walked away, dragging their dogs with them. One of the terriers kept looking back at Morris. "'Very unusual rat-catchers they have hereabouts,' said the cat. "'I haven't seen rat-catchers like them before,' said the kid. "'They looked nasty, like they enjoyed it.' I haven't seen rat-catchers who've been so busy, but still have nice clean boots, said Morris. Yes, they did, didn't they? said the kid. But even that's not as odd as the rats around here, said Morris, in the same quiet voice, as though he was adding up money. What's odd about the rats? said the kid. Some of them have very strange tails, said Morris. The kid looked round the square. The queue for bread was still quite long, and it made him nervous. But so did the steam. Little bursts of it puffed up from gratings and manhole covers all over the place, as if the whole town had been built on a kettle. Also, he had the distinct feeling that someone was watching him. "'I think we ought to find the rats and move on,' he said. "'No, this smells like a town with opportunities,' said Morris." Something's going on, and when something's going on, that means someone's getting rich. And when someone's getting rich, I don't see why that should be... M 
us. Yes, but we don't want those people killing dangerous beings and the rest of them. They won't get caught, said Morris. Those men wouldn't win any prizes for thinking. Even ham and pork could run rings round him, I'd say. And dangerous beings has got brains coming out of his ears. I hope not. Nana, nah, said Morris, who generally told people what they wanted to hear. I mean, our rats can outthink most humans, okay? Remember back in Scrote when sardines got in that kettle and blew a raspberry at the old woman when she lifted the lid? Ha! Even ordinary rats can outthink humans. Humans think that just because they're bigger, they're better. Hold on. I'll shut up. Someone's watching us. A man carrying a basket had stopped on his way out of the rat house and was staring at Morris with a good deal of interest. Then he looked up at the kid and said, Good ratter, is he? I'll bet he is. Big cat like that, is he yours, boy? Say yes, Morris whispered. Sort of, yes, said the kid. He picked Morris up. I'll give you five dollars for him, said the man. Ask for ten, Morris hissed. He's not for sale, said the kid. Idiot, Morris purred. Seven dollars, then, said the man. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Four whole loaves, but... That's silly. A loaf of bread shouldn't cost more than twenty pence, said the kid. The man gave him a strange look. You're here, are you? Got plenty of money, have you? Enough, said the kid. You think so? It won't do you much good anyway. Look, four loaves of bread and a bun. I can't say fellows than that. I can get a terrier for ten loaves, and they're mad for rats. No? Well, when you're hungry, you'll give it away for half a slice of bread and scrape, and think you've done well, believe me. Uh, scrape. You scrape the butter on, then you scrape the butter off. Then you eat the bread. He strode off. Morris wriggled out of the kid's arms and landed lightly on the cobbles. Honestly, if only I was good at ventriloquism, we could have made a fortune, he grumbled. Ventriloquism, said the kid, watching the man's retreating back. It's where you open and shut your mouth and I do the talking, said Morris. Why didn't you sell me? I could have been back in ten minutes. I heard of a man who made a fortune selling homing pigeons, and he only had the one. But don't you think there's something wrong with a town where people pay more than a dollar for a loaf of bread, said the kid, and pay half a dollar just for a rat's tail? Just so long as they've got enough money to pay the piper, said Morris. Bit of luck there already being a plague of rats here, eh? Quick, pat me on the head, there's a girl watching us. The kid looked up. There was a girl watching them. People were passing up and down the street, and some of them walked between the kid and the girl, but she stood stock still and just stared at him. And at Morris. She had the same nail-you-to-the-wall look that he associated with Peaches. She looked like the kind of person who asked questions. And her hair was too red, and her nose was too long, and she wore a long black dress with black lace fringing. No good comes of that sort of thing. She marched across the street and confronted the kid. You're new, aren't you? Come here looking for work, have you? Probably sacked from your last job, I expect. Probably because you fell asleep and things got spoiled. That was probably what it was. Or you ran away because your master beat you with a big stick. Although, she added, as another idea struck her, you probably deserved it because of being lazy. And then you probably stole the cat, knowing how much people would pay for a cat here. And you must have gone mad with hunger, because you were talking to the cat, and everyone knows that cats can't talk. Can't say a single word, said Morris. And probably you're a mysterious boy who... The girl stopped, and gave Morris a puzzled look. He arched his back, and said, Prrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
and then you brought the cat here because you know there's a terrible famine, and that's why you're going to sell it, and that man would have given you ten dollars, you know, if you'd held out for it. Ten dollars is too much money even for a good ratter, said the kid. Ratter? He wasn't interested in catching rats, said the red-headed girl. Everyone's hungry here. There's at least two meals on that cat. What? You eat cats here? said Morris, his tail fluffing like a brush. The girl leaned down to Morris with a dreadful grin, just like the one that Peaches always wore when she'd won an argument with him, and prodded him on the nose with a finger. Got you, she said. You fell for a very simple trick. I think you two had better come with me, don't you? Or I'll scream. And people listen to me when I'm screaming. Chapter 3 Never go into the dark wood, my friend, said Ratty Rupert. There are bad things in there. From Mr. Bunsey has an adventure. Far below Morris's paws, the rats were creeping through the undertown of Bart Blintz. Old towns are like that. People build down as well as up. Sellers butt against other sellers, and some of the sellers get forgotten, except by creatures that want to stay out of sight. In the thick, warm, damp darkness, a voice said, "'All right, who's got the matches?' Uh, "'Me, Dangerous Beans. Feeds for. "'Well done, young rat. And who has the candle?' Uh, "'Me, sir. I'm bite size. Um, "'It's hard to translate sir into rat. "'The rat's word for sir isn't a word. "'It's a sort of momentary crouch, indicating that, just at the moment, "'the crouching rat is prepared to accept that the other rat is the boss, "'but that he, or she, shouldn't get funny about it. Good. Put it down and peaches will light it. There was a lot of scuffling in the darkness. Not all the rats had got used to the idea of making fire, and they were getting out of the way. There was a scratching noise, and then the match flared. Holding the match with both front paws, peaches lit the candle stub. The flame swelled for a moment and settled down to a steady glow. Can you really see it? said Hammond Pork. Yes, sir said Dangerous Beans. I am not completely blind. I can tell the difference between light and dark. You know, said Hammond Pork, watching the flame suspiciously, I don't like it at all. Even so, darkness was good enough for our parents. It'll end in trouble. Besides, setting fire to a candle is a waste of perfectly good food. We have to be able to control the fire, sir, said Dangerous Beans calmly. With the flame, we make a statement to the darkness. We say... We are separate. We say, we are not just rats. We say, we are the clan. Hm, said Hammond Pork, which was his usual response when he didn't understand what had just been said. Just lately, he'd been humming a lot. I've heard the younger rats are saying that the shadows frighten them, said Peaches. Why? said Hammond Pork. They're not frightened of complete darkness, are they? Darkness is ratty. "'Being in the dark is what a rat is all about.' "'It's odd,' said Peaches, "'but we didn't know the shadows were there until we had the light.' One of the younger rats timorously raised a paw. "'Um, and even when the light has gone out, we know the shadows are still around,' it said. Dangerous beans turned towards the young rat. "'You're,' he said. A "'Delicious,' said the younger rat. "'Well, delicious,' said Dangerous Beans in a kindly voice. "'Being afraid of shadows is all part of us becoming more intelligent, I think. "'Your mind is working out that there's a you, and there's also everything outside you. "'So now you're not just frightened of things that you can see and hear and smell, "'but also of things that you can sort of see inside your head. "'Learning to face the shadows outside helps us to fight the shadows inside, "'and you can control all the darkness.' It's a big step forward. Well done. Delicious looked slightly proud, but mostly nervous. I don't see the point myself, said Hammond Pork. We used to do all right on the dump, and I was never scared of anything. We were prey to every stray cat and hungry dog, sir, said Dangerous Beans. Oh, well, if we go about cats, growled Hammond Pork. I think we can trust Morris, sir, said Dangerous Beans. Perhaps not when it comes to money, I admit. But he is very good at not eating people who talk, you know. He checks every time. You can trust a cat to be a cat, said Hammond Pork, talking or not. Yes, sir, 
but we are different, and so is he. I believe he is a decent cat at heart. Um, that remains to be seen, said Peaches. But now we are here, let's get organised. Hammondport growled. Who are you to say, let's get organised, he said sharply. Are you the leader, young female, who refuses to rook? No, I am the leader. It's my job to say, let's get organised. Yes, sir, said Peaches, crouching low. How would you like us to be organised, sir? Hammond Pork stared at her. He looked at the waiting rats with their packs and bundles, and then around at the ancient cellar, and then back to the still crouching Peaches. Just... "'Get organised,' he muttered. "'Don't bother me with details. I am a leader.' And he stalked off into the shadows. A young rat was holding up its hand. "'Yeah, what's your name, miss?' "'Er, uh, nourishing, sir,' said the rat. "Er, uh, can I ask a question, sir?' "'Are you new in this platoon, nourishing?' said Dark Tan. "'Yes, sir. Transferred out of the old light whittlers, sir.' "'Ah, oh, they thought you'd be good at trap disposal, did they?' Nourishing looked uneasy, but there was no going back now. Er, uh, not really, sir. They said I couldn't be any worse than I am at whittling, sir. There was general laughter from the ranks. How can a rat not be good at that? said Dark Tan. It's just so, so, so embarrassing, sir. Dark Tan sighed to himself. All this new thinking was producing some strange things. He personally approved of the idea of the right place, but some of the ideas the kids were coming up with were... odd. "'All right,' he said. "'What was your question, Nourishing?' "'Er, uh, you said the second mouse gets the cheese, sir.' "'That's right. That is the squad motto, Nourishing. Remember it. It is your friend.' "'Yes, sir. I will, sir. But doesn't the first mouse get something, sir?' Dark Tan stared at the young rat. He was slightly impressed that she stared back instead of cringing. "'I can see you're going to be a valuable addition to the squad, Nourishing,' he said. He raised his voice. "'Squad, what does the first mouse get?' The roar of voices made dust fall down from the ceiling. "'The trap!' "'And don't you forget it,' said Dark Tan. "'Take them out, special offer. I'll be with you in a minute.' A younger rat stepped forward and faced the squads. "'Let's go, rats! Hut, hut, hut!' The trap squad trotted away. Dark Tan walked over to Dangerous Beans. "'That's got us started,' he said. "'If we can't get the humans looking for a good rat catcher by tomorrow, we don't know our business.' "'We need to stay longer than that,' said Peaches. "'Some of the ladies are going to have their babies.' "'I said we don't know it's safe here yet,' said Dark Tan. "'Do you want to be the one to tell Big Savings?' said Peaches, sweetly. Big Savings was the old head female, widely agreed to have a bite like a pickaxe and muscles like rock. She also had a short temper with males. Even ham and pork kept out of her way when she was in a bad mood. "'Nature has to take its course, obviously,' said Dark Tan quickly. "'But we haven't explored. There must be other rats here.' "'Oh, the kikis all keep out of the way of us,' said Peaches. That was true, Dark Tan had to agree. Ordinary rats did keep out of the way of the changelings. Oh, there was some trouble sometimes, but the changelings were big and healthy and could think their way through a fight. Dangerous Beans was unhappy about this, but, as Ham and Pork said, it was either us or them, and when you got right down to it, it was a rat-eat-rat world. "'I'm going to go and join my squad,' said Dark Tan, still unnerved at the thought of confronting Big Savings. He moved closer. "'What's up with Ham and Pork?' "'He's thinking about things,' said Peaches. "'Thinking?' said Dark Tan blankly. Oh, right. Well, I've got traps to see to. Smell you later. What is the matter with Ham and Pork? said Dangerous Beans, when he and Peaches were alone again. He's getting old, said Peaches. He needs to rest a lot, and I think he's worried that Dark Tan or one of the others is going to challenge him. Will they, do you think? Dark Tan's more wrapped up in breaking traps and testing poisons. There's more... Interesting things to do now than bite one another. Or do rilk, from what I hear, said Dangerous Beans. Peaches looked down demurely. If rats could blush, she would have done. It was amazing how pink eyes that could hardly see you could look straight through you at the same time. The ladies are a lot more choosy, 
she said. They want to find fathers who can think. Good, said Dangerous Beans. We must be careful. We don't need to breed like rats. We don't have to rely on numbers. We are the changelings. Peaches watched him anxiously. When Dangerous Beans was thinking, he seemed to be staring into a world only he could see. What is it this time? she asked. I have been thinking that we shouldn't kill other rats. No rat should kill another rat. Even Kiki's, she said. They are rats, too. Peaches shrugged. Well, we've tried talking to them, and that didn't work. Anyway, they mostly stay away these days. Dangerous Beans was still staring at the unseen world. Even so, he said quietly, I should like you to write it down. Peaches sighed, but went off anyway to one of the packs the rats had carried in and pulled out her bag. It was no more than a roll of cloth with a handle made from a scrap of string, but it was big enough to hold a few matches, some pieces of pencil lead, a tiny sliver of a broken knife blade for sharpening the lids, and a grubby piece of paper. All the important things. She was also the official carrier of Mr. Bunsey. Carrier wasn't quite correct. Dragger was mostly more accurate. But Dangerous Beans always liked to know where it was, and seemed to think better when it was around, and it gave him some comfort, and that was good enough for Peaches. She smoothed out the paper on an ancient brick, picked up a piece of lead, and looked down the list. The first thought had been, In the clan is strength. This had been quite a hard one to translate, but she had made an effort. Most rats couldn't read human. It was just too hard to make the lines and squeals turn into any sense. So Peaches had worked very hard on making a language that rats could read. She tried to draw a big rat made up of little rats. The writing had led to trouble with Ham and Pork. New ideas needed a running jump to get into the old rat's head. Dangerous Beans had explained in his strange, calm voice that writing things down would mean that a rat's knowledge would go on existing even when the rat had died. He said that all rats could learn the knowledge of Ham and Pork. Ham and Pork had said, Not likely. It's taken him years to learn some of the tricks he's learned. Why should he give it all away? That would mean any young rat would know as much as him. Dangerous Beans had said, We cooperate or we die. That had become the next thought. Co-operate had been difficult, but even Kiki's would sometimes lead a blind or wounded comrade by gripping a stick, and that was certainly cooperation. The thick line where she'd press heavily had to mean no. The trap sign could mean die or bad or avoid. The last thought on the paper was not to whittle where you eat. That one was quite simple. She grasped a piece of lead in both paws and carefully drew no rat to kill another rat. She sat back. Yes, not bad. Trap was a good sign for death, and she'd added the dead rat to make it all the more serious. But supposing you have to, she said, still staring at the drawings. Then you have to, said Dangerous Beans, but you shouldn't. Peaches shook her head sadly. She supported Dangerous Beans because there was, well, something about him. He wasn't big or fast, and he was almost blind and quite weak, and sometimes he forgot to eat because he came up with thoughts that nobody, at least nobody who was a rat, had thought before. Most of them had annoyed ham and pork no end, like the time when Dangerous Beans had said, What is a rat? And ham and pork had replied, Beast, claws, tail, run, hide, eat, that's what a rat is. Dangerous Beans had said, But now we can also say, What is a rat? he said, And that means we're more than that. We're rats, Hammond Pork had argued. We run around and squeak and steal and make more rats. That's what we're made for. Who buy? Dangerous Beans had said. And that had led to another argument about the big rat deep under the ground theory. But even ham and pork followed dangerous beans, and so did rats like Dark Tan and Donut enter, and they listened when he talked. Peaches listened when they talked. We were given noses, Dark Tan had told the squads. Who had given them noses? The thoughts of dangerous beans worked their ways into other people's heads without them noticing. 
He came up with new ways of thinking. He came up with new words. He came up with ways of understanding the things that were happening to them. Big rats, rats with scars, listened to the little rat because the change had led them into dark territory, and he seemed to be the only one with an idea of where they were going. She left him, sitting by the candle, and went and looked for ham and pork. He was sitting by a wall. Like most of the old rats, he always stuck to walls and kept away from open spaces and too much light. He seemed to be shaking. "'Are you all right?' she said. The shaking stopped. "'Fine, fine, nothing wrong with me,' snapped Hammond Pork. "'Just a few twinges, nothing permanent.' "'Only I noticed you didn't go out with any of the squads,' said Peaches. "'There's nothing wrong with me,' shouted the old rat. "'We still got some potatoes in the baggage.' "'I don't want any food. There is nothing wrong with me.' Which meant that there was. It was the reason he didn't want to share all the things he knew. What he knew was all he had left. Peaches knew what rats traditionally did to leaders who were too old. She'd watched Ham and Pork's face when Dark Tan, younger, stronger Dark Tan, had been talking to his squads, and knew that Ham and Pork was thinking about it too. Oh, he was fine when people were watching him, but lately he'd been resting more and skulking in corners. Old rats were driven out to lurk around by themselves and go rotten and funny in the head. Soon there would be another leader. Peaches wished she could make him understand one of the thoughts of dangerous beans, but the old rat didn't much like talking to females. He'd grown up thinking females weren't for talking to. The thought was, We are the changelings. We are not like other rats. Chapter 4 The important thing about adventures, thought Mr. Bunsey, was that they should not be so long as to make you miss mealtimes. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure The kid and the girl and Morris were in a large kitchen. The kid could tell it was a kitchen because of the huge black iron range in the chimney breast and the pans hanging on the walls and the long scarred table. What it didn't seem to have was what a kitchen traditionally had, which was food. The girl went to a metal box in the corner and fumbled around her neck for a string which, it turned out, held a big key. "'You can't trust anybody,' she said, "'and the rats steal a hundred times what they eat, the devils.' "'I don't think they do,' said the kid. Ten times at most. "'You know all about rats all of a sudden?' said the girl, unlocking the metal case. "'Not all of a sudden. I learnt it when... Ow! That really hurt!' "'Sorry about that,' said Morris. "'I accidentally scratched you, did I?' He tried to make a face which said, "'Don't be a complete twerp, OK, which is quite hard to do with a cat head. Melissa gave him a suspicious look and then turned back to the metal box. "'There's some milk that's not gone hard yet, and a couple of fish heads,' she said, peering inside. "'Sounds good to me,' said Morris. "'What about your human?' "'Him? He'll eat any old scraps.' "'There's bread and sausage,' said the girl, taking a can from the metal cupboard. "'We're all very suspicious about the sausages. There's a tiny bit of cheese, too, but it's rather ancestral.' "'I don't think we shall eat your food if it's so short,' said the kid. "'We have got money.' Oh, my father says it would reflect very badly on the town if we weren't hospitable. He's the mayor, you know. He's the government, said the kid. The girl stared at him. I suppose so, she said. Funny way of putting it. The town council makes the laws, really. He just runs the place and argues with everyone, and he says we shouldn't have any more rations than any other people to show solidarity in these difficult times. It was bad enough that tourists stopped visiting our hot baths, but the rats have made it a lot worse. Melissa took a couple of saucers from the big kitchen dresser. My father says, if we're all sensible, there will be enough to go round, she went on, which I think is very commendable. I entirely agree. But I think that once you've shown solidarity, you should be allowed just a little extra. In fact, I think we get a bit less than everyone else. Can you imagine? Anyway... "'So you really are a magical cat, then,' she finished, pouring the milk into a saucer. It oozed rather than gushed, but Morris was a street cat and could drink milk so rotten it would try to crawl away. "'Oh, yes, that's right, magical,' he said, with a yellow-white ring around his mouth. For two fish heads he'd be anything for anyone. "'Probably belong to a witch, I expect, with a name like Griselda or one of those names. 
said the girl, putting the fish heads on another saucer. Yeah, right, Griselda, right, said Morris, not raising his head. Who lived in a gingerbread cottage in the forest, probably. Yeah, right, said Morris. And then, because he wouldn't be Morris if he couldn't be a bit inventive, he added, Only it was a crispbreads cottage, because she was slimming. Very healthy witch, Griselda. The girl looked puzzled for a moment. That's not how it should go, she said. Sorry, I tell a lie, it was gingerbread really, said Morris quickly. Someone giving you food was always correct. And she had big warts, I'm sure. Miss, said Morris, trying to look sincere, some of those warts had so much personality, they used to have friends of their own. Uh, what's your name, miss? Promise not to laugh. All right. After all, there might be more fish heads. It's Malicia. Oh. Are you laughing? she said in a threatening voice. No, said Morris, mystified. Why should I? You don't think it's a funny name? Morris thought about the names he knew. Ham and Pork, Dangerous Beans, Dark Tan, Sardines. Sounds like an ordinary kind of name to me, he said. Melissa gave him another suspicious look, but turned her attention to the kid, who was sitting with the usual happy, faraway smile he wore when he didn't have anything else to do. "'And have you got a name?' she said. "'You're not the third and youngest son of a king, are you? "'If your name starts Prince, that's a definite clue.' "'The kid said, "'I think it's Keith.' "'You never said you had a name?' said Morris. "'No one ever asked before,' said the kid. "'Keith is not a promising name start,' said Melissa. "'It doesn't hint of mystery. "'It just hints of Keith. "'Are you sure it's your real name?' "'It's just the one they gave me.' "'Ah, that's more like it. "'A slight hint of mystery,' said Melissa, suddenly looking interested. "'Just enough to build up suspense. "'You've uh, stolen a at birth, I expect. "'You probably are the rightful king of some country, "'but they found someone who looked like you and did a swap. "'In that case you'll have a magic sword, "'only it won't look magic, you see, "'until it's time for you to manifest your destiny. "'You've uh, probably found on a doorstep.' "'I was, yes,' said Keith.' See, I'm always right. Morris was always on the lookout for what people wanted, and what Melissa wanted, he felt, was a gag. But he'd never heard the stupid-looking kid talk about himself before. What were you doing on a doorstep? he said. I don't know. Gurgling, I expect, said Keith. You never said, said Morris, accusingly. Is it important? There was a magic sword or a crown in the basket with you, probably, and you've got a mysterious tattoo or a strange-shaped birthmark, too, said Melissa. I don't think so. No one ever mentioned them, said Keith. There was just me and a blanket and a note. A note? But that's important. It said, Nineteen pints and a strawberry yoghurt, said Keith. Ah, not helpful, then, said Melissa. Why, nineteen pints of milk? "'It was the Guild of Musicians,' said Keith. "'Quite a large place. "'I don't know about the strawberry yoghurt.' "'Abandoned orphan is good,' said Melissa. "'After all, a prince can only grow up to be a king, "'but a mysterious orphan could be anybody. "'Were you beaten or starved and locked in the cellar?' "'I don't think so,' said Keith, giving her a funny look. "'Everyone at the Guild was very kind. "'They were mostly nice people. "'They taught me a lot.' "'We've got guilds here,' said Melissa. They teach boys to be carpenters and stonemasons and things like that. The girls taught me music, said Keith. I'm a musician. I'm good at it, too. I've been earning my own living since I was six. Aha! Mysterious orphan, strange talent, distressed upbringing, it's all shaping up, said Melissa. The strawberry yoghurt is probably not important. Would your life have been different if it had been banana-flavoured? Who can say? What kind of music do you play? Kinds? "'There aren't any kinds, there's just music,' said Keith. "'There's always music, if you listen.' Melissa looked at Morris. "'Is he always like this?' she demanded. "'This is the most I've ever heard him say,' said the cat. "'I expect you're very keen to know all about me,' said Melissa. "'I expect you're just too polite to ask.' "'Gosh, yes,' said Morris. "'Well, you probably won't be surprised to know "'that I've got two dreadful stepsisters,' said Melissa. "'And I have to do all the chores.' "'Gosh, really?' said Morris, wondering if there were any more fish-heads, and, if there were any more fish-heads, whether they were worth all this. "'Well, most of the chores,' said Melissa, as if revealing an unfortunate fact. 
some of them, definitely. I have to clean up my own room, you know, and it's extremely untidy. Gosh, really? And it's very nearly the smallest bedroom. There's practically no cupboards, and I'm running out of bookshelf space. Gosh, really? And people are incredibly cruel to me. You will note that we are here in a kitchen, and I'm the mayor's daughter. Should the daughter of a mayor be expected to wash up at least once a week? I think not. Gosh, really? And will you just look at these torn and bedraggled clothes I have to wear? Morris looked. He wasn't good on clothes. Fur was enough for him. As far as he could tell, Melissa's dress was pretty much like any other dress. It seemed to be all there. There weren't any holes except where the arms and head poked through. Here, just here, said Melissa, pointing to a place on the hem which to Morris looked no different than the rest of the dress. I had to sew that back myself, you know. Gosh, rip! Morris stopped. Sardines was abseiling down from a crack in the ancient ceiling. He had a knapsack on his back. And on top of this, I'm the one that has to queue for the bread and sausages every day, Melissa continued, but Morris was listening even less than he had been before. It had to be sardines, he thought. Idiot. He always goes ahead of the trap squad. Of all the kitchens in all the town he could turn up in, he's turned up in this one. Any minute she's going to turn round and scream. Sardines would probably treat it as applause, too. He lived life as if it was a performance. Other rats just ran around squeaking and messing up things, and that was quite good enough to convince humans there was a plague, but oh no, sardines always had to go further. Sardines and his yarrow song and dance act. And the rats take everything, Melissa was saying. What they don't take, they spoil. It's been terrible. We have to buy corn and stuff from the traders that sail up the river. That's why bread is so expensive. Expensive, eh? said Morris. We've tried traps and dogs and cats and poison, and still the rats keep coming, said the girl. They've learned to be really sneaky, too. They hardly ever end up in our traps any more. What's the good of the rat catchers offering us fifty p a tail if the rats are so cunning? The rat catchers have to use all kinds of tricks to get them, they say. Behind her, sardines looked carefully around the room and then signaled to the rats in the ceiling to pull the rope up. "'Don't you think this would be a good time to go away?' said Morris. "'Why are you making faces like that?' said Melissa, staring at him. "'Oh, well, you know the kind of cat that grins all the time? Heard of that? Well, I'm the kind that makes, you know, weird faces,' said Morris desperately. "'And sometimes I just burst out and say things, "'Get away! Get away! See, I did it again. It is an affliction.' "'I probably need counseling. "'Oh, no, don't do that. This is not the time to do that. "'Whoops, there I go again.' Sardines had pulled his straw hat out of his knapsack and was holding a small walking stick. It was a good routine, even Morris had to admit. Sometimes it advertised for a rat pie for the very first time he'd done it. People could tolerate rats in the cream and rats in the roof and rats in the teapot, but they drew the line at tap dancing. If you saw tap dancing rats, you were in big trouble. Morris had reckoned that if only the rats could play an accordion as well, they could do two times a day. He'd stared for too long. Melissa turned, and her mouth opened in shock and horror as sardines went into his routine. The cat saw her hand reach out for a pan that was on the table. She threw it very accurately. But sardines was a good pot-dodger. The rats were used to having things thrown at them. He was already running when the pan was halfway across the room, and then he leapt onto the chair, and then he jumped onto the floor, and then he dodged behind the dresser, and then there was a sharp, final metallic. Snap! Ha! said Melissa, and Morris and Keith stared at the dresser. That's one rat less at any rate. I really hate them. It was sardines, said Keith. No, it was definitely a rat, said Melissa. Sardines hardly ever invade a kitchen. I expect you're thinking about the plague of lobsters over in... He just called himself Sardines because he saw the name on a rusty old tin and thought it sounded stylish, said Morris. He wondered if he dare look behind the dresser. He was a good rat, said Keith. He used to steal books for me when they were teaching me to read. Excuse me, are you mad? said Melissa. It was a rat. The only good rat is a dead rat. Hello, said a little voice. It came from behind the dresser. "'It can't be alive. It's a huge trap,' said Melissa. 
It's got teeth. Anyone there? Only the stick is bending, said the voice. The dresser was massive, the wood so old that time had turned it black and as solid and heavy as stone. That's not a rat talking, is it? said Melissa. Please tell me rats can't talk. In fact, it's bending quite a bit now, said the voice, which was slightly muffled. Morris squinted into the space behind the dresser. I can see him, he said. He wedged the stick and the jaws as they closed. Watch us, Sardines, how you doing? Fine, boss, said Sardines in the gloom. If it wasn't for this trap, I'd say everything was perfect. Did I mention the stick is bending? Ah, uh, yes, you did. It's bent some more since then, boss. Keith grabbed one end of the dresser and grunted as he tried to move it. It's like rock, he said. It's full of crockery, said Melissa, now quite bewildered. But rats don't really talk, do they? Get out of the way, shouted Keith. He grabbed the back edge of the dresser with both hands and braced one foot against the wall and heaved. Slowly, like a mighty forest tree, the dresser pitched forward. The crockery started to fall out as it tipped, plate slipping off plate in one glorious, chaotic deal from a very expensive pack of cards. Even so, some of them survived the fall onto the floor, and so did some of the cups and saucers as the cupboard opened and added to the fun. But that didn't make any difference, because then the huge, heavy woodwork thundered down on top of them. One miraculously whole plate rolled past Keith, spinning round and round and getting close to the floor with the go 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 sound you circumstances. Keith reached down to the trap, grabbing sardines. As he pulled the rat up, the stick gave way and the trap snapped shut. A bit of the stick spun away through the air. "'Are you all right?' said Keith. "'Well, boss, all I can say is it's a good job rats don't wear underwear. Thanks, boss,' said sardines. He was quite plump for a rat, but when his feet were dancing he could float across the floor like a balloon. There was the sound of a tapping foot. Melissa, with arms folded and an expression like a thunderstorm, looked at sardines and then at Morris, and then at the stupid-looking Keith, and then at the wreckage on the floor. Er, uh, sorry about the mess, said Keith, but he was— She waved this away. Okay, she said as if she'd been thinking deeply. It goes like this, I think. The rat is a magical rat. I bet she's not only one. Something happened to him or them, and now they're really quite intelligent, despite the tap dancing. And they're friends with the cat. So, why would rats and a cat be friends? And it goes... There's some kind of an arrangement, right? I know. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Huh? said Keith. I shouldn't think anyone ever has to tell you anything, said Morris. It's something to do with plagues of rats, right? All those towns we've heard about, well, you heard about them too, and so you got together with Thingy here. Keith, said Keith. Yes, and so you go from town to town pretending to be a plague of rats, and Thingy, Keith, Yes, pretends to be a rat piper, and you all follow him out, right? It's all a big shingle, yes? Sardines looked up at Morris. She's got us banged to rights, boss, he said. So now you've got to give me a good reason why I don't call the watch out on you, said Melissa triumphantly. I don't have to, Morris thought, because you won't. Gosh, humans are so easy. He rubbed up against Melissa's legs and gave her a smirk. "'If you do, you'll never find out how the story ends,' he said. "'Ha! It'll end with you going to prison,' said Melissa. But Morris saw her staring at the stupid-looking Keith and at Sardines. Sardines still had his little straw hat on. When it comes to attracting attention, that sort of thing counts for a lot. When he saw her frowning at him, Sardines hastily removed his straw hat and held it in front of him by the brim. "'There's something I'd like to find out, boss,' he said, "'if we're finding out things.' Melissa raised an eyebrow. "'Well,' she said, "'and don't call me boss.' "'I'd like to find out why there's no rats in this city, Gov,' said Sardine. Sardines grinned nervously as Melissa gave him another long stare. "'Would you like some cheese?' she said. "'I'm afraid it's only mousetrap.' "'I don't think so, thank you very much all the same,' said Sardines, very carefully and politely. "'It's no use. I think it really is time to tell the truth,' said Keith. 
No, 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 said Morris. It's all because... You were right, miss, said Keith wearily. We go from town to town with a bunch of rats and fool people into giving us money to leave. That's what we do. I'm sorry we've been doing it. This was going to be the last time. I'm very sorry. You shared your food with us, and you haven't got much, too. We ought to be ashamed. It seemed to Morris, while he was watching Melissa make up her mind, that her mind worked in a different way to other people's minds. She understood all the hard things without even thinking. Magical rats? Yeah, yeah. Talking cats? Been there, done that, bought the singlet. It was the simple things that were hard. Her lips were moving. She was, Morris realised, making a story out of it. So, she said, you come along with your trained rats. We prefer educated rodents, Scuff, said Sardines. All right, your educated rodents, and you move into a city, and what happens to the rats that are there already? Sardines looked helplessly at Morris. Morris nodded at him to keep on. They were all going to be in big trouble if Melissa didn't make up a story she liked. They keep out of our way, boss. I mean, Gav, said Sardines. Can they talk to no gov? I think our rats think of them a bit like monkeys, said Keith. I was talking to sardines, said Melissa. Sorry, said Keith. And there's no other rats here at all, Melissa went on. No gov. A few old skeletons and some piles of poisons and lots of traps, boss, but no rats, boss. But the rat catchers nail up a lot of rat tails every day. Speak as I find, boss, Gov. No rats, boss, Gov. No other rats anywhere we've been, boss, Gov. Have you ever looked at the rat tails, miss? said Morris. What do you mean? said Melissa. They're fake, said Morris. Some of them, anyway. They're just old leather bootlaces. I saw some in the street. They weren't real rat tails, said Keith. I'm a cat. You think I don't know what rat tails look like? Surely people would notice, said Melissa. Yeah, said Morris. Do you know what an aglet is? Aglet? Aglet? What's an aglet got to do with anything? snapped Melissa. It's those little metal bits on the end of shoelaces, said Morris. How come a cat knows a bird like that? said the girl. Everyone's got to know something, said Morris. Have you ever looked closely at the rat tails? Of course not. You can get the plague from rats, said Melissa. That's right. Your legs explode, said Morris, grinning. That's why you didn't see the aglets. Your legs exploded lately, sardines. Not today, boss, said sardines. Mind you, it's not even lunchtime yet. Melissa Grimm looked, well, grim. Ah-ha, she said, and it seemed to Morris that the ha had a very nasty edge to it. So you're not going to tell the watch about us? he ventured, hopefully. What? So that I've been talking to a rat and a cat? said Melissa. Of course not. They'll tell my father I've been telling stories, and I'll get locked out of my room again. You get locked out of your room as a punishment, said Morris. Yes, it means I can't get at my books. I'm a rather special person, as you may have guessed, said Melissa proudly. Haven't you heard of the sisters Grimm, Agonista and Evisera Grimm? They were my grandmother and my great aunt. They wrote fairy tales. Ah, so we're temporarily out of trouble here, thought Morris. Best to keep her talking. I'm not a big reader, as cats go, he said. So what were these, then? Uh, stories about little people with wings going tinkle-tinkle? No, said Melissa. They were not big on tinkling little people. They wrote real fairy tales, ones with lots of blood and bones and bats and rats in. I've inherited the story-telling talent, she added. I kind of thought you had, said Morris. And if there's no rats under the town, but the rat catchers are nailing up boot laces, I smell a rat, said Melissa. Sorry, said Sardines. I think that was me. I'm a bit nervous. There were sounds from upstairs. Quick, 
Go out across the backyard, Melissa commanded. Get up into the hayloft over the stables. I'll bring you some food. I know exactly how this sort of thing goes. Chapter 5 Ratty Rupert was the bravest rat that ever was. Everyone in Fairy Bottom said so. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure Dark Tan was in a tunnel several streets away, hanging from four bits of string attached to his harness. They were tied onto a stick which had been balanced like a seesaw on the back of a very fat rat. Two other rats were sitting on the other end, and several other rats were steering it. Dark Tan was hanging just above the teeth of the big steel trap that completely filled the tunnel. He squeaked the signal to stop. The ruler vibrated a little under his weight. "'I'm right over the cheese,' he said. "'Smells like Lanka Blue Vein. Extra tasty. Not been touched. Pretty old, too. Move me in about two paws. Um, rat measurement about an inch.' The stick bounced up and down as he was pushed forward. "'Careful, sir,' said one of the younger rats who crowded the tunnel behind the trap disposal squad. Dark Tan grunted, and looked down at the teeth an inch away from his nose. He pulled a short piece of wood out of one of his belts. A tiny sliver of mirror had been glued to one end of it. "'You lot, move the candle this way a bit,' he commanded. "'That's right. That's right. Let's see now.' He pushed the mirror past the teeth and turned it gently. "'Ah, just as I thought.' It's a Prattle and Johnson little snapper, sure enough. One of the old Mark Freeze, but with the extra safety catch. That's come a long way. OK, we know all about these, don't we? Cheese for tea, lads. There was nervous laughter from the watchers, but a voice said, Oh, they're easy. Who said that? said Dark Tan sharply. There was silence. Dark Tan craned his head back. The young rats had carefully moved aside, leaving one looking very... Very alone. Ah, nourishing, said Dark Tan, turning back to the trap's trigger mechanism. Easy, is it? Glad to hear it. You can show us how it's done, then. Um, when I said easy, nourishing began, I mean, In Brine showed me on the practice trap, and he said, No need to be modest, said Dark Tan, a gleam in his eye. It's all ready. I'll just watch, shall I? You can get into the harness and do it, can you? But, 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 I, I couldn't see too well when he showed us. Now I, I come to think about it, and, 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 I'll tell you what, said Dark Tan, I'll work the trap, shall I? Nourishing looked very relieved. And you can tell me exactly what to do, Dark Tan added. Ah, uh, Nourishing began. Now she looks like a rat prepared to rejoin the whittling squad really quickly. Jolly good, said Dark Tan. He carefully put his mirror away and pulled a length of metal out of his harness. He prodded the trap carefully. Nourishing, shuddered at the sound of metal on metal. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Here's a bar and a little spring and a catch. Uh, what shall I do now, Miss Nourishing? Uh, 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 Nourishing stuttered. Things are creaking here, Miss Nourishing, said Dark Tan from the depths of the trap. Um, uh, you wedge the thingy. Which one is the thingy, Miss Nourishing? Take your time. Oh, whoops. Oh, this bit of metal is wobbling, but don't let me hurry you in any way. Uh, you edge the, uh, the thingy, uh, the, the, the thingy, uh... Nourishing's eyes rolled wildly. Maybe it's this big snap! Ah! 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 Nourishing fainted. Dark Tan slipped out of the harness and dropped onto the trap. All fixed, he said. I've clipped it firm. It won't go off. Now you boys can drag it out of the way. He walked back to the squad and dropped a lump of hairy cheese onto Nourishing's quivering stomach. It's very important in the trap business to be definite, you see. You're definite or you're dead. The second mouse gets the cheese. Dark Tan sniffed. Well, no human coming here would have any difficulty thinking there's rats around now. The other trainees laughed in the nervous tittering way of people who've seen someone else attract the teacher's attention and are glad it isn't them. Dark Tan unrolled a scrap of paper. He was a rat of action, and the idea that the world could be pinned down in little signs worried him a bit. But he could see how useful it was. When he drew pictures of a tunnel layout, the paper remembered. It didn't get confused by new smells. Other rats, if they knew how to read, could see in their heads what the writer had seen. 
he'd invented maps. It was a drawing of the world. Amazing stuff, this new technology, he said. So, there's poison marked here, two tunnels back. Did you see to it, Inbrian? Uh, buried and whittled on, said Inbrian, his deputy. It was the grey number two poison too. Good rat, said Darktown. That's nasty eating. There were dead kikis all around it. I'll bet there were. No antidote for that stuff. We found trays of number one and number three too, said Inbrian. Lots of them. You can survive number one poison if you're sensible, said Darktown. Remember that, all of you. And if you ever eat number three poison, we've got some stuff that will sort you out. I mean, you'll live in the end, but there'll be a day or two when you wish you were dead. There's lots of poison, Dark Ten, said Inbrian nervously. More than I've ever seen before. Rat bones all over that place. Important safety tip there, then, said Dark Ten, setting off along a new tunnel. Don't eat a dead rat unless you know what they died of. Otherwise, you'll die of it too. Dangerous Beans says he thinks we shouldn't eat rats at all, said Inbrian. Yeah, well, maybe, said Dark Tan. But out in the tunnels, you have to be practical. Never let good food go to waste. And someone wake up nourishing. A lot of poison, said Inbrian as the squad moved on. They must really hate rats here. Dark Tan didn't answer. He could see people were already getting nervous. There was a smell of fear in the rats' runs. They'd never come across so much poison before. Dark Tan didn't usually worry about anything, and hated to feel the worry starting deep in his bones. A small rat, out of breath, scudded up the tunnel and crouched in front of him. Kitty, sir, number three, heavy whittlers, it burst out. We found a trap, sir, not like the usual sort. Fresh walk right into it. Please come. There was a lot of straw in the loft over the stables, and the heat of the horses coming up from below made it quite snug. Keith was lying on his back, staring at the ceiling and humming to himself. Morris was watching his lunch, which was twitching its nose. Right up until the time he pounced, Morris looked like a sneak killing machine. It all went wrong just before he jumped. His rear rose, it waggled faster and faster from side to side, his tail slashed at the air like a snake, then he dived forward, claws out, squeak. Okay, here is the deal, said Morris, to the shivering ball in his claws. You just have to say something. Anything. Let me go, maybe, or even help. Squeak does not cut the mustard. It's just a noise. Just ask, and I'll let you go. No one can say I'm not highly moral in that respect. Squeak, screamed the mouse. Fair enough, said Morris, and killed it instantly. He carried it back to the corner where Keith was sitting in the straw and eating a pickled beef sandwich. It couldn't talk, said Morris hurriedly. I didn't ask you, said Keith. I mean, I gave it a chance, said Morris. You heard me right. It only had to say it didn't want to be eaten. Good. It's all right for you. I mean, it's not as though you have to speak to sandwiches, said Morris, as if he was still bothered about something. I wouldn't know what to say to them, said Keith. And I'd like to point out that I didn't play with it either, said Morris. One swipe with the old paw and it was goodbye, that's all she wrote, except that obviously the mouse didn't write anything, not being intelligent in any way. I believe you, said Keith. It never felt a thing, Morris went on. There was a scream from somewhere in a nearby street, and then the sound of crockery breaking. There had been quite a lot of that in the last half hour. "'Sounds like the lads are still at work,' said Morris, carrying the dead mouse behind a pile of hay. "'Nothing gets a good scream like sardines dancing across the table.' The stable doors opened. A man came in, harnessed two of the horses, and led them out. Shortly afterwards, there was the sound of a coach leaving the yard. A few seconds later, there were three loud knocks from below. They were repeated. And then they were repeated again. Finally, Melissa's voice said, Are you two up there or not? Keith crawled out of the hay and looked down. Yes, he said. Didn't you hear the secret knock? said Melissa, staring up at him in annoyance. It didn't sound like a secret knock, said Morris, his mouth full. Is that Morris's voice? said Melissa suspiciously. 
Uh, yes, said Keith. You'll have to excuse him. He's eating someone. Morris swallowed quickly. It's not someone, he hissed. It's not someone unless it can talk. Otherwise it's just food. It is a secret knock, Melissa snapped. I know about these things, and you're supposed to give the secret knock in return. But if it's just someone knocking on the door in, you know, general high spirits, and we knock back, what are they going to think it is up here, said Morris, an extremely heavy beetle? Melissa went uncharacteristically silent for a moment. Then she said, Good point, good point. I know. I'll shout, It's me, Melissa, and then give the secret knock, and that way you'll know it's me, and you can give the secret knock back, okay? Why don't we just say, Hello, we're up here, said Keith innocently. Melissa sighed. Don't you have any sense of drama? Look, my father's gone off to the Rat House to see the other council members. He said the crockery was the last straw. The crockery? said Morris. You told him about sardines? I had to say I'd been frightened by a huge rat and tried to climb up the dresser to escape, said Melissa. You lied? I just told a story, said Melissa calmly. It was a good one, too. It was much more true than the truth would sound. A tap-dancing rat? Anyway, he wasn't really interested, because there's been a lot of complaints today. Your tame rats are really upsetting people. I am gloating. They're not our rats. They're their rats, said Keith. And they always work fast, said Morris proudly. They don't mess about when it comes to... messing about. One time we were in last advertised for a rat piper the very next morning, said Keith. That was Sardine's big day. My father shouted a lot and sent for Blunkett and Spears, too, said Melissa. There's the rat catchers, and you know what that means, don't you? Morris and Keith looked at one another. Let's pretend we don't, said Morris. It means we can break into their shed and solve the mystery of the bootlace tails, said Melissa. She gave Morris a critical look. Of course, it would be more satisfying if we were four children and a dog, which is the right number for an adventure, but we'll make do with what we got. Hey, we just steal from governments, said Morris. Er, uh, only governments who aren't people's fathers, obviously, said Keith. So, said Melissa, giving Keith an odd look. That's not the same as being criminals, said Morris. Ah, but... When we've got the evidence, we can take it to the council, and then it won't be criminal at all, because we will be saving the day, said Melissa, with weary patience. Of course, it may be that the council and the watch are in league with the rat-catchers, so we shouldn't trust anyone. Really? Haven't you people ever read a book? It'll be dark soon, and I'll come over and pick you up, and we can shimmy the nodger. Can we? said Keith. Yes, with a hairpin said Melissa. I know it's possible, because I've read about it hundreds of times. What kind of nodger is it? said Morris. A big one, said Melissa. That makes it easier, of course. She turned around abruptly and ran out of the stables. Morris, said Keith. Yes, said the cat. What is a nodger, and how do you show me it? I don't know. A lock, maybe? But you said... Yes, but I was just trying to keep her talking in case she turned violent, said Morris. She's gone in ahead, if you ask me. She's one of those people like actors, you know, acting all the time, not living in the real world at all. Like it's all a big story. Dangerous Beans is a bit like that. Highly dangerous person, in my opinion. He's a very kind and thoughtful rat. Ah, yes. But the trouble is, see, that he thinks everyone else is like him. People like that are bad news, kid. And our lady friend, she thinks life works like a fairy tale. Well, that's harmless, isn't it? said Keith. Yeah, but in fairy tales, when someone dies, it's just a word. The number three heavy whittlers squad were taking a rest, and they'd run out of ammunition in any case. No one felt like going past the trap to the trickle of water that dripped down the wall, and no one liked looking at what was in the trap. "'Poor old Fresh,' said the rat. "'He was a good rat.' "'Should have paid attention to where he was going, though,' said another rat. 
Thought he knew it all, said yet another rat. A decent rat, though, if a bit smelly. So let's get him out of the trap, shall we? said the first rat. Doesn't seem right leaving him in there like that. Yeah, especially since we're hungry. One of the rats said, Dangerous Beans says we shouldn't eat rat at all. Another rat said, No, it's only if you don't know what they died of, because they might have died of poison. Another rat said, And we know what he died of. He died of squashing. You can't catch squashing. They all looked at the late fresh. Why do you think happens to you after you're dead? said a rat slowly. You get eaten, or you go all dried up or mouldy. What, all of you? Well, people usually leave the feet. The rat who'd asked the question said, What about the bit inside? And the rat who'd mentioned the feet said, Oh, the squishy green wobbly bit. Now you ought to leave that too. Tastes awful. No, I meant the bit inside you that's you. Where does that go? Sorry, you lost me there. Well, you know, like dreams. The rats nodded. They knew about dreams. Dreams had come as a big shock when they started to happen. Well then, in the dreams, when you're being chased by dogs or flying or whatever, who is it that's doing that? It's not your body, because that's asleep. So it must be an invisible part that lives inside you, yes? And being dead is like being asleep in it. Nor... Exactly like asleep, said a rat, uncertainly, glancing at the fairly flat thing formerly known as fresh. I mean, you don't get all blood and bits sticking out, and you wake up. So, said the rat who'd raised the whole question about the invisible part, when you wake up, where does the dreaming part go? When you die, where does that bit that's inside you go? Well, the green wobbly bit. No, the bit that's behind your eyes. You mean the pinky grey bit? No, not that. The invisible bit. How would I know? I've never seen an invisible bit. All the rats stared down at Fresh. I don't like this kind of talk, said one of them. It reminds me of the shadows and the candlelight. Another one said, Did you hear about the bone rat? It comes and gets you when you're dead, they say. They say, they say muttered the rat. They say there's a big rat underground who made everything, they say. So it made the humans too. Must be really keen on us to go and make humans too, eh? How do I know? Maybe they were made by a big human. Oh, now you're just being silly, said the doubting rat, who was called Tomato. All right, all right. But you've got to admit that everything couldn't have just well turned up, could it? There's got to be a reason... And Dangerous Bean says there's things we should do because they're right. Well, who works out what's right? Where does right and wrong come from? They say, if you've been a good rat, maybe the big rat has got this tunnel full of good eating that the bone rat will take you to. But Fresh is still here, and I ain't seen a bony rat, said Doubting Tomato. Ah, but they say you only see it if it's coming for you. Oh, oh! said another rat, nervous to the point of mad sarcasm. So how did they see it, then? Tell me that. Life's bad enough as it is without having to worry about invisible things you can't see. All right, all right, what's been happening? The rats turned, suddenly incredibly pleased to see Dark Tan scurry up the tunnel. Dark Tan pushed past. He'd brought nourishing with him. It was never too soon, he said, for a member of the squad to find out what happened to people who got things wrong. I see, he said, looking at the trap. He shook his head sadly. What do I tell everyone? Not to use tunnels that haven't been marked clear, sir, said Tomato. But Fresh, well, he's not a... He never was a good listener, and he was keen to get on with it, sir. Dark Tan examined the trap and tried to keep his face fixed in an expression of confident purpose. It was hard to do it, though. He'd never seen a trap like it. It looked a really nasty one, a squeezer rather than a chopper. It had been put where a rat hurrying to the water would be bound to trip it. "'He's not going to do any more listening now, that for certain,' he said. "'The face looks familiar, apart from the bulging eyes and the tongue hanging out, that is.' "'Er, you talked to Fresh in the muster this morning, sir,' said a rat. "'Told him he was raised to be a whittler and to get on with it, sir.' Dark Tan's expression remained blank. Then he said, "'We got to go. We're finding a lot of traps all over.' 
We'll work our way back to you. No one is to go any further along that tunnel. Understood? Everyone say, yes, Dark Ten. Yes, Dark Ten, the rats chorused. And one of you stand guard, said Dark Ten. There could be more traps up that way. What shall we do with fresh, sir? said Tomato. Don't eat the green wobbly bit, said Dark Tan, and hurried off. Traps, he thought. There were too many of them, and too much poison. Even the experienced members of the squad were getting nervous now. He didn't like to come across unknown things. You found out what unknown things were when they killed you. The rats were spreading out under the town, and it was like no other town they'd found. The whole place was a rat trap. They hadn't found a single living kiki. Not one. That wasn't normal. Everywhere had rats. Where you got humans, you got rats. And on top of everything else, the young rats were spending too much time worrying about... things. Things you couldn't see or smell. Shadow things. Dark Tan shook his head. There was no room in the tunnels for that sort of thinking. Life was real, life was practical, and life could get taken away really quickly if you weren't paying attention. He noticed Nourishing looking around and sniffing the air as they trotted along a pipe. That's right, he said approvingly. You can't be too careful. Never rush in. Even the rat in front of you might have been lucky and missed the trigger. Yes, sir. Don't worry too much about Fresh, though. He did look awfully... flat, sir. Fools rush in, nourishing. Fools rush in. Dark Tan could sense the fear spreading. It worried him. If the changelings panicked, they'd panic as rats. And the tunnels in this city were no place for a terrified rat to be running. But if one rat broke ranks and ran, then most of them would follow. Smell held sway in the tunnels. When things went well, everyone felt good. When fear arrived, it flowed through the runs like flood water. Panic in the rat world was a kind of disease that could be caught too easily. Things did not get any better when they caught up with the rest of his squad. This time they'd found a new poison. Not a worry, said Dark Tan, who was worried. We've come across new poisons before, right? Not for ages, said a rat. Remember that one in Scroat with the sparkly blue bits? It burned if you got it on your feet. People ran into it before they knew. They've got that here. You'd better come and see. In one of the tunnels, a rat was lying on its side. Its feet were curled up tight like fists. It was whimpering. Dark Tan took one look, and knew that for this rat, it was all over. It was only a matter of time. For the rats back in Scroat, it had been a matter of horrible time. I could bite her in the back of the neck, a rat volunteered. It'd be all over quickly. It's a kind fault. But that stuff gets into the blood, said Dark Tan. Find a snapper trap that hasn't been made safe. Do it carefully. Put a rat in a trap, sir, said Nourishing. Yes. Better die fast than slow. Even so, it's... The rat who had volunteered to do the gnawing started to protest. The hairs around Dark Tan's face stood out. He reared up and showed his teeth. Do what you're told or I'll gnaw you, he roared. The other rat crouched back. All right, Dark Tan, all right. And warn all the other squads, Dark Tan bellowed. This isn't rat catching, this is war. Everyone's to pull back smartly. No one touch anything. We're going to. Yes, what is it this time? A small rat had crept up to Dark Tan. As the trap hunter spun round, the rat crouched hurriedly, almost rolling on its back to show how small and harmless it was. Please, sir, it mumbled. Yes. This time. We've found a live one. Chapter 6 There were big adventures and small adventures, Mr. Bunsey knew. You didn't get told what size they were going to be before you started. Sometimes you could have a big adventure even when you were standing still. From Mr. Bunsey has an adventure. Hello? Hello, it's me. Aunt, I'm going to give the secret knock now. There were three knocks on the stable door, and then Melissa's voice rose again with, Hello? Did you hear the secret knock? Perhaps you'll go away if we keep quiet, said Keith in the straw. I shouldn't think so, said Morris. He raised his voice and called out, We're up here. You've still got to give the secret knock, 
shouted Melissa. Oh, prr, 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 said Morris under his breath. And fortunately no human knows how bad a swear word that is in cat language. Look, this is me, okay? A cat which talks? How will you recognize me? Shall I wear a red carnation? I don't think you're a proper talking cat anyway, said Melissa, climbing the ladder. She was still wearing black, and had bundled up her hair under a black scarf. She also had a big bag slung from her shoulder. Gosh, she's got that right said Morris. I mean, you don't wear boots and a sword and have a big hat with a feather in it, said the girl, pulling herself into the loft. Morris gave her a long stare. Boots, he said at last, on these paws. Oh, it was in a picture in a book I read, said Melissa calmly. A silly one for children, full of animals that dressed up as humans. It crossed Morris's cat mind, and not for the first time, that if he moved fast he could be out of the city in five minutes and onto a barge or something. Once, when he was no more than a kitten, he'd been taken home by a small girl who dressed him up in doll's clothes and sat him at a small table with a couple of dolls and three quarters of a teddy bear. He'd managed to escape through an open window, but it had taken him all day to get out of the dress. That girl could have been Melissa. She thought animals were just people who hadn't been paying enough attention. "'I don't do clothes,' he said. It wasn't much of a line, but it was probably better than saying, "'I think you're a loony.' "'Could be an improvement,' said Melissa. "'It's nearly dark. Let's go. We shall move like cats.' "'Oh, right,' said Morris. "'I expect I can do that.' Although, he thought a few minutes later, no cats ever moved like Melissa. She obviously thought that it was no good looking inconspicuous unless people could see that you were being inconspicuous. People in the street actually stopped to watch her as she sidled along walls and scuttled from one doorway to another. Morris and Keith strolled along after her. No one paid them any attention. Eventually, in a narrow street, she stopped at a black building with a big wooden sign hanging over the door. The sign showed a lot of rats, a sort of star made of rats, with all their tails tied together in a big knot. "'Sign of the ancient guild of rat-catchers,' whispered Melissa, swinging her bag off her shoulder. "'I know,' said Keith. "'It looks horrible.' "'Makes an interesting design, though,' said Melissa. One of the most significant things about the door below the sign was the big padlock holding it shut. "'Odd.' Morris thought. If rats make your legs explode, why do rat catchers have to have a big lock on their shed? Luckily, I'm prepared for every eventuality, said Melissa, and reached into her bag. There was a sound as of lumps of metal and bottles being moved around. What have you got in there? said Morris. Everything? The grapnel and rope ladder take up a lot of the room, said Melissa, still feeling around. "'And then there's the big medicine kit, and the small medicine kit, and the knife, and the other knife, and the sewing kit, and the mirror for sending signals, and these.' She pulled out a small bundle of black cloth. When she unrolled it, Morris saw the gleam of metal. "'Ah,' he said, "'lock picks, right? I've seen burglars at work.' "'Hairpins!' said Melissa, selecting one. Hairpins always work in the books I've read. You just push it into the keyhole and twiddle. I have a selection of pre-bent ones. Once again, Morris felt a little chill at the back of his head. They work in stories, he thought. Oh, dear me. And how come you know so many dogs, but they didn't mind cats? Cats never attempted to tear their throats out. And what thieves tended to have, he knew, were complicated little tools which were used with great care and precision. They didn't use stupid... Click. Good, said Melissa, in a satisfied voice. That was just luck, said Morris, as the padlock swung free. He looked up at Keith. You think it's just luck, too, eh, kid? How would I know, said Keith. I've never seen it done before. I knew it would work, said Melissa. It worked in the fairy story The Seventh Wife of Greenbeard, 
There she broke out of his room of terror and stabbed him in the eye with a frozen herring. That was a fairy story, said Keith. Yes, said Melissa proudly. Right out of grim fairy tales. You've got some bad fairies in these parts, said Morris, shaking his head. Melissa pushed the door open. Oh, no, she moaned. I didn't expect this. Somewhere below Morris's paws, and about a street away, the one local rat that the changelings had found alive was crouched in front of dangerous beans. The squads had been called back. This was not turning out to be a good day. Traps that didn't kill, Dark Tan thought. You found them sometimes. Sometimes humans wanted to catch rats alive. Dark Tan didn't trust humans who wanted to catch rats alive. Honest traps that killed outright. Well, they were bad, but you could usually avoid them, and at least there was something honest about them. Live traps were like poison. They cheated. Dangerous Beans was smelling the newcomer. It was strange, but the rat who could think the most unrat-like thoughts was also the best at talking to Kiki's. Except that talking wasn't the right word. No one, not even Ham and Hawk, had a sense of smell like Dangerous Beans. The new rat certainly wasn't giving any trouble. For one thing, it was surrounded by rats who were big and well-fed and tough, so its body was respectfully saying, Sir, as hard as it could. The changelings had also given it some food, which it was engulfing rather than eating. She was in a box trap, said Dark Tan, who was drawing lines on the floor with a stick. We found a lot of them. I got caught in one of those once, said Hammond Pork. Then a female human came along and tipped me out over the garden wall. Couldn't see the point of it. I believe some humans do it to be kind, said Peaches. They get the rat out of the house without killing them. Didn't do her any good anyway, said Hammond Pork with satisfaction. I went back next night and whittled on the cheese. I don't think anyone is trying to be kind here, said Dark Tan. There was another rat in there with her. At least, he added, there was part of a rat in there with her. I think she'd been eating it to stay alive. Very sensible, nodded Hammond Pork. We found something else, Dark Tan said, still drawing furrows in the dirt. Can you see these, sir? He'd drawn a network of lines on the floor. <clears throat> I can see them, but I don't have to know what they are, said Hammond Pork. He rubbed his nose. I've never needed any more than this. Dark Tan gave a patient sigh. Then, smell, sir, that this is a... a picture of all the tunnels we've explored today. It's the shape I have in my head. We've explored a lot of the town. There's a lot of the... He glanced at Peaches. A lot of the kind traps, mostly empty. There's poison all over the place. It's mostly quite old. Lot of empty box traps. Lots of killer traps still set. And no live rats. None at all, except for our new friend. We know that's very odd. I sniffed around a bit near where I found her, and I smelled rats. Lots of rats. I mean, lots. Alive? said Dangerous Beans. Yes. All in one place. It smells that way, said Dark Tan. I think a squad should go and look. Dangerous Beans padded over to the rat and sniffed at her. The rat sniffed at him. They touched paws. The watching changelings were astonished. Dangerous Beans was treating the Kiki as an equal. Lots of things, lots of things, he murmured. Many rats, humans, fear, lots of fear, lots of rats. Crowded, food, rat. You said she'd been eating rats. It's a ratty rat world said Hammond Pork. Always has been, always will be. Dangerous Beans wrinkled his nose. There's something else. Something odd. Strange. She's really scared. She was in a trap, said Peaches, and then she met us. Much, much worse than that, said Dangerous Beans. She's... She's frightened of us because we're strange rats, but she smells relieved that we're not... What she's used to. Humans, Dark Tan spat. I don't think so. Other rats? 
Yes, no, no, I don't. It's hard to tell. Dogs? Cats? No. Dangerous Bean stepped back. Something new. What shall we do with her? said Peaches. Let her go, I suppose. We can't do that, said Dark Tan. We've triggered all the traps we've found, but there are still poisons all over the place. I wouldn't send a mouse out into that lot. She hasn't tried to attack us after all. So, said Hammond Pork, what's another dead gee gee? I know what Dark Tan means, said Peaches. We can't just send her out to die. Big Savings stepped forward and put a paw around the young female, cuddling her protectively. She glared at Hammond Pork. Although she might nip him sometimes if she was annoyed, she wouldn't argue with him. She was too old to do that. But her look said, All males are stupid, you stupid old rat. He looked lost. We've killed Gee Gees, haven't we? he said. Why do we want this one hanging around? We can't send her out to die, said Peaches again, looking at Dangerous Bean's expression. He had that faraway look in his pink eyes. You want it trailing around, eating our food and messing things up, said Hammond Pork. It can't talk, it can't think. Nor could we not long ago, snapped Peaches. We were all like her. We can think now, young female, said Hammond Pork, his hair rising. Yes said Dangerous Beans quietly. We can think now. We can think about what we do. We can pity the innocent one who means us no harm, and that's why she can stay. Hammond Pork's head turned sharply. Dangerous Beans was still facing the newcomer. Hammond Pork reared up instinctively, a rat ready to fight, but Dangerous Beans couldn't see him. Peaches watched the old rat with concern. He'd been challenged, by a weedy little rat who would not last a second in a fight, and Dangerous Beans hadn't even realised he'd made the challenge. He doesn't think like that, Peaches told herself. The other rats were watching Ham and Pork. They still thought like that, and were waiting to see what he would do. But it was dawning even on Ham and Pork that pouncing on the white rat would be unthinkable. It would be like cutting off his own tail. He very carefully let himself relax. "'It's just a rat,' he muttered. "'But you, dear Ham and Pork, are not,' said Dangerous Beans. "'Will you go with Dark Tan's crew to find out where she came from? It could be dangerous.' This made Ham and Pork's hair rise again. "'I'm not afraid of danger,' he roared. "'Of course not. That is why you should go. She was terrified,' said Dangerous Beans. "'I've never been scared of anything.' shouted Hammond Pork. Now Dangerous Beans turned to face him. In the candlelight there was a glow in the pink eyes. Hammond Pork was not a rat who spent a lot of time thinking about things he couldn't see or smell or bite, but he looked up. The candlelight made big rat shadows dance on the wall. Hammond Pork had heard the young rats talking about shadows and dreams and what happened to your shadow after you died. He didn't worry about that stuff. Shadows couldn't bite you. There was nothing to be frightened of in shadows. But now, his own voice in his own head told him, I'm frightened of what those eyes can see. Hammond Pork glared at Dark Tan, who was scratching something in the mud with one of his sticks. I'll go, but I will lead the expedition, he said. I'm senior rat here. That doesn't worry me, said Dark Tan. Mr. Clicky is going to be going in front in any case. I thought he got smashed last week, said Peaches. We've got two left, said Dark Tan. Then we'll have to raid another pet shop. I'm the leader, said Hammond Pork. I'll see what we do, Dark Tan. Fine, sir, fine, said Dark Tan, still drawing in the mud. And you know how to make all the traps safe, do you? No, but I can tell you to. Good, good, said Dark Tan, making more marks with his stick, and not looking at the leader. And you'll tell me which levers to leave alone and which bits to wedge open, will you? I don't have to understand about traps, said Hammond Pork. But I do, sir, said Dark Tan, speaking in the same calm voice. 
and I'm telling you that there's a couple of things about some of these new ones I don't understand and until I understand them I'd very respectfully suggest that you leave it all to me that is not the way to talk to a superior rat this is where we find out who is the leader then Darktan picked up the astonishment amongst the older males who were watching Darktan ham and pork's fur settled the obviously as the leader you must give the orders unknown things are dangerous yes and that is what I am seeing rat captures shed he said benches chairing a considerable amount of a, a lack of any dusting ever being done it's what I'd have expected a rat catcher's hut to look like inside I was expecting something horrible yet interesting said Melissa some ghastly clue does there have to be a clue said Keith of course said Melissa looking under a chair cat there's two types of people in the world there are those who said Morris things just have to smugly in Morris's opinion there's always a look that's the word there'll be a secret passage of course everyone look for the entrance to the secret passage uh, how will we know it's the entrance to a secret passage said Keith looking even more bewildered than normal what does a secret passage look like it won't look like one of course oh well in that case I can see dozens of secret passages said Morris doors windows that calendar from the acme poison company that cupboard over there that rat hole that desk that you're just being sarcastic said Melissa, lifting up the calendar and sternly inspecting the wall behind it actually i was just being flippant said morris but i can do sarcastic if you like keith stared at the long bench which was in front of a window frosted with ancient cobwebs traps were piled up on it all kinds of traps and beside them were row upon row of battered old tins and jars with labels like danger hydrogen dioxide and rat bane and fire gut and polyputacetalon extreme caution and rat away and killer rat and essence of barbed wire danger and he leaned closer to look at this one sugar there were a couple of mugs too and a teapot white and green and grey powder was scattered on the bench some of it had even fallen on the floor you might try to be of some help said Melissa, tapping the walls I don't know how to look for something that doesn't look like the thing I'm looking for said Keith and they keep the poison right next to the sugar so many Melissa stood back out of her eyes this isn't working she said I suppose there might not be a secret passage said morris i know it's a rather daring idea but perhaps this is just an ordinary shed even morris recoiled a little from the force of the stare melissa turned on him there has to be a secret passage she said otherwise there's no point she snapped her fingers of course we are doing it wrong everyone knows you never find the secret passage by looking for it it's when you give up or to lean against the wall that you inadvertently operate the secret fetch morris looked at keith for help he was a human after all he should know how to deal with something like melissa but keith was just wandering around the shed staring at things melissa leaned against the wall with incredible nonchalance there was not a click a panel in the floor did not slide back probably it's the wrong place she said i'll just rest my arm innocently on this coat hook a sudden door in the wall completely failed to happen of course it could help if there was an ornate candlestick said melissa there always a sure fire secret passage lever every adventurer knows that there isn't a candlestick said morris i know some people totally fail to have any idea of how to design a proper secret passage said melissa she leaned against another piece of wall which had no effect whatsoever i don't think you'll find it that way said keith who was carefully examining a trap oh won't i said melissa well at least i'm being constructive about things 
Where would you look if you're such an expert? Why is there a rat hole in a rat catcher's shed? said Keith. It smells of dead rats and wet dogs and poison. I wouldn't come near this place if I was a rat. Melissa glared at him. Then her face wrapped itself in an expression of acute concentration, as if she was trying out several ideas in her head. Yes, she said, that usually works in stories. It's often the stupid person who comes up with the good idea by accident. She crouched down and peered into the sort of little lever, she said. I'll just give it a little push. There was a clonk under the floor. Part of it swung back, and Keith dropped out of sight. Oh, yes, said Melissa. I thought something like that would probably happen. Mr. Clicky bumped along the tunnel, making a whirring noise. Young rats had chewed his ears, and his string tail had been chopped off by a trap, and other traps had dented his body. But he had this advantage. Surprise traps couldn't kill Mr. Clicky, because he wasn't alive, and he wasn't alive because he was powered by clockwork. His key whirred round. A stub of candle burned on his back. The rest of the number one trap squad watched. Any minute now, said Dark Tan. There was a snap, and a sound best described as gloink. The light went out. Then a gear wheel rolled slowly back down the tunnel and fell over in front of Hammondpork. I thought the soil looked a bit disturbed there, said Dark Tan, in a satisfied voice. He turned around. OK, lads, break out another Mr. Clicky, and I want half a dozen of you with a rope to dig out that trap and drag it out of the way. All this testing the ground is slowing us down, Dark Tan, said Hammond Pork. Fine, sir, said Dark Tan, as the squad hurried past them. You go on ahead. That'd be a good idea, because we've only got one Mr. Clicky left. I hope this town's got a pet shop. The rats had found one in the town of Quirm, which is where they'd got the Mr. Clickies. They were on a shelf labelled Kitty Toys, along with a box of squeaky rubber rats called, with great imagination, Mr. Squeaky. The rats had tried to set off traps by poking them with a rubber rat on the end of a stick, but the squeak when the trap shut upset everyone. No one cared about what happened to a Mr. Clicky. "'I just think we should move faster,' said Hammond. "'Here go, then, sir. Try to shout out where the next trap he could see mangled springs and wheels in the jaws. He added, I couldn't quite understand what he was going on about at the time, but now I think I can see what he meant. He looked back along the tunnel to where a candle flame burned and grabbed a passing rat. Dress beans are to stay right back, understand? he said. They're not to come any further. Right, sir, said the rat, and hurried away. The expedition moved forward cautiously as the tunnel opened up into a large it had a trickle of water in the bottom. There were ancient pipes in the roof of it. Here and there steam hissed from them. Weak green light came from a street grating further down the drain. The place smelled of rats. It smelled freshly of rats. In fact, nibbling at a tray of food that had been set on a crumbling brick, it glanced at the changelings and fled. "'Get after it!' Hammond Pork yelled. "'No!' shouted Dark Tan. A couple of rats who began to chase the Kiki, hesitated. "'That was an order I gave!' roared Hammond Pork, turning on Dark Tan, made a very brief crouch, and said, "'Of course, but I think the view of Hammond Pork in possession of all the facts will be a little different than the view of Hammond Pork who just shouted because he saw a rat run away, hm? "'Sniff the air!' Hammond Pork's nose wrinkled. "'Boys, hm?' "'Grey, number two, he said. "'Foul stuff, some of the houses. "'Why?' "'To bathe in, sir.' Hm. Hammond Pork didn't like that idea. "'A lot of the young rats were keen on taking baths.' "'Dark Tan turned to the squad. "'Hammond Pork wants that poison buried and whittled on "'and a marker on it right now.' "'Hammond Pork heard a metallic sound beside him. "'He turned and saw that Dark Tan had drawn from his web of tools a long, thin piece of metal. "'What the k k k k is that?' he said. Dark Tan swished the thing backwards and forwards. "'I've got a stupid-looking kid to make this for me,' he said. Then Hammond Pork realised what it was. "'That's a sword,' he said. 
You got the idea out of Mr. Bunsey as an adventure. That's right. I've never believed that stuff, Hammondport grumbled. It's too far-fetched. But a spike is a spike, said Dark Tan calmly. I think we're close to the other rats. It'd be a good idea if most of us stay here. Sir. Hammondport felt he was being given orders again, but Dark Tan was being polite. I suggest that a few of us go on ahead to sniff them out, Dark Tan went on. Sardines would be useful, and I'll go, of course. And me, said Hammond Pork. He glared at Dark Tan, who said, Of course. Chapter 7 And because of Ollie the Snake's trick with the road sign, Mr. Bunsey did not know that he had lost his way. He wasn't going to Howard the Stoat's tea party. He was heading into the dark wood. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure Melissa looked at the open trapdoor as if giving it marks out of ten. "'Quite well hidden,' she said. "'No wonder he doesn't see it.' "'I'm not hurt much,' Keith called up from the darkness. "'Good,' said Melissa, still inspecting the trapdoor. "'How far down are you?' "'It's some sort of cellar. I'm OK, but all right. No need to go on about it. This wouldn't,' said the girl. "'Here's the top of a ladder. Why didn't you use it? I was unable to on a kind of falling past.' said the voice of Keith. "'Shall I carry you down?' said Melissa to Morris. "'Shall I scratch your eyes out?' said Morris. Melissa's brow wrinkled. She always looked annoyed when she didn't understand something. "'Twas that sarcasm. That was a suggestion,' said Morris. "'I don't do picking up by strangers. You go down, I'll follow.' "'But you haven't got the legs for ladders. Do I make personal remarks about your legs?' Melissa descended into the dark. There was a touch. It's full of sex, said Melissa. I oh, know, came the voice of Keith. I landed on them. I'd. On the strings, on strings of sausages. There's smoked meat, bins of vegetables. It's full of food. Ah, ah, get out of my. That cat just jumped onto my head. Morris leapt off her and onto some snacks. Ha! Ah! said Melissa, rubbing her head. We were told that the rats had got it all. I see it all now. The rat catchers get everywhere. They know all the sewers, all the cellars. And to think those thieves get paid out of our taxes. Morris looked around the cellar, lit by the flickering lantern in Melissa's hand. There was, indeed, a lot of food. Nets hanging from the ceiling were indeed stuffed with big, white, heavy cabbages. The aforesaid sausages did indeed loop from beam to beam. There were indeed just sacks and sacks, and indeed they all worried him. "'That's it, then,' said Melissa. "'What a hiding place! We are going to go right away to the town watch, report what we've found, and then it's a big cream tea for all of us, and possibly a medal, and then—' "'I'm suspicious,' said Morris. "'Because I'm a suspicious character,' I wouldn't trust your rat catchers if they told me the sky was blue. What have they been doing? Pinching the food and then saying it was the rats, honest, and everyone believed them? No, stupid. People have found gnawed bones and empty egg baskets, that sort of thing, and rat droppings all over the place. I suppose you could scratch the bones, and I suppose rat catchers could shovel up a lot of rat droppings, Morris conceded. "'Once they're killing all the real rats, so that there's more for them,' said Melissa triumphantly. "'Very clever.' "'Yeah, and that's a bit pun,' said Morris. "'Because we've met your rat catchers, and frankly, if it was raining meatballs, they wouldn't be able to find a fork.' "'I'm thinking about something,' said Keith, who had been humming it to himself. "'Well, I'm glad someone has,' Melissa began. "'It's about wire netting,' said Keith. There was wire netting in the shed. Is this important? Why do rat catchers need rolls of wire netting? How should I know? Cages, maybe, does it matter? Why would rat catchers put rats in cages? Dead rats don't run away, do they? There was silence. Morris could see that Melissa was happy about that comment. It was an unnecessary complication. It spoiled the story. "'I may be stupid-looking,' Keith added, 
but I'm not stupid. I have time to think about things because I don't keep on talking all the time. I look at things. I listen to try to learn. I... I... Um, Morris let them argue and stalked away into the corner of the cellar. Or cellars. They seemed to go on a long way. He saw something streak across the floor in the shadows and leapt before he could think. His stomach remembered that it had been a long time since the mouse. All right, he said, as the thing squirmed in his paws. Speak up, or a small stick hit him very sharply. Do you mind? said Sardines, struggling to get up. Muttered Morris, trying to lick his smarting nose. I've got a hat on right, snapped Sardines. Do you ever bother to look? All right, all right, Rory. Why are you here? In kid, he said. Ham and pork sent me. We're in trouble now. You just won't believe what we've found. He wants me, said Morris. I thought he didn't like me. Well, he said it's nasty and evil. Look at that, will you? Your claw went right through it. But I did ask you if you could talk, didn't I? said Morris. Yes, you did, but I always ask. I know, so I'm very definite about asking, you know, said Sardines. I only complained about the hat. I'd hate anyone to think that I don't ask, said Morris. There's no need to go on and on about it, said Sardines. Where's the girl? said Morris sulkily. What's the mad one? That's her. You'd better get them. This is seriously evil. There's a door at the other end of these cellars. I'm amazed you can't smell it from here. I ask, that's all. Boss, said Sardines, this is serious. Peaches and Dark Tan waited for the exploration party. They were with Toxie, another young male rat, who was good at reading and acted as ventures of Mr. Bunsey. They've been gone a long time, said Toxie. Dark Tan checks every step, said Peaches. Something's wrong, said Dangerous Beans, his nose wrinkled. A rat, Dangerous Beans, sniffed the air. Fear, he said. Three more rats scrambled past, knocking him over. What's happening? said Peaches, as another spun her around in its effort to get past. It squeaked at her and rushed on. That was finest. More fear, said Dangerous Beans. They're scared, terrified. Toxy tried to stop the next rat. It bit him and ran on, chittering. "'We must go back,' said Peaches urgently. "'Can't be,' said Toxy. "'Ham and Pork killed the ferret once.' Three more rats ran past, trailing fear behind them. One of them squealed at Peaches, gibbered madly at dangerous beams, and ran on. "'They... they forgot... "'Something terrible must have frightened them,' said Peaches, snatching up at "'They've never been that frightened,' said Toxy. Remember when that dog found us? We were all frightened, but we talked, and we trapped it, and Ammon po Peaches saw that Dangerous Beans was crying. They forgotten how to talk. Half a dozen more rats pushed their way past, screeching. Peaches tried to stop one, but it just squeaked at her and dodged out of the way. That was Feeds Four, she said, turning to Toxy. I was talking to her only an hour ago. She... Toxy? Toxy's fur was bristling. His eyes were unfocused. His mouth was open, showing his teeth. He stared at her, or right through her, and then turned and ran. She turned and put her paws around dangerous beams as the fear swept over them. From wall to wall, floor to ceiling, there were rats. The cages were crammed full of them. They clung to the wire in front and to roofs. The netting strained with the weight. Glistening bodies boiled and tumbled, paws and noses thrusting through squeaking and rustling and chittering, and it stank. What was left of Hammond Pork's exploration party clustered in the middle of the room. Most of it had fled by now. If the smells in that room had been sounds, they would have been shouts and screams, thousands of them. They filled the long and Morris could feel it, as soon as Keith opened the door. It was like a headache outside your head trying to get in. It banged on the ears. Morris was staying a little way behind. You didn't need to be very clever to see that this was a bad situation, and one which might— He saw, between their legs, Dark Tan and Ham and Pork, and a few other changelings. 
they were in the middle of the floor, looking up at the cages. He was amazed to see that even Ham and Pork was trembling, but he was trembling with rage. Let them all out! Let them all out now! And does a talking rat? said Melissa. Let them out! Ham and Pork screamed. All these foul cages did say about the wire netting, said Keith. Look, you can see where it's been repaired. They gnawed through wire to escape. I said, let them out, screamed Ham and Pork. Let them out or I will kill you. Evil, evil, said Melissa. Ham and Pork leapt and landed on the girl's waist. He swarmed up towards her neck. She froze. He hissed. There are rats eating one another in there. I will gnaw you, you, you evil. Keith's hand grasped him firmly round the waist, bristling. Ham and Pork sunk his teeth into Keith's finger. Melissa gasped. Even Morris winced. Ham and Pork drew his head back, blood dripping from his muzzle, and blinked in horror. Tears. He put Ham and Pork down on the floor. It's the smell, he said quietly. It upsets them. I... I thought you said they were tame, said Melissa, able to cages. Keith knocked it out of her hand. Never, ever threaten one of us. He attacked you. Look around. This is not a story. This is real. Do you understand? They're frightened out of their minds. Like that, Melissa shouted. I crack will. One of us, eh? Was that a rat swear word? Do you even swear in rat, rat boy? Just like cats, Morris thought. His ears swivelled as he heard another sound in the distance. Someone was coming down the ladder. Morris knew from experience that this was no time to talk to humans. They always said things like, What? and That's not right, or Where? as he ran past Dark Tan. Don't get human about it, just run! And that was quite enough heroism, he decided. It didn't pay to let other people actually in the wall. He skidded on the slimy floor as he changed direction, and there, yes, was a Morris-sized hole where a bar had rusted clean away. Paws scrabbling for speed, he darted through the hole just as the rat catchers entered the room of cages. Then, safe. Time to check. Was Morris safe? All legs present? Tail? Yes. Good. He could see Dark Tan tugging at ham and pork who seemed to have frozen on the spot, the others scuttling towards another drain on the opposite wall. They moved unsteadily. That happens when you let yourself go, Morris thought. They think they're educated, but in a tight corner a rat is just a rat. Now me? I'm different. Brains functioning perfectly at all times, always on the lookout, on the case, and sniffing bottom. The caged rats were making a din. Keeling girl were watching the rat catchers in amazement. The rat catchers weren't unamazed either. On the floor, Dark Tan gave up trying to get Ham and Pork to move. He drew his sword, looked up at the humans, hesitated, and then ran for the drain. Yes, let them sort it out. They're all, they can talk. It should be no problem at all. <laughs> Tell them a story, storytelling girl. Rat Catcher One, Keith. What are you doing here, miss? he said, his voice creaking with suspicion. Catcher Two, cheerfully. "'You broke into our shed,' said Ratcatcher One. Oh, "'That's called breaking in, that is.' "'You've been stealing. You're stealing food and blaming it on rats,' snapped Melissa. "'And why have you got all these rats caged up? Surprised, eh? Didn't think anyone would notice them, eh?' "'Aglets,' said Ratcatcher One, his brow wrinkling. "'Are the little bits on the end of bootlaces,' mumbled Keith. Ratcatcher One spun around. "'You bloody idiot, Bill. I sis. Didn't I tell you someone would notice? Someone noticed. Yes, don't think you've got away with anything, said Melissa. Her eyes were gleaming. I know you're only the humorous thugs. One big... Ratcatcher One's eyes glazed slightly, as they often did when Melissa talked at people. He waved a fat finger at her. You know what your father's been and gone and done just now, he said. Ha! Huh. Humorous... He's been on gone and sent for a rat piper, said Ratcatcher too. He costs a fortune. Three hundred dollars a town, and if you don't pay up, he gets really mean. Oh dear, thought Morris. Three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars? We only charge thirty. 
It's you, isn't it? said Ratcatcher One, waving his finger at Keith. The stupid-looking kid. You turn up, and I don't like about you. You and your funny-looking cat. If I see that funny-looking cat again, it's going to have a mittens. In the darkness of the drain, Morris shrank back. Hur, hur, laugh like that, Morris thought. And we don't have a boss, said Ratcatcher One. Yeah, we are our own bosses, said Ratcatcher Two. And then the story went wrong. And you, miss, said Ratcatcher One, turning to Melissa, he swung his fist, lifting her off her feet and slamming her against the rat cages. The rats went mad and the cages boiled with frantic activity as she slumped to the ground. The Ratcatcher turned to Keith. You're going to try in a thing, kid? He said, she was a girl, so I was nice and kind, but you I'll put in one of the cages. Yeah, and they ain't been fed today, said the delighted Ratcatcher, too. Go on, kid, Morris thought. Do something. But Keith just looked him up and down scornfully. What's that you got there, boy? A pipe? Give it here. The pipe was grabbed from Keith's belt, and he was pushed to the floor. A penny whistle? Think you're the rat piper, do you? Ratcatcher one snapped the pipe in two and tossed the bits inside. You know, they say that over in Pork Scratchens, the rat piper led the man with the right idea. Keith looked up. His eyes narrowed. He got to his feet. Here it comes, thought Morris. He's going to leap forward with superhuman strength because he's so angry, and they're going to wish they'd never been born. Ordinary human strength landed one punch on Ratcatcher one, and was smacked again by a big, brutal sledgehammer blow. All right, all right, he got knocked down, thought Morris, as Keith struggled for breath. But he's going to get up again. There was a shrill scream, and Morris thought, Aha! But the scream hadn't come from the wheezing Keith. A grey figure had launched itself from the top of the rat cages right at the Ratcatcher's face. It landed teeth first, and blood spurted from the Ratcatcher's nose. Aha! thought Morris again. It's Ham and Pork to the rescue. What? Mrrrlip! I'm thinking like the girl. I keep thinking it's a story. The rat catcher grabbed at the rat and held him out at arm's length by his tail. Ham and Pork twisted and turned, squealing with rage. His captor dabbed at his nose with his spare hand and stared at Ham and Pork as he struggled. He's a bit of a fighter, said your one. He's a red. Red? What's red about him? A red rat, a kind of grey rat, as you would very well know if you were an experienced guild member like me, said the rat catcher. They ain't local. You get them down on the plains. Funny to find one up here. Very funny. Greasy old devil, too. But game as anything. Your nose is all runny. Yeah, I know. I've had more rat bites than you've had hot dinners. Don't feel them any more, said rat catcher one in a voice that suggested that the spinning, screeching ham and pork was a lot more interesting than his colleague. I only have cold sausage for dinner. There you are, then. What a little fighter you are, to be sure. Real little devil, aren't you? Plucky as anything. Can't of you say so. I was talking to the rat, mister. The rat catcher prodded Keith with his boot. Go and tie up these two somewhere, OK? We'll put them in one of the other cellars for now. One with a proper door, and a proper lock, and no handy little trap doors, and you give me the key. She's the mayor's daughter, said Ratcatcher too. Mayors can get really upset about daughters. Then he'll do what he's told, right? You gonna give that rat a good squeezing? What? A fighter like this one? Are you joking? It's thinking like that that'll keep your Ratcatcher's assistant for your whole life. I've got a much better idea. How many's in the special cage? Morris watched Ratcatcher 2 go and examine one of the other cages on the far wall. Only two rats left. They've eaten the other four, he reported. Just skin left. Very neat. Ah, so they'll be full of vim and vinegar. Well, we'll see what they do to him, shall we? Morris heard a little wire door open and shut. Ham and Pork was seeing red. It filled his vision. He'd been angry for months, down inside, angry at humans, angry at the poisons and the traps, angry at the way younger rats weren't showing respect, 
angry that the world was changing so fast, angry that he was growing old. And now the smells of terror and hunger and violence met the anger coming the other way, and they mingled and flowed through Hammonpork in a great red river of rage. He was a cornered rat, but he was a cornered rat who could think. He had always been a vicious fighter long before there was all this thinking, and he was still very strong. A couple of dumb, swanking young kikis with no tactics and no experience of down-and-dirty cellar fighting and no fancy footwork and no thoughts were simply not a contest. A tumble, a twist, and two bites were all it took. The caged rats across the room leapt back from the netting. Even they could feel the fury. Now there's a clever boy, said Rat Catcher One admiringly when it was all over. I've got a use for you, my lad. Or not the pit, said Rat Catcher Two. Yes, the pit. Tonight? Yeah, cause fancy Arthur is putting in his jacko on a bet to kill a hundred rats in less than a quarter of an hour. I bet he can, too. Jacko's a good terrier. He did ninety a few months ago, and fancy Arthur has been training him up. Should be a good show. You'd bet on Jacko doing it, would you? said Rat Catcher One. Sure, everyone will be. Even with our little friend here among the rats, said Rat Catcher One, full of lovely spite and bite and boiling bile. Well, er, uh, yeah, right, Rat Catcher One grinned. I don't like leaving those kids here, though. It's them kids, not those kids. Get it right. How many times have I told you, Rule 27 of the Guild sounds stupid. People get suspicious of rat catchers that talk too good. Sorry. Talk thick, be clever. That's the way to do it, said Rat Catcher One. Sorry, I forgot. You tend to do it the other way round. Sorry, them kids. It's cruel tying people up. And they're only kids after all. So? So it'll be a lot easier to take them down the tunnel to the river and hit them on the head and throw them in. They'll be miles down river before anyone fishes them out, and they probably won't even be recognizable by the time the fish have finished with them. Morris had a pause in the conversation. Then Ratcatcher One said, I didn't know you were such a kind-hearted soul, Bill. Right, and, sorry, Anne, I've got an idea about getting rid of this piper, too. The next voice came from everywhere. It sounded like a rushing wind, and, in the heart of the wind, the groan of something in agony. It filled the air. No, we can use the piper. No, we can use the piper, said Ratcatcher One. That's right, said Ratcatcher Two. I was just thinking the same thing. Er, how can we use the piper? Once again Morris heard a sound like a wind blowing through a cave, but it seemed to be in his head rather than in the air. Isn't it obvious? "'Isn't it obvious?' said Ratcatcher One. "'Yeah, obvious,' muttered Ratcatcher Two. "'Obviously it's obvious, Er uh... Morris watched the Ratcatcher open several of the cages, grab rats, and drop them into a sack. He saw ham and pork tipped into one, too. And then the Ratcatchers had gone, dragging the other humans with them, and Morris wondered, "'Where in this maze of cellars is a Morris-sized hole?' "'Cats can't see in the dark.' What they can do is see by very little light. A tiny scrap of moonlight was filtering into the space behind him. It was coming through a tiny hole in the ceiling, barely big enough for a mouse, and certainly not big enough for a Morris, even if he could reach it. It illuminated another cellar. By the looks of it, the rat catchers used this one too. There were a few barrels stacked in one corner, and piles of broken rat cages. Morris prowled around it, looking for another way out. There were doors, but they had handles, and even his mighty brain couldn't figure out the mystery of doorknobs. There was another drain grating in the wall, though. He squeezed through it. Another cellar. And more boxes and sacks. But at least it was dry, though. A voice behind him said, What kind of thing are you? He spun around. All he could make out were boxes and sacks. The air still stank of rats, and there was a continuous rustling, and the occasional faint squeak, but the place was a little piece of heaven compared to the hell of the cage room. The voice 
had come from behind him, hadn't it? He must have heard it, mustn't he? Because it seemed to him that he just had something like the memory of hearing a voice, something that had arrived in his head without bothering to go through his ragged ears. It had been the same with the rat-catchers. They talked as if they'd heard a voice and thought it was their own thoughts. The voice hadn't really been there, had it? "'I can't see you,' said the memory. "'I don't know what you are.' It was not a good voice for a memory to have. It was all hisses, and it slid into the mind like a knife. "'Come closer!' Morris's paws twitched. The muscles in his legs started to push him forward. He extended his claws and got control of himself. Someone was hiding amongst the boxes, he thought, and it would probably not be a good idea to say anything. People could get funny about talking cats. You couldn't rely on everyone being as mad as the storytelling girl. Come closer! The voice seemed to pull at him. He'd have to say something. I'm happy where I am, thank you, said Morris. Then... Will you share our pain? The last word hurt. But it did not, and this was surprising, hurt a lot. The voice had sounded sharp and loud and dramatic, as if the owner was keen to see Morris rolling in agony. Instead, it gave him a very brief headache. When the voice arrived again, it sounded very suspicious. What kind of creature are you? Your mind is wrong. I prefer amazing, said Morris. Anyway, who are you asking me questions in the dark? All he could smell was rat. He heard a faint sound off to his left, and just made out the shape of a very large rat creeping towards him. Another sound made him turn. Another rat was coming from the other direction. He could only just make it out in the gloom. A rustle ahead of him suggested that there was a rat right in front, slipping quietly through the dark. Here come my eyes. What? Cat! Cat! Kill! Chapter 8 Mr. Bunsey realised that he was a fat rabbit in the dark wood, and wished he wasn't a rabbit, or at least not a fat one. But Ratty Rupert was on the way. Little did he know what was waiting for him. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure. When the three rats leapt, they were already too late. There was just a Morris-shaped hole in the air. Morris was across the room and scrambling up some boxes. There was squeaking below him. He jumped onto another box and saw a place in the wall where some of the rotten bricks had fallen out. He aimed for it, scrabbled on thin air as bricks moved under him, and pushed himself into the unknown. It was another cellar, and it was full of water. In fact, what it was full of was not exactly water. It was what water eventually becomes when rat cages drain into it, and gutters up above drain into it, and it has had the chance to sit and bubble gently to itself for a year or so. To call it mud would be an insult to perfectly respectable swamps all over the world. Morris landed in it. It went gloop. He cat-paddled furiously through the thick stuff, trying not to breathe, and dragged himself out on what felt like a pile of rubble on the other side of the room. A fallen rafter, slimy with mould, led up to more tangled fire-blackened wood in the ceiling. He could still hear the dreadful voice in his head, but it was muffled. It was trying to give him orders. Trying to give a cat orders. It was easier to nail jelly to a wall. What did it think he was, a dog? Stinking mud oozed off him. Even his ears were full of mud. He went to lick himself clean and then stopped. It was a perfectly normal cat reaction licking yourself clean, but licking this off would probably kill him. There was a movement in the dark. He could just make out some big rat shapes pouring through the hole. There were a couple of splashes. Some of the shapes were creeping along the walls. Ah, said the voice. You see them? Watch them come for you, cat! Morris stopped himself from running. This was no time to listen to his inner cat. His inner cat had got him out of the room, but his inner cat was stupid. It wanted him to attack things small enough and run away from everything else. But no cat could tackle a bunch of rats this size. He froze, and tried to keep an eye on the advancing rats. They were heading directly for him. Hold on. Hold on. 
The voice had said, You can see them. How did it know? Morris tried to think loudly. Can you read my mind? Nothing happened. Morris had a burst of inspiration. He shut his eyes. Open them! came the immediate command, and his eyelids trembled. Shan't, thought Morris. You can't hear my thoughts, he thought. You only use my eyes and ears. You're just guessing what I'm thinking. There was no reply. Morris didn't wait. He leapt. The sloping beam was where he remembered it. He clawed his way up and hung on. At least all they could do was follow him up. With any luck, he could use his claws. The rats got closer. Now there was sniffing for him down below, and he imagined quivering noses in the darkness. One started to climb the beam, still sniffing. It must have been within inches of Morris's tail when it turned around and went back down again. He heard them reach the top of the rubble. There was more bewildered sniffing, and then, in the dark, the sound of the rats paddling through the mud. Morris wrinkled his mud-caked forehead in amazement. Rats who couldn't smell a cat! And then he realised. He didn't smell of cat, he stank of mud. He felt like mud, in a room full of stinking mud. He sat, still as stone, until through muddy-caked ears he heard claws head back to the hole in the wall. Then, without opening his eyes, and with his heart beating hard, he crept carefully back down to the rubble and found that it had piled up against a rotten wooden door. What must have been a piece of plank, soggy as a sponge, fell out as he touched it. A feeling of openness suggested that there was another cellar beyond. It stank of rot and burned wood. Would the voice know where he was if he opened his eyes now? Didn't one cellar look like another? Perhaps this room was full of rats, too. His eyes sprang open. There were no rats, but there was another rusted drain cover, which opened into a tunnel just big enough for him to walk through. He could see a faint light. So, this is the rat world, he thought, as he tried to scrape the mud off himself. Dark and muddy and stinky and full of weird voices. I'm a cat. Sunlight and fresh air, that's my style. All I need now is a hole into the outside world and they won't see me for dust. Or at least, for bits of dried mud. A voice in his head, which wasn't the mysterious voice, but a voice just like his own, said, But what about the stupid-looking kid and the rest of them? You ought to help them. And Morris thought, Where did you come from? I'll tell you what, you help them and I'll go somewhere warm. How about that? The light at the end of the tunnel grew brighter. It still wasn't anything like daylight or even moonlight, but anything was better than this gloom. At least, nearly anything. He pushed his head out of the pipe into a much larger one, made of bricks that were slimy with strange underground nastiness, and into the circle of candlelight. "'It's... Morris,' said Peaches, staring at the mud dripping off his matted fur. "'Smells better than he usually does, then,' said Dark Tan, grinning in what Morris considered was an unfriendly way. "'Oh, har, har,' said Morris weakly. He wasn't in the mood for repartee. "'Ah, I always knew you wouldn't let us down, old friend,' said Dangerous Beans. "'I have always said that we can depend on Morris at least,' he sighed deeply. "'Yes,' said Dark Tan, giving Morris a much more knowing look. "'Depend on him to do what, though?' "'Oh,' said Morris. "'Er, good. I found you all, then.' "'Yes,' said Dark Tan, in what Morris thought was a nasty tone of voice. "'Amazing, isn't it? I expect you've been looking for a long time, too.' I saw you rush off to look for us. Can you help us? said Dangerous Beans. We need a plan. Ah, right, said Morris. I suggest we go upwards at every opportunity to rescue Am and Pork, said Dark Tan. We don't leave our people behind. We don't, said Morris. We don't, said Dark Tan. And then there's the kid, said Peaches. Sardine says he's tied up with the female kid in one of the cellars. Oh, well, you know, humans, said Morris, wrinkling his face. Humans and humans, you know. It's a human kind of thing I don't think we should meddle. Could be misunderstood. I know about humans. They'll sort it out. I don't care a ferret's shirt for humans, snapped Dark Tan. But those rat catchers took ham and pork off in a cage. You saw that room, cat. 
You saw the rats crammed in cages. It's the rat catchers who are stealing the food. Sardines says there's sacks and sacks of food. And there's something else. A voice, said Morris, before he could stop himself. Dark Tan looked up wild-eyed. You heard it, he said. I thought it was just us. The rat catchers can hear it too, said Morris. Only they think it's their own thoughts. It frightened the others, mumbled Dangerous Beans. They just stopped thinking. He looked absolutely dejected. Open beside him, grubby with dirt and paw marks, was Mr. Bunsey has an adventure. Even Toxy ran off, he went on, and he knows how to write. How can that happen? It seemed to affect some of us more than others, said Dark Tan, in a more matter-of-fact voice. I've sent some of the more sensible ones to try and round up the rest, but it's going to be a long job. They were just running blindly. we got to get Ammon Pork, he's the leader. We're rats, after all. A clan. Rats will follow the leader. But he's a bit old, and you're the tough one, and he's not exactly the brains of the outfit, Morris began. They took him away, said Dark Tan. They're rat catchers. He's one of us. Are you going to help or not? Morris thought he heard a scrabbling noise at the other end of his pipe. He couldn't turn around to check, and he suddenly felt very exposed. Uh, yeah, uh, help you, yeah, yeah, he said hurriedly. Ahem. Do you really mean that, Morris? said Peaches. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, said Morris. He crawled out of the pipe and looked back along it. There was no sign of any rats. Sardines is following the rat catchers, said Dark Tan, so we'll find out where they're taking him. I've got a bad feeling that I already know, said Morris. How? snapped Peaches. I'm a cat, right, said Morris. Cats hang around places. We see things. A lot of places don't mind cats wandering, right? Because we keep down the vermin... We keep the... Uh... All right, all right. We know you don't eat anyone who can talk. You keep telling us, said Peaches. Get on with it. I was in a place once. It was a barn. I was up in a hayloft where you can always find a... Uh, uh... Peaches rolled her eyes. Yes, yes, go on. Well, anyway... All these men came in, and I couldn't get away because they had lots of dogs, and they shut the barn doors, and uh, they put up this kind of kind of big round wooden wall in the middle of the floor, and there were some men with boxes of rats, and they tipped the rats into the ring, and then, and then they put some dogs in, too. Terriers, he added, trying to avoid their expressions. The rats fought the dogs, said Dark Tan. Well... I suppose they could have done, said Morris. They mostly ran around and around. It's called rat coursing. Rat catchers bring the rats along, of course, alive. That's what's happening to ham and pork. Rat coursing, said Dark Tan. How is it? We've never heard of this. Morris blinked at him. For clever creatures, the rats could be amazingly stupid at times. "'Why would you hear about it?' he said. "'Surely one of the rats who—' "'You don't seem to understand,' said Morris. "'The rats that go into the pit don't come out, "'at least not breathing.' "'There was silence. "'Can't they jump out?' said Peaches in a little voice. "'Too high,' said Morris. "'Why don't they fight the dogs?' said Dark Tan. Really, really stupid, Morris thought. Because they're rats, Dark Tan, said Morris. Lots of rats, all stinking of one another's fear and panic. You know how it happens. I bit a dog on a nose once, said Dark Tan. Right, right, said Morris soothingly. One rat can think and be brave, right? But a bunch of rats is a mob. A bunch of rats is just a big animal with lots of legs and no brain. That's not true, said Peaches. Together we are strong. Exactly how high, said Dark Tan, who was staring at the candlelight as if seeing pictures in it. What, said Peaches and Morris together. The wall. How high exactly? Well, I don't know. High. Humans were leaning their elbows on it. Does it matter? 
It's far too high for a rat to jump, I know that. Everything we've done, we've done because we've stuck together, Peaches began. We'll rescue Am and Pork together, then, said Dark Tan. We'll... He spun around at the sound of a rat coming along the pipe, and then wrinkled his nose. It's sardines, he said. And, let's see, smells female, young, nervous, nourishing... The youngest member of the trap disposal squad was trailing after sardines. She was wet and dejected. "'You look like a drowned rat, miss,' said Dark Tan. "'Fell in the broken drain, sir,' said Nourishing. "'Good to see you, anyway. What's happening, sardines?' The dancing rat did a few nervous steps. "'I've been climbing up more drain pipes and along more washing lines than is good for me,' he said. "'And don't ask me about cr cr cats, boss. I'd like to see every last one of them dead.' "'Saving your honour's presence, of course,' Sardines added, eyeing Morris nervously. "'And?' said Peaches. "'Kind of stables, right on the edge of town,' said Sardines. "'Smells bad. Lots of dogs around. Men, too.' "'Rat pit,' said Morris. "'I told you. They've been breeding rats for the rat pit.' "'Right,' said Dark Tan. "'We're gonna get ham and pork out of there. Sardines, you will show me the way.' We'll try to pick up anyone on the way who looks halfway sensible. The rest of you should try and find a kid. Why are you giving orders? said Peaches. Because someone has to, said Dark Tan. Ammon Pork might be a bit scabby and set in his ways, but he's the leader and everyone smells that and we need him. Any questions? Right. Can I come, sir? said Nourishing. She's helping me carry my string, boss, Sardines explained. Both he and the younger rat were carrying bundles of it. "'Do you need all of that?' said Dark Tan. "'You should never say no to a piece of string, boss,' said Sardines earnestly. "'It's amazing some of the stuff I've been finding.' "'All right. So long as she's useful for something,' said Dark Tan. "'She'd better be able to keep up. Let's go.' And then there was just Dangerous Beans, Peaches, and Morris. Dangerous Beans sighed. "'One rat can be brave, but a bunch of rats is just a mob,' he said. "'Are you right, Morris?' "'No, I was—' "'Look, there was something back there,' said Morris. "'It's in a cellar. I don't know what it was. It's the voice that gets into people's heads.' "'Not everyone,' said Peaches. "'It didn't frighten you, did it? Or us? Or Dark Tan? It made ham and pork very angry. Why?' Morris blinked. He could hear the voice in his head again. It was very faint, and it certainly wasn't his own thoughts, and it said, I will find a way in, cat! Did you hear that? he said. I didn't hear anything, said Peaches. Perhaps you have to be close, Morris thought. Perhaps, if you've been close, it knows where your head lives. He'd never seen a rat so miserable as Dangerous Beans. The little rat was huddled by the candle, staring unseeing at Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure. "'I hoped it would be better than this,' said Dangerous Beans. "'But it turns out we're just rats. As soon as there's trouble, we're just rats.' It was very unusual for Morris to feel sympathetic to anyone who wasn't Morris. In a cat, that is a major character flaw. "'I must be ill,' he thought." "'If it's any help, I'm just a cat,' he said. "'Oh, but you are not. You are kind, and deep down I sense that you have a generous nature,' said Dangerous Beans. Morris tried not to look at Peaches. "'Oh, boy,' he thought. "'At least you ask people before you eat them,' said Peaches. "'You'd better tell them,' said Morris's thoughts. "'Go on, tell them. You'd feel better.' Morris tried to tell his thoughts to shut up. What a time to get a conscience! What good was a cat with a conscience? A cat with a conscience was a... a hamster, or something. Er, uh, I've been meaning to talk to you about that, he muttered. Go on, tell them, said his shiny new conscience. Get it out in the open. Yes, said Peaches. Morris squirmed. Well, you know I do always check my food these days. "'Yes, and it does you great credit,' said Dangerous Beans. "'Now Morris felt even worse. "'Well, you know how we've always wondered "'how come 
I got changed even though I never ate any of that magical stuff on the dump? Yes, said Peaches. That has always puzzled me. Morris shifted uneasily. Well, you know, er, uh, did you ever know a rat quite big, one ear missing, bit of white fur on one side, couldn't run too fast, cut a bad leg? That sounds like additives, said Peaches. Oh, yes, said Dangerous Beans. He disappeared before we met you, Morris. A good rat. He had a bit of a speech difficulty. Speech difficulty, said Morris gloomily. He stammered, said Peaches, giving Morris a long, cool stare. Couldn't get his words out very easily. Not very easily, said Morris, his voice now quite hollow. But I'm sure you never met him, Morris, said Dangerous Beans. I miss him. He was a wonderful rat once you got him talking. Ahem. Did you meet him, Morris? said Peaches, her stare nailing him to the wall. Morris's face moved. It tried various expressions one after another. Then he said, All right, I ate him, okay, all of him. Except for the tail and the green wobbly bit and that nasty purple lump, no one knows what it is. I was just a cat. I hadn't learned to think yet. I didn't know. I was hungry. Cats eat rats, that's how it goes. It wasn't my fault. And he'd been eating the magical stuff, and I ate him, so then I got changed too. Know how that feels, seeing the green wobbly bit like that? It doesn't feel good. Sometimes on dark nights I think I can hear him talking down there. All right? Satisfied? I didn't know he was anyone. I didn't know I was anyone. I ate him. He'd been eating the stuff on a dump, and I ate him, so that's how I got changed. I admit it. I ate him. It wasn't my fault. And then there was silence. After a while, Peaches said, Yes, but that was a long time ago, wasn't it? What? You mean, have I eaten anyone lately? No. Are you sorry for what you did? said Dangerous Beans. Sorry? What do you think? Sometimes I have nightmares where I burp and he... Then that's probably all right, said the little rat. All right, said Morris. How can it be all right? And you know the worst part? I'm a cat. Cat don't go round feeling sorry or guilty. We never regret anything. Do you know what it feels like saying, Hello, food, can you talk? That's not how a cat is supposed to behave. We don't act how rats are supposed to behave, said Dangerous Beans. And then his face fell again. Up until now, he sighed. Everyone was frightened, said Peaches. Fear spreads. I hoped we could be more than rats, said Dangerous Beans. I thought we could be more than things that squeak and whittle, whatever Ham and Pork says. And now where is everyone? Shall I read to you from Mr. Bumsey? said Peaches, her voice full of concern. You know that always cheers you up when you're in one of your dark times. There was a nod from Dangerous Beans. Peaches pulled the huge book towards her and began to read. One day... Mr. Bunsey and his friend Ratty Rupert the Rat went to see Old Man Donkey, who lived by the river. Read a bit when they talk to the humans, said Dangerous Beans. Peaches obediently turned a page. Hello, Ratty Rupert, said Farmer Fred. What a lovely day it is, to be sure. This is mad, thought Morris, as he listened to a story about wild woods and fresh bubbling streams being read to one rat by another rat, while they sat beside a drain along which ran something which certainly wasn't fresh. Anything but fresh. To be fair, though, it was bubbling a bit, or at least glooping. Everything's going down the drain, and they have this little picture in their heads about how nice things could be. Look at those little pink sad eyes, said Morris's own thoughts in Morris's own head. Look at those little wobbly wrinkly noses. If you ran out on them and left them here, how could you look those little wobbly noses in the face again? I wouldn't have to, said Morris out loud. That's the point. What? said Peaches, looking up from the book. Uh, oh, uh, nothing. Morris paused. 
There was nothing for it. It went against everything a cat stood for. This is what thinking does for you, he thought. It gets you into trouble. Even when you know other people can think for themselves, you start thinking for them too. Of course, humans were useful. They could open doors and provide fish. He groaned. We'd better see what's happened to the kid, he said. It was completely black in this cellar. All there was, apart from the occasional drip of water, were voices. So, said the voice of Melissa, let's go over it again, shall we? You don't have a knife of any kind. That's right, said Keith. Or some handy matches that could burn through the rope. No? And no sharp edge near you that you could rub the rope on? No. And you can't pull your legs through your arms so that you can get your hands in front of you? No. And you don't have any secret powers? No. Are you sure? The moment I saw you, I thought, he's got some amazing power that will probably manifest itself when he's in dire trouble. I thought, no one could really be as useless as that unless it was a disguise. No, I'm sure. Look, I'm just a normal person. Yes, all right, I was abandoned as a baby. I don't know why. It was something that happened. They say it happens quite a lot. It doesn't make you special. And I don't have any secret markings, as if I was some kind of sheep. And I don't think I'm a hero in disguise. And I don't have some kind of amazing talent that I'm aware of. OK, I'm good at playing quite a few musical instruments. I practice a lot. But I'm the kind of person heroes aren't. I get by and I get along. I do my best. Understand? Oh, you should have found someone else. In effect, you can't be any help at all. No. There was silence for a while, and then Melissa said, You know, in many ways, I don't think this adventure has been properly organised. Oh, really? said Keith. Well, this is not how people should be tied up. Melissa, do you understand this isn't a story? said Keith as patiently as he could. That's what I keep trying to tell you. Real life isn't a story. There isn't some kind of of magic that keeps you safe and makes crooks look the other way and not hit you too hard and tie you up next to a handy knife and not kill you. Do you understand? There was some more dark silence. My granny and my great aunt were very famous storytellers, you know, said Melissa eventually, in a strained little voice. Agonista und Evisera Grimm. You said, said Keith. My mother would have been a good storyteller too, but my father doesn't like stories. That's why I've changed my name to Grimm for professional purposes. Really? I used to get beaten when I was small for telling stories, Melissa went on. Beaten, said Keith. All right then, schmacked, said Melissa. On the leg. But it did hurt. My father says you can't run a city on stories. He says you have to be practical. Oh! Aren't you interested in anything except music? He broke your pipe. I expect I'll buy another one. The calm voice infuriated Melissa. Well, I'll tell you something, she said. If you don't turn your life into a story, you just become part of someone else's story. And what if your story doesn't work? You keep changing it until you find one that does. Sounds silly. Ha! Look at you. You're just a face in someone else's background. You let a cat make all the decisions. That's because Morris is... A voice said, Would you like us to go away until you stop being human? Morris, said Keith, is that you? Where are you? I'm in a drain, and believe me, this has not been a good night. Do you know how many old cellars there are here? Good job you two kept arguing, said the voice of Morris in the blackness. Peaches is bringing a candle in. It's too dark even for me to see you. Who's Peaches? whispered Melissa. She's another changeling, a thinking rat, said Keith. Like pilchards? Like sardines, yes. Aha, hissed Melissa. See, a story. I am schmug, I gloat. The plucky rats rescue our heroes, probably by gnawing through the ropes. Oh, we're back in your story, are we? said Keith. And what am I in your story? I know it's not going to be a romantic interest, said Melissa, and you're not funny enough for comic relief, I don't know. Probably just someone, you know, like man in street, something like that. 
there were faint sounds in the darkness. "'What are they doing now?' she whispered. "'Trying to light their candle, I think. "'Rats play with fire?' Melissa hissed. "'They don't play. "'Dangerous Beans thinks lights and shadows are very important. "'They always have a candle alight somewhere in their tunnels, wherever they—' "'Dangerous Beans? What sort of name is that?' "'Shh! "'They just learned words of old food tins and signs and things. "'They didn't know what the words meant. "'They just chose them because they liked the sounds.' Yes, but dangerous beans? It sounds as if he makes you. It's his name. Don't make fun of it. Sorry, I'm sure, said Melissa. The match flared. The candle flame grew. Melissa looked down at two rats. One was, well, just a small rat, although sleeker than most of the ones she'd seen. In fact, most of the ones she'd seen had been dead, but even the living ones had always been twitchy, nervy sniffing the air all the time. This one just watched. It stared right at her. The other rat was white and even smaller. It was also watching her, although peering was a better word. It had pink eyes. Melissa had never been very interested in other people's feelings, since she'd always considered that her own were a lot more interesting. But there was something sad and worrying about that rat. It was dragging a small book, or at least what would be a small book to a human. It was about half the size of a rat. The cover was quite colourful, but Melissa couldn't make out what it was. "'Peaches and dangerous beans,' said Keith. "'This is Melissa. Her father is the mayor here.' "'Hello,' said dangerous beans. "'Mayor? Isn't that like government?' said Peaches. "'Morris says governments are very dangerous criminals and steal money from people. "'How did you teach them to speak?' said Melissa. They taught themselves, said Keith. They're not trained animals, you know. Well, my father does not steal from anyone. Who taught them that governments are very... Uh, excuse me, excuse me, said Morris's voice hurriedly from the drain grate. That's right, I'm down here. Can we get on with things? Uh, we'd like you to gnaw our ropes, please, said Keith. I've got a bit of broken knife blade, said Peaches. It's for sharpening the pencil. That be better. Knife? said Melissa. Pencil? I did say they weren't ordinary rats, said Keith. Nourishing had to run to keep up with Dark Tan, and Dark Tan was running because he had to run to keep up with sardines. When it came to moving fast across a town, sardines was champion of the world. They picked up more rats on the way. Nourishing couldn't help noticing that these were mostly the younger ones, who'd fled because of the terror but hadn't gone far. They fell in behind Dark Tan readily, grateful to be doing something with a purpose. Sardines danced on ahead. He just couldn't help it. And he liked drain pipes, roofs and gutters. You've got no dogs up there, he said, and not many cats. No cat could have followed sardines. The people of Bart Blintz had strung washing lines between the ancient houses, and he leapt onto them, clinging upside down and moving as fast as he would on a flat surface. He went straight up walls, plunged through thatch, tap-danced around smoking chimneys, slid down tiles. Pigeons erupted from their roosts as he sped past, the other rats trailing behind him. Clouds rolled across the moon. Sardines reached the edge of a roof and leapt, landing on a wall just below. He ran along the top and disappeared in the crack between two planks. Nourishing followed him into a kind of loft. Hay was piled in parts of it, but a larger part was simply open to the ground floor below, and supported by several heavy beams that ran right across the building. Bright light shone up from below, and there was the buzz of human voices, and, she shuddered, the barking of dogs. "'This is a big stables, boss,' said Sardines. "'The pit's under the beam over there. Come on!' They crept out on the ancient woodwork and peered over the edge. Far below was a wooden circle, like half a giant barrel. Nourishing realised that they were right over the pit. If she fell now, she'd land in the middle of it. Men were crowded around it. Dogs were tied up around the walls, barking at one another and at the universe in general in the mad I'm-going-to-do-this-forever way of all dogs. And off to one side was a stack of boxes and sacks. The sacks were moving. Kurt! "'How the cut will we find ham and pork in this lot?' Dark Tan said, his eyes gleaming in the light from below. 
"'Well, with old ham and pork, boss, I reckon we'll know when he turns up,' said Sardines. "'Could you drop into the pit on a string?' "'I'm game for anything, Gov,' said Sardines loyally. "'Into a pit? With a dog in it, sir?' said Nourishing. "'And won't the string cut you in half?' "'Ah, I've got something that helps there, boss,' said Sardines. He took off his thick coil of string and put it aside. There was another coil under it, glistening and light brown. He pulled at a piece of it, and it snapped back with a faint twang. "'Bands of rubber,' he said. "'I pinched them off a desk when I was looking for more string. I've used them before, boss. Very handy for a long drop, boss.' Dark Tan looked back on the boards. There was an old candle lantern there, lying on its side, the glass smashed, the candle eaten long ago. Good, he said, because I'm getting an idea. If you can drop down... There was a roar from below. The rats looked over the beam again. The circle of heads had thickened around the lip of the pit. A man was talking in a loud voice. Occasionally there was a cheer. The black top hats of the rat catchers moved through the crowd. Seen from above, they were sinister black blobs among the grey and brown caps. One of the rat-catchers emptied a sack into the pit, and the watchers saw the dark shapes of rats scurrying in a panic as they tried to find in that circle a corner to hide in. The crowd opened slightly, and a man walked to the edge of the pit, holding a terrier. There was some more shouting, a ripple of laughter, and the dog was dropped in with the rats. The changelings stared down at the circle of death and the cheering humans. After a minute or two, Nourishing tore her gaze away. When she looked around, she caught the expression on Dark Tan's face. Maybe it wasn't just the lamplight made his eyes look full of fire. She saw him look along the stables, the big doors at the far end. They had been barred shut. Then his head turned to the hay and straw piled up in the loft, and in the cribs and the mangers below. Dark Tan pulled a length of wood out of one of his belts. Nourishing smelled the sulphur in the red blob on the end. It was a match. Dark Tan turned and saw her looking at him. He nodded towards the piles of hay in the loft. My plan might not work, he said. If it doesn't, you'll be in charge of the other plan. Me? said Nourishing. You. Because I won't be... around, said Dark Tan. He held out the match. You know what to do, he said, nodding to the nearest rack of hay. Nourishing swallowed. Yes. Yes, I think so. Uh, when? When the time comes. You'll know when, said Dark Tan, and looked back down at the massacre. One way or the other, I want them to remember tonight, he said quietly. They'll remember what they did, and they'll remember what we did, for as long as they live. Ham and Pork lay in his sack. He could smell the other rats nearby, and the dogs, and the blood, especially the blood. He could hear his thoughts, but they were like a litter of insects against the thunderstorm of his senses. Bits of memory danced in front of his eyes. Cages. Panic. The White Rat. Ham and Pork. That was his own name. Odd. Never had names. Just used to smell other rats. Darkness. Darkness inside, behind the eyes. That bit was Ham and Pork. Everything outside was everything else. Ham and Pork. Me. Leader. The red-hot rage still boiled inside him, but now it had a kind of shape, like the shape a canyon gives to a river in flood, narrowing it, forcing it to flow faster, giving it direction. Now he could hear voices. Just slip him in, no one will notice. Okay, I'll shake it up a bit first to get him angry. The sack was jerked around. It didn't make ham and pork any more angry than he was already. There wasn't any room for more anger. The sack swung as it was carried. The roar of humans grew louder. The smells grew stronger. There was a moment of silence. The sack was upturned, and Ham and Pork slid out into a roar of noise and a pile of struggling rats. He snapped and clawed his way to the top as the rats scattered, and saw a growling dog being lowered into the pit. It snatched up a rat, shook it vigorously, and sent the limp body flying. The rats stampeded. Idiots! screamed Ham and Pork. Work together! You could strip this flea bag to the bone! The crowd stopped shouting. The dog stopped and stared down its nose at Ham and Pork. It was trying to think. The rat had spoken. Only humans spoke. And it didn't smell right. 
Rats usually stank of panic. This one didn't. The silence rang like a bell. Then Jacko grabbed the rat, shook him, not too hard, and tossed him down. He decided to do a sort of test. Rats shouldn't be able to talk like humans, but this rat looked like a rat, and killing rats was okay. But talk like a human, and biting humans got you a serious thrashing. It had to find out for sure. If it got a wallop, this rat was a human. Ham and Pork rolled, and managed to get upright, but there was a deep tooth wound in his side. The other rats were still in a boiling huddle as far away from the dog as possible, every rat trying to be the one on the bottom. Ham and Pork spat blood. "'All right, then,' he snarled, advancing on the puzzled dog. "'Now you'll find out how a real rat dies.' "'Ham and Pork?' he looked up. String uncoiled behind sardines as he fell through the smoky air towards the frantic circle. He was right above Ham and Pork, getting bigger and bigger and slower and slower. He came to a stop between the dog and the rat. For a moment he hung there. He raised his hat politely and said, "'Good evening.' Then he wrapped all four legs round Ham and Pork, and now the rope of elastic bands, stretched to twanging point, finally sprang back. Too late! Too late! Jacko snapped at the empty air. The rats were accelerated upwards, out of the pit, and stopped, bouncing in mid-air just out of reach. The dog was still looking up when Dark Tan leapt off the other side of the beam. As the crowd stared in astonishment, he plummeted down towards the terrier. Jacko's eyes narrowed. Rats disappearing into the air was one thing, but rats dropping right towards his mouth was something else. It was rat on a plate. It was rat on a stick. Dark Tan looked back as he fell. Up above, Nourishing was doing some frantic knotting and biting. Now Dark Tan was on the other end of Sardine's string. Sardines had explained things very carefully. Dark Tan's weight alone wasn't heavy enough to pull the weight of two other rats back up to the beam. So, when Dark Tan saw Sardines and his struggling passenger had disappeared safely into the gloom of the roof, he let go of the big old candle lamp he'd been holding for the extra weight and bit through the rope. The lamp landed heavily on Jacko, and Dark Tan landed on the lamp, rolling down onto the floor. The crowd was silent. They'd been silent since Ham and Pork had been propelled out of the pit. Around the top of the wall, which, yes, was far too high for a rat to jump, Dark Tan saw faces. They were mostly red. The mouths were mostly open. The silence was the silence of big red faces, drawing breath, ready to start shouting at any moment. Around Dark Tan the surviving rats were scrambling aimlessly for a foothold on the wall. Fools, he thought. Four or five of you together could make any dog wish you'd never been born. But you scrabble and duck and you get picked off one at a time. The slightly stunned Jacko blinked and stared down at Dark Tan, a growl rising in his throat. "'Right, you crook,' said Dark Tan, loud enough for the watchers to hear. "'Now I'm going to show you how a rat can live,' he attacked. Jacko was not a bad dog, according to the way of dogs. He was a terrier, and liked killing rats in any case, and killing lots of rats in the pit meant that he got well fed and called a good boy and wasn't kicked very often. Some rats did fight back, and that wasn't much of a problem, because they were smaller than Jacko, and he had a lot more teeth. Jacko wasn't that smart, but he was a lot smarter than a rat, and, in any case, his nose and mouth did most of the thinking. And he was surprised, therefore, when his jaws snapped shut on this new rat, and it wasn't there. Dark Tan didn't run like a rat should. He ducked like a fighter. He nipped Jacko under the chin and vanished. Jacko spun round. The rat still wasn't there. Jacko had spent his show business career biting rats that tried to run away. Rats that stayed really close were unfair. There was a roar from the watchers. Someone shouted, Ten dollars on the rat! And someone else punched him in the ear. Another man started to climb into the pit. Someone smashed a beer bottle on that man's head. Dancing back and forth under the spinning, yapping Jacko, Dark Tan waited for his moment and saw it, and lunged, and bit hard. Jacko's eyes crossed. A piece of Jacko that was very private, and of interest only to Jacko and any lady dogs he might happen to meet, was suddenly a little ball of pain. He yelped, he snapped at the air, and then, in the uproar, he tried to climb out of the pit, out of the way of the pain. 
His claws scraped desperately as he reared up against the greasy, smooth planking. Dark Tan jumped onto his tail, ran up his back, scampered to the tip of Jacko's nose, and leapt over the wall. He landed among legs. Men tried to stamp on him, but that meant other men would have to give them room. By the time they'd elbowed one another out of the way and stamped heavily on one another's boots, Dark Tan was gone. But there were other dogs. They were half mad with excitement in any case, and now they pulled away from ropes and chains and set off after a running rat. They knew about chasing rats. Dark Tan knew about running. He sped across the floor like a comet, with a tail of snarling, barking dogs, headed to the shadows, spied a hole in the planking, and dived through into the nice, safe darkness. Click! went the trap. Chapter 9 Farmer Fred opened his door and saw all the animals of Fairy Bottom waiting for him. "'We can't find Mr. Bunsey or Ratty Rupert!' they cried. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure "'At last!' said Melissa, shaking the ropes off. "'Somehow I thought rats would gnaw quicker!' "'They used a knife,' said Keith. "'And you could say thank you, couldn't you?' "'Yes, yes, tell them I'm very grateful,' said Melissa, pushing herself upright. "'Tell them yourself.' "'I'm sorry. I find it so embarrassing to talk to rats.' "'I suppose that's understandable,' said Keith, "'if you've been brought up to hate them because they—' "'Oh, it's not that,' said Melissa, walking over to the door and looking at the keyhole. "'It's just that it's so childish, so tinkly-winkly, so Mr. Bunsey.' "'Mr. Bunsey?' squeaked Peaches, and it really was a squeak, a word that came out as a sort of little shriek. "'What about, Mr. Bunsey?' said Keith. Melissa reached into her pocket and pulled out her packet of bent hairpins. "'Oh, some book some silly woman wrote,' she said, poking at the lock. "'Stupid stuff for eager kids. There's a rat, and a rabbit, and a snake, and a hen, and an owl, and they all go around wearing clothes and talking to humans, and everyone's so nice and cosy it makes you absolutely sick. Do you know my father kept them all from when he was a kid? Mr. Bunsey has an adventure, Mr. Bunsey's busy day, Ratty Rupert sees it through. He read them all to me when I was small, and there's not an interesting murder in any of them. I think you'd better stop, said Keith. He didn't dare look down at the rats. There's no subtext, no social commentary, Melissa went on, still fiddling. The most interesting things that happens at all is when Doris the Duck loses a shoe. A duck losing a shoe, right? And it turns up under the bed after they've spent the entire story looking for it. Do you call that narrative tension? Because I don't. If people are going to make up stupid stories about animals pretending to be human, at least there could be a bit of interesting violence. Oh, boy, said Morris, from behind the grating. This time Keith did look down. Peaches and dangerous beans had gone. You know, I never had the heart to tell them, he said, not to anyone in particular. They thought it was all true. In the land of furry bottom, possibly, said Melissa, and stood up as the lock gave a final click. But not here. Can you imagine someone actually invented that name and didn't laugh? Let's go. You upset them, said Keith. Look, shall we get out of here before the rat catchers come back? said Melissa. The thing about this girl, Morris thought, was that she was no good at all at listening to the way people spoke. She wasn't much good at listening, if it came to that. No, said Keith. No, what? No, I'm not coming with you, said Keith. There's something bad going on here, much worse than stupid men stealing food. Morris watched them argue again. Humans, eh? Think they're lords of creation, not like us cats. We know we are. Ever see a cat feed a human? Case proven. How the human shout! hissed a tiny voice in his head. Is that my conscience? Morris thought. His own thought said, What? Me? No. But I feel a lot better now you told them about additives. Morris shifted uneasily from paw to paw. Well then, he whispered, looking at his stomach, is that you, additives? He'd been worried about that. Suppose the the dream of additives wandered around inside him. 
That sort of thing could seriously interfere with a cat's napping time. It really could. No, said the voice, like the sound of wind in distant trees. It is I. I am Spider. Oh, you're a spider, whispered Thought Morris. I could take on a spider with three paws tied behind my back. Not a spider. Spider! The word actually hurt. It hadn't before. Now I'm in your head, cat. Cats! Cats! Bad as dogs, worse than rats. I'm in your head, and I will never go away. Morris's paw jerked. I'll be in your dreams. Look, I'm just passing through, Morris whispered desperately. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm unreliable. I'm a cat. I wouldn't trust me, and I am me. Just let me get into the nice fresh air, and I'll be right out your hair or legs or furry bits or whatever. You don't want to run away. That's right, thought Morris. I do want to run away. I'm a cat, he muttered. No rat is going to control me. You've tried. Yes, came the voice of Spider. But then you were strong. Now your little mind runs in circles and wants someone else to do the thinking for it. I can think for you. I can think for everyone. I will always be with you. The voice faded away. Right, thought Morris. Time to say farewell, then, bad blints. The party is over. The rats have got lots of other rats, and even these two humans have got one another. But I've just got me, and I'd like to get me somewhere where strange voices don't talk to me. Excuse me, he said, raising his voice. Are you going, or what? The two humans turned to look at the grating. What? said Keith. I prefer going, said Morris. Pull this grating out, will you? It's rusted right through. It shouldn't be a problem. Good lad. And then we can make a run for it. They've called in a rat piper, Morris, said Keith, and the clan is all over the place. He'll be here in the morning. A real rat piper, Morris, not a fake one like me. They have magical pipes, you know. Do you want that to happen to our rats? His new conscience gave Morris a good kicking. Well, not exactly see, he said reluctantly. Not as such, no. Right, so we're not going to run away, said Keith. Oh, and what are we going to do then? said Melissa. We are going to talk to the rat catchers when they come back, said Keith. He had a thoughtful look. Aunt, what makes you think they'll want to talk to us? Because if they don't talk to us, said Keith, they're going to die. It was twenty minutes later that the rat catchers arrived. The door was unlocked, thrown back, and then slammed shut. Rat catcher two bolted it as well. "'You know where you said it was going to be such a good evening?' he said, leaning against it and panting. "'Tell me about it again, because I think I missed that part.' "'Shut up,' said Ratcatcher One. "'Someone punched me in the eye.' "'Shut up.' "'And I think I lost my wallet. "'That's twenty dollars I won't see again in a hurry.' "'Shut up.' "'And I wasn't able to pick up any of the surviving rats from the last fight.' "'Shut up.' And we left the dogs behind, too. We could have stopped to untie them. Someone will pinch them. Shut up. Do rats often whiz through the air like that? Or is that the kind of thing you only get to hear about when you are a experienced rat catcher? Did I say shut up? Yes, shut up. All right, we'll leave right now. We'll take the money and nick a boat down at the jetty, okay? We'll leave the stuff we haven't sold and just go. Just like that? Johnny No Hands and his lads are coming up river tomorrow night to pick up the next load, and we'll go, Bill. I can smell things going bad. Just like that? He owes us two hundred doll Yes, just like that. Time to move on. The jig is up, the bird has flowed, and the cat is out of the bag. The Did you say that? Say what? Did you just say I wish I was? Me? No. 
The rat catcher looked around the shed. There was no one else there. All right, then, he said. It's been a long night. Look, when things start to go bad, then it's time to go away. Nothing fancy. We just go, right? I don't want to be here when people come looking for us. And I don't want to meet any of them rat pipers. They are sharp men. They pry around, and they cost a lot of money. People are going to ask questions, and the only question I want them to ask is, where did the rat catchers go? Understand? It's a good man who knows when to quit. What's in the kitty? What did you say? What? Me? Nothing. Cup of tea? You always feel better after a cup of tea. Didn't you say, Kitty yourself? Ratcatcher One demanded. I just asked if you wanted a cup of tea. Honest, are you all right? Ratcatcher One stared at his friend, as if trying to see a lie in his face. Then he said, Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Three sugars, then. That's right, said Ratcatcher Two, spooning it in. Keep up your strength. You have to look after yourself. Ratcatcher One took the mug, sipped the tea, and stared at the swirling surface. How did we get into this? he said. I mean, all this, you know. Sometimes I wake up in the night and I think it's stupid, this. And then I come to work and it all seems, well, sensible. I mean, stealing stuff and blaming it on the rats, yes, and breeding big tough rats for the rat pits and bringing back the ones that survive so we can breed even bigger rats, yes. But, I don't know, I didn't used to be the kind of bloke that ties up kids. We've made a big wad of cash, though. Here, Ratcatcher One swirled the tea in his mug and took another drink. Where's that, I suppose? Is this a new tea? No, it's just Lord Green like normal. Tastes a bit different. Ratcatcher One drained the mug and put it on the bench. Okay, let's get the... That's about enough, said a voice overhead. Now stand still and listen to me. If you run away, you'll die. If you talk too much, you'll die. If you wait too long, you'll die. If you think you're smart, you'll die. Any questions? A few wisps of dust drifted down from the rafters. The rat catchers looked up and saw a cat face peering down. It's that kid's damn mug, said Rat Catcher One. I told you it was looking at me in a funny way. If I was you... I wouldn't look at me, said Morris conversationally. I'd look at the rat poison. Rat catcher two turned to look at the bench. A bag was missing. Here, who stole the poison? he said. Oh, said rat catcher one, who was a much faster thinker. Steal it, said the cat on high. We don't steal. That's thieving. We just put it somewhere else. Oh, said Ratcatcher One, sitting down suddenly. "'That's dangerous stuff,' said Ratcatcher Two, looking for something to throw. "'You had no business touching it. You tell me where it is right now.' There was a thump as the trap door in the floor slammed back. Keith stuck his head up, and then came up the ladder while the Ratcatchers watched in amazement. He was holding a crumpled paper bag. "'Oh, dear,' said Ratcatcher One. "'What have you done with the poison?' Ratcatcher Two demanded. Well, said Keith, now that you mention it, I think I put most of it in the sugar. Dark Tan woke up. His back was on fire and he couldn't breathe. He could feel the weight of the trap's jaw pressing down on him and the dreadful bite of the steel teeth on his belly. I shouldn't be alive, he thought. I wish I wasn't. He tried to push himself upwards, which made it worse. The pain came back a little stronger as he sagged down again. Caught! like a rat in a trap, he thought. I wonder what type it is. Dark Tan? The voice was a little way off. Dark Tan tried to speak, but every tiny movement pushed him further into the teeth below him. Dark Tan? Dark Tan managed a faint squeak. Words hurt too much. Feet scrabbled forwards in the dry darkness. Dark Tan! It smelled like nourishing. <coughs> Dark Tan managed, trying to turn his head. You're caught in a trap. That was too much for Dark Tan, even if every word was agony. Oh, really? he said. I'll go and fetch sardines, shall I? stammered nourishing. Dark Tan could smell the rat's panic begin, and there was... No! Oh, tell me! 
he panted. What kind of trap? Uh, 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 said Nourishing. Dark Tan took a deep, fiery breath. Thank you, miserable whittler. Uh, uh, it's all rusty, uh, rust everywhere. Looks like, uh, could be, a uh, break back. There was a scratching noise behind Dark Tan. Yes, I gnawed the rust off. It says, Nugent Brothers Break Back Mark One, sir. Dark Tan tried to think as the constant, dreadful pressure squeezed him further. Mark One, ancient, something out of the dawn of time. The oldest he'd ever seen was an improved breakback Mark Seven, and all he had to help him was nourishing a complete drolt with four left feet. Can you see how? He began, but there were purple lights in front of his eyes now, a great tunnel of purple lights. He tried again as he felt himself drift off towards the lights. Can you see how the spring... It's all rusted, sir, came the panicking voice. It looks like it's a non-return action, like on the Jenkins and Jenkins big snapper, sir. But it hasn't got the hook on the end. Uh, what does this bit do, sir? 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 Dark Tan felt the pain go away. So this is how it happens, he thought dreamily. Too late now. She'll panic and she'll run. That's what we do. When we're in trouble, we bolt for the first hole. Even me. But it doesn't matter. It is just like a dream, after all. Nothing to worry about. Quite nice, really. Perhaps there really is a big rat deep under the ground. That'd be nice. He drifted happily in the warm silence. There were bad things happening, but they were a long way off, and they didn't matter any more. He thought he heard a sound behind him, like rat claws moving across a stone floor. Perhaps it's nourishing running away, part of him thought. But another part thought, perhaps it is the bone rat. The idea didn't frighten him. Nothing could frighten him here. Anything bad that could happen already had. He felt that if he turned his head, he'd see something. But it was easier just to float in this big, warm space. The purple light was darkening now to a deep blue, and in the centre of the blue, a circle of black. It looked like a rat's tunnel. If the youngsters were right and there was a bone rat, he thought, then that means maybe there was also the big rat. And that's where he lives, thought Dark Tan. That's the tunnel of the big rat. How simple it all is. A shining white dot appeared in the centre of the tunnel and got bigger quickly. And here he comes, thought Dark Tan. He must know a lot, the big rat. I wonder what he's going to tell me. The light grew bigger and did indeed begin to look like a rat. How strange, thought Dark Tan, as the blue light faded into the black, to find it's all true. Off we go, then. Into the tun... There was noise. It filled the world, and the terrible, terrible pain was back, and the big rat shouted in the voice of nourishing. I gnawed through the spring, sir. I gnawed through the spring. It was old and weak, sir. Probably why you weren't cut in half, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Dark Tan? Sir? I gnawed right through the spring, sir. Are you still dead, sir? Sir? Rat Catcher One leapt out of his chair, his hands bunching into fists. At least it started out as a leap. About halfway it turned into a stagger. He sat down heavily, clutching at his stomach. Oh no! Oh no! I knew that tea tasted funny, he muttered. Rat Catcher Two had gone a pale green. You nasty little, he began. And don't even think of attacking us, said Melissa. Otherwise you'll never walk out of here, and we might get hurt and forget where we left the antidote. You haven't got time to attack us. Rat Catcher One tried standing up again, but his legs didn't want to play. What poisoned was it? he muttered. By the smell of it, it's the one the rats call number three, said Keith. It was in the bag labelled Kill a Lot. The rats call it number three? said Rat Catcher Two. They know a lot about poison, said Keith. And they told you about this antidote, yeah? said Rat Catcher Two. Ratcatcher One glared at him. We heard them talk, Bill. In the pit, remember? He looked back at Keith and shook his head. Nah, he said. You don't look like the kind of kid that'll poison a man to his face. How about me? said Melissa, leaning forward. She would! She would! said Ratcatcher Two, clutching at his colleague's arm. She's reared that one. Everyone says so. He clutched his stomach again and leaned forward, groaning. 
"'You say something about an antidote,' said Ratcatcher One. "'But there's no antidote to kill a lot.' "'And I told you there is,' said Keith. "'The rats found one.' Ratcatcher Two fell on his knees. "'Please, young sir, have mercy. "'If not for me, please think of my dear wife and my four lovely children "'who'll be without their daddy.' "'You're not married,' said Melissa. "'You don't have any children.' "'I might want some one day.' "'What happened to that rat you took away?' said Keith. "'Don all, sir. A rat in a hat came down out of the roof and grabbed it and flew away,' Ratcatcher Two babbled. "'And then another big rat come down into the pit, shouted at everyone, bit Jacko on the, uh, uh, on the unutterables, and jumped right out of the pit and did a runner.' "'Sounds like your rats are all right,' said Melissa to Keith. "'I haven't finished,' said Keith. "'You stole from everyone and blamed it on the rats, didn't you?' "'Yes, that's it. Yes, we did. We did.' "'You killed the rats,' said Morris quietly. Ratcatcher One's head turned sharply. There was an edge to that voice that he recognised. He'd heard it at the pit. You got them there sometimes, high rolling types with fancy waistcoats, who travel through the mountains making a living by betting and sometimes making a killing by knives. They had a look to their eye and a tone to their voice. They were known as killing gentlemen. You didn't cross a killing gentleman. Uh, yes, yes, that's right, we did, babbled Ratcatcher Two. Just go carefully there, Bill, said Ratcatcher One, still eyeing Keith. Why did you do it? said Keith. Ratcatcher Two looked from his boss to Melissa, and then to Keith, as if trying to decide who frightened him the most. Well, Ron said the rats ate the stuff anyway, he said. So he said, if we got rid of all the rats and pinched the stuff ourselves, well, it wouldn't exactly be like stealing, would it? More like rearranging stuff. There's a bloke Ron knows who comes up in a sailing barge in the middle of the night and pays us. That is a diabolical lie, snapped Ratcatcher One, and then he looked as if he was going to be sick. But you caught rats alive and crammed them into cages without food, Keith went on. They live on rat, those rats. Why did you do that? Ratcatcher One clutched at his stomach. I can feel things happening, he said. That's just your imagination, snapped Keith. It is? Yes. Don't you know anything about the poisons you use? Your stomach won't start to melt for at least twenty minutes. Wow, said Melissa, seriously impressed. And after that, said Keith, if you blow your nose, your brain will... Well, let's just say you'll need a really big handkerchief. This is great, said Melissa, rummaging in her bag. I'm going to take notes. And then... If you... well, just don't go to the lavatory, that's all. Don't ask why. Just don't. It'll all be over in an hour, except for the oozing. Melissa was scribbling fast. Will they go runny? she said. Very, said Keith. Well, this is inhuman, screeched Ratcatcher too. No, it's very human, said Keith. It's extremely human. There isn't a beast in the world that'd do it to another living thing, but your poisons do it to rats every day. Now, tell me about the rats in the cages. Sweat was pouring down the deputy rat catcher's face. He's if he, too, were caught in a trap. See, rat catchers have always caught rats alive for the rat pits, he moaned. It's a perk. Nothing wrong with it. Always done it. So we had to keep up a supply. So we bred them. Had to. No harm in feeding them dead rats from the rat pits. Everyone knows rats eat rats, if you'll leave out the green wobbly bit, and then... Oh, there's a then, said Keith calmly. Ron said if we bred rats from the rats that survived the pit, you know, the ones that dodged the dogs, well, we'd end up with bigger, better rats, see? That's scientific, that is, said Ratcatcher One. What would be the point of that? said Melissa. Well, miss, we, Ron said, we thought, I thought, we thought that, well, it's not exactly cheating to put really tough rats in among the others, see, especially if the dog that's going in is a bit borderline. Where's the harm in that? Give us an edge, see, when it comes to betting. I thought, uh, he thought, you seem a bit confused about whose idea it was, said Keith. His, said the rat catchers together. Mine, said a voice in Morris's head. He almost fell off his perch. "'What does not kill us makes us strong,' said the voice of Spider. "'The strongest breed!' 
You mean, said Melissa, if they didn't have rat catchers here, they'd have fewer rats? She paused, head on one side. No, that's not right. Feel right. The sub told us those rats in those cages are mad, insane. I'd be too, Morris thought, with this horrible voice in my head every hour of the day. I'm going to throw up, said Ratcatcher One. I am. I'm going to. Don't, said Keith, watching Ratcatcher Two. You won't like it. Well, Mr. Deputy Ratcatcher, ask them what's in the other cellar, said Morris. He said it fast. He could feel the voice of Spider try to stop his mouth moving even as the sentence came out. What is in the other cellar, then? said Keith. Oh, just more stuff, old cages, stuff like that, said Ratcatcher Two. What else? said Morris. Only the... only the... Oh, that's where... The rat catcher's mouth opened and shut, his eyes bulged. Can't say, he said. Uh, there's nothing. Yes, that's it. There's nothing in there, just the old cages. Oh, and plague. Don't go in there, cause there's plague. That's why you shouldn't go in there, see? Cause of the plague. He's lying, said Melissa. No antidote for him. I had to do it, Ratcatcher Two moaned. You've got to do one to join the guild. That's a guild secret, Ratcatcher One snapped at him. We don't give away guild secrets. He stopped and clutched at his rumbling stomach. What was it you had to do? said Keith. Make a rat king, Ratcatcher Two burst out. A rat king, said Keith sharply. What's a rat king? I, 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 the man stuttered. Stop it! I, I, I don't want to. Tears ran down his face. Oi! I made a rat, a rat king. Aren't it still alive? said Melissa. Keith turned to her in amazement. You know about these things? he said. Of course. There's lots of stories about them. Rat kings are deadly evil. They antidote, antidote, please! moaned the rat catcher too. My stomach feels like there's rats running round in it. You made a rat king, said Melissa. Oh, dear. Well, we left the antidote in that little cellar you locked us up in. I should hurry if I was you. Both of the men staggered to their feet. Rat catcher one fell through the trapdoor. The other man landed on him, swearing, moaning, and, it had to be said, farting enormously. They made their way to the cellar. Dangerous Bean's candle was still alight. Beside it was a fat twist of paper. The door was slammed behind the men. There was the sound of a piece of wood being wedged under it. "'Oh, uh, we forgot to mention that there's only enough antidote for one person,' said Keith's voice, muffled through the wood. "'But I'm sure you can sort it out in a humane sort of way.' Dark Tan tried to get his breath back, but he thought he'd never get it at all. Even if he breathed in for a year, there was a ring of pain all around his back and chest. "'It's amazing,' said Nourishing. "'You were dead in the trap, and now you're alive.' "'Nourishing,' said Dark Tan, carefully. "'Yes, sir.' "'I'm very grateful,' said Dark Tan, still wheezing. "'But don't get silly. "'The spring was stretched and weak, and the teeth were rusted and blunt, that's all.' "'But there's teeth marks all round you.' No one's ever come out of a trap before, except the Mr. Squeakies, and they were made of rubber. Dark Tan licked his stomach. Nourishing had been right. He looked perforated. I was just lucky, he said. No rat has ever come alive out of a trap, Nourishing repeated. Did you see the big rat? Thou what? The big rat. Oh, that, said Dark Tan. He was going to add, No, I don't go in for that nonsense, but stopped. He could... Remember the light, and then the darkness ahead of him. It hadn't seemed bad. It almost felt sorry that nourishing had got him out. And the trap. All the pain had been a long way off, and there had been no more hard decisions. He settled for saying, Is ham and pork all right? Sort of. I mean, we can't see any wounds that won't heal. He's had worse. But, well, he was pretty old. Nearly three years. Was, said Darktan. Is. Pretty old, I mean, sir. Sardines sent me to find you, because we'll need you to help us get him back, but... She gave Dark Tan a doubtful look. It's all right. I'm sure it looks nastier than it is, said Dark Tan, wincing. 
Let's get up there, shall we? An old building full of handholds for a rat. No one noticed the two of them as they climbed up from manger to saddle harness to hay rack. Besides, no one was looking for them. Some of the other rats had taken the jacko route to freedom, and the dogs were going mad searching for them and fighting with one another. So were the men. Dark Tan knew a little bit about beer, since he had gone about his business under pubs and breweries, and the rats had often wondered why humans sometimes like to switch their brains off. To the rats, living in the centre of a web of sound and light and smells, it made no sense at all. To Dark Tan now it didn't sound quite so bad. The idea that for a while you could forget things and not have a head buzzing with troublesome thoughts, well, that seemed quite attractive. He couldn't remember a lot about life before he'd been changed, but he was certain that it hadn't seemed so complicated. Oh, bad things had happened, because life on the tip had been pretty hard. But when they were over, they were over, and tomorrow was a new day. Rats didn't think about tomorrow. There was just a faint sensation that more things would happen. It wasn't thinking, and there was no good and bad and right and wrong. They were new ideas. Ideas, that was their world now. Big questions and big answers about life and how you had to live it and what you were for. New ideas spilled into Dark Tan's weary head. And among the ideas, in the middle of his head, he saw the little figure of dangerous beans. Dark Tan had never talked much to the little white rat, or the little female that scurried around after him and drew pictures of the things he'd been thinking about. Dark liked people who were practical. But now, he thought, he's a trap hunter, just like me. He goes ahead of us and finds the dangerous ideas and thinks about them and traps them in words and makes them safe, and then he shows us the way through. We need him. We need him now. Otherwise we're all running around like rats in a barrel. Much later on, when nourishing was old and grey around the muzzle and smelled a bit strange, she dictated the story of the climb and how she heard Dark Tan muttering to himself. The Dark Tan that she'd pulled out of the trap, she said, was a different rat. It was as though his thoughts had slowed down but got bigger. The strangest bit, she said, was when they reached the beam. Dark Tan made sure that Hound Pork was all right, and then picked up the match he'd shown to Nourishing. He struck it on an old bit of iron, said Nourishing, and then he walked out along the beam with it flaring and down below I could see all the crowd and the hay racks and the straw all over the place and the people milling around just like, huh, just like rats. And I thought, if you drop that, mister, the place will fill woke in a few seconds and they've locked the doors and by the time they realise it they'll be caught like, <laughs> yeah, like rats in a barrel and we'll be away along the gutters. But he just stood there, looking down, until the match went out. Then he put it down and helped us with ham and pork, and never said a word about it. I asked him about it later on, after all the stuff with the piper and everything, and he said, Yes, rats in a barrel. And that what he said about it. What was it you really put in the sugar? said Keith, as he led the way back to the secret trap door. Cascara, said Melissa. That's not a poison, is it? No, it's a laxative. What's that? It makes you... Go. Go where? Not where, stupid. You just... Go. I don't particularly want to draw you a picture. Oh, you mean go. That's all right. And you just happen to have it on you? Yes, of course. It was in the big medicine bag. You mean you take something like that out just for something like this? Of course. It could easily be necessary. How? said Keith, climbing the ladder. Well, supposing we were kidnapped. Suppose we ended out right down near the sea. Supposing we were captured by pirates. Pirates have a very monotonous diet, which might be why they're so angry all the time. Or supposing we escaped and swam ashore and ended up on an island where there's nothing but coconuts. They have a very binding effect. Yes, but... but... Anything can happen. If you think like that, you'd end up taking just about everything in case of anything. Well, that's why it's such a big bag, said Melissa calmly, pulling herself through the trap door and dusting herself off. Keith sighed. 
How much did you give them? Lots. But they should be all right if they don't take too much of the antidote. What did you give them for the antidote? Cascara. Malicia, you are not a nice person. Really? You've wanted to poison them with real poison, and you were getting very imaginative, all that stuff about their stomachs melting. Yes, but rats are my friends. Some of the poisons really do that, and sort of making the antidote more of the poison. It's not a poison, it's a medicine. They'll feel lovely and clean afterwards. All right, all right. But giving it to them as the antidote as well, that's a bit... a bit... Clever? Narratively satisfying? said Malia. I suppose so. Melissa looked around. Where's your cat? I thought he was following us. Sometimes he just wanders off, and he's not my cat. Yes, you're his boy. But a young man with a smart cat can go a long way, you know. How? There was puss in boots, obviously, said Melissa. And, of course, everyone knows about Dick Livingstone and his wonderful cat, don't they? I don't, said Keith. It's a very famous story. Sorry, I haven't been able to read for very long. Really? Well, Dick Livingstone was a penniless boy who became Lord Mayor of Ubergurgle because his cat was so good at catching uh, pigeons. The town was overrun with... Pigeons, yes, and in fact later on he even married a sultan's daughter because his cat cleared all the pigeons out of her father's royal palace. It was rats, really, wasn't it? said Keith glumly. I'm sorry, yes. And it was just a story, said Keith. Never mind stories about mares. Are they really stories about rat kings? Rats have kings, I've never heard of it. How does it work? Not so they you think. They've been known about for years. They really do exist, you know, just like on the sign outside. What, the rats with their tails all knotted together? Had a... There was a loud and persistent knocking on the door. Some of it sounded as though it was being done with someone's boot. Melissa went over to it and pulled back the bolts. Yes, she said coldly, as the night air poured in. There was a group of angry men outside. The leader, who looked as though he was the leader only because he happened to be the one in front took a step back when he saw Melissa's angry stare. "'Oh, it's you, miss,' he said, suddenly embarrassed. "'Yes, my father's the mayor, you know,' said Melissa. "'Er, uh, yes, we all know.' "'Why are you all holding sticks?' said Melissa. "'Er, uh, we want to talk to the rat-catchers,' said the spokesman. He tried to look past her, and she stood aside. "'There's no one in here but us,' she said. "'Unless you think there's a trap door to a maze of underground cellars where desperate animals are caged up and vast supplies of stolen food are hoarded? The man gave her another nervous look. You aren't your stories, miss, he said. Has there been some trouble? said Melissa. We think they were a, a bit naughty, said the man. He blanched under the look she gave him. Yes, she said. They cheated us in the rat pit, said the man behind him made bold because there was someone else between him and Melissa. They must have trained those rats. One of them flew around on a string. And one of them bit my jackal on the, on, on the, on the unmentionables, said someone further back. You can't tell me it wasn't trained to do that. I saw one with a hat on this morning, said Melissa. There's been a good deal too many strange rats today, said another man. My mum said she saw one dancing on the kitchen shelves, and when my granddad got up and reached for his false teeth, he said a rat beat him with them. Beat him with his own teeth. What, wearing them? said Melissa. No, it just snapped them round in the air, and a lady down our street opened her pantry drawer, and there were rats swimming in the cream bowl. Not just swimming either. They'd been trained. They were making kind of patterns and diving and waving their legs in the air and stuff. You mean synchronized swimming? said Melissa. Who's telling stories now, eh? Are you sure you don't know where those men are? said the leader suspiciously. People said they headed this way. Melissa rolled her eyes. All right, yes, she said. They got here, and a talking cat helped us to feed some poison, and now they're locked in the cellar. The men looked at her. Yeah, right, 
said the leader, turning away. Well, if you do see them, tell them we are looking for them, OK? Melissa shut the door. It's terrible not being believed, she said. Keith bolted the door again. Tell me about Rat Kings, he said. Chapter 10 And as night fell, Mr. Bunsey remembered, There's something terrible in the dark wood. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure Why am I doing this? Morris asked himself as he squirmed along a pipe. Cats are not built for this stuff. Because we are a kind person at heart, said his conscience. No, I'm not, thought Morris. Actually, that's true, said his conscience. But we don't want to tell that dangerous beans, do you? The little wobbly nose. He thinks we're a hero. Well, I'm not, thought Morris. Then why are we scrabbling around underground to try and find him? Well, obviously, it's because he's the one with the big dream about finding the rat island. Without him, the rats won't cooperate, and I won't get paid, said Morris. We're a cat. What does a cat need money for? Because I have a retirement plan, thought Morris. I'm four years old already. Once I've made a pile, it's me for a nice home with a big fire and a nice old lady giving me cream every day. I've got it all worked out, every detail. Why should she give us a home? We're smelly, we've got ragged ears, we've got something nasty and itchy on our leg, we look like someone kicked us in the face. Why should an old lady take us in instead of a fluffy little kitten? Ah, but black cats are lucky, thought Morris. Really? Well, we don't want to be the first for the bad news, but we're not black. We're a sort of mucky tabby. There's such a thing as dyes, thought Morris. A couple of packets of black dye hold my breath for a minute, and it's hello, cream and fish for the rest of my life. Good plan, eh? And what about the luck, said the conscience. Ah, that's the clever bit. A black cat that brings in a gold coin every month or so, wouldn't you say that's a lucky cat to have? His conscience fell silent. Probably amazed at the cleverness of the plan, Morris told himself. He had to admit that he was cleverer at plans than at underground navigation. He wasn't exactly lost, because cats never got lost. He merely didn't know where everything else was. There wasn't a lot of earth under the town, that was certain. Cellars and gratings and pipeways and ancient sewers and crypts and bits of forgotten buildings formed a sort of honeycomb. Even humans could get around down here, Morris thought. The rat catchers certainly had. He could smell rats everywhere. He'd wondered about calling out to dangerous beans, but decided against it. Calling out might help him find out where the little rat was, but it'd also alert anyone else to where Morris was. Those big rats had been, well, big and nasty-looking. Now he was in a small square tunnel with lead pipes in it. There was even a hiss of escaping steam, and here and there warm water dipped into a gutter that ran along the bottom of the tunnel. Up ahead was a grating leading up to the street. Faint light came through it. The water in the gutter looked clean. At least you could see through it. Morris was thirsty. He leaned down, tongue out. There was a thin, bright red streak curling gently in the water. Ham and Pork seemed confused and half asleep, but he knew enough to hold on to Sardine's tail as the rats made their way back from the stables. It was a slow journey. Sardines didn't think the old rat would manage the washing lines. They skulked along gutters and along drains, hiding in nothing more than the cloak of night. A few rats were milling around in the cellar when they finally arrived. By then, Dark Tan and Sardines were walking on either side of Ham and Pork, who was barely moving his legs. There was still a candle burning in the cellar. Dark Tan was surprised, but a lot of things had happened in the last hour. They let Ham and Pork sink to the floor where he lay, breathing heavily. His body shook with each breath. Poison, Gov? whispered Sardines. No, oh, I think it was just all too much for him, said Dark Tan. Just too much. Ham and Pork opened one eye. Am I still the leader? he said. Yes, sir, said Dark Tan. I need to sleep. Dark Tan looked around the circle. Rats were creeping towards the group. He could see them whispering to one another. They kept staring at him. He tried to spot the pale shape of dangerous beans. Norashin tells me 
"'You saw the tunnel of the big rat,' said Hammond Pork. Dark Tan glared at Nourishing, who looked embarrassed. "'I saw something, yes,' he said. "'Then I shall dream my way there and never wake up,' said Hammond Pork. His head sagged again. "'This isn't the way a, an old rat should die,' he mumbled. "'Not like this. Not in the light.' Dark Tan nodded urgently at Sardines, who snuffed out the candle with his hat. The damp, thick, underground darkness closed in. "'Dark Tan,' Hammond Pork whispered, "'you need to know this.' Sardines strained his ears to hear the old leader's last words to Dark Tan. Then a few seconds later he shivered. He could smell the change in the world. There was movement in the darkness. A match burst into life, and the candle flame grew again, bringing shadows back into the world. Hammond Pork was lying very still. "'Do we have to eat him now?' said someone. "'He's gone,' said Dark Tan. Somehow the idea of eating Hammond Pork didn't feel right. "'Bury him,' he said, "'and mark the place so we know he's there.' There was a sense of relief in the group. However much anyone might have respected Hammond Pork, he was still a little bit on the whiffy side, even for a rat. But a rat at the front of the crowd looked uncertain. "'Er, uh, when you say, mark the place,' it said, "'do you mean, like, we mark other places where we bury things?' "'He means by whittling on it,' said the rat beside him. Dark Tan looked at Sardines, who shrugged. Dark Tan had a sinking feeling inside. When you were the leader, everyone waited to see what you said, and there was still no sign of the white rat. He was on his own. He thought hard for a moment, and then nodded. Yes, he said at last. He'd like that. It's very ratty. But do this, too. Draw it in the dirt above him. He scraped a sign on the ground. It was a simple drawing of a rat, but with outlines of other rats just visible behind it, getting smaller into the distance. And a little drawing of a rat in the big rat's head, where its brain would be. "'He was a rat from a long line of rats, and he thought about rats,' said Sardines. "'Good one, boss.' "'Will he come back like Dark Tan did?' said someone else. "'If he does, he'll get really mad if we've eaten him,' said a voice. There was some nervous laughter. "'Listen, I didn't,' Dark Tan began, but Sardines nudged him. "'Word in your ear, Gov,' he said, raising his charred hat politely. "'Yeah, yeah,' Dark Tan was getting nervous. He'd never had so many rats watching him so closely. He followed Sardines away from the group, which was too nervous to follow them. "'You know how I used to hang around in the theatre and that?' said Sardines, quietly. "'And you pick up stuff in the theatre. And the thing is, look, what I'm saying is, you're the leader, right? So you've got to act like you know what you're doing, OK? If the leader doesn't know what he's doing, no one else does either.' "'I only know what I'm doing when I'm dismantling traps,' said Dark Tan. "'All right. Think of the future as a great big trap,' said Sardines. "'With no cheese. That is not a lot of help.' "'And you should let them think what they like about you and that scar you've got,' said Sardines. "'That's my advice, Gov.' "'But I didn't die, Sardines.' "'Are you sure?' "'Huh? Something happened, didn't it? "'You were going to set fire to the place with all the humans in it, "'and you decided not to. I watched you. "'Something happened to you in the trap. "'Don't ask me what it was. I just do tap dancing. "'I'm just a little rat. Always will be, boss.' "'But there's big rats like Inbrine and Selby and a bunch of others, boss, "'and now Hammond Pork's dead, and they might think they should be the leader. "'Get my drift? "'Now?' Sardine sighed. "'I reckon you do, boss. "'Do we want a lot of scrapping amongst ourselves at a time like this? "'Now?' "'Right. Well, thanks to chatty little nourishing, "'you're the rat that looked the big rat right in the face and came back, aren't you?' "'Yeah, but she... "'Seems to me, boss, that anyone who could stare down the bone rat... "'Well, no one is going to want to mess with him, am I right? "'A man who wears the teeth marks of the bone rat like a belt? "'Huh? Huh? No. People will follow a rat like that. "'Time like this, people need someone to follow. "'That was a good thing you did back there with old Hammond Pork. 
burying him and whittling on top and putting a sign on him. Well, the old rats like that, and so do the young ones. Shows them you're thinking for everyone. Sardines put his head on one side and grinned a worried grin. I can see I'm going to have to watch you, Sardines, said Dark Tan. You think like Morris. Don't worry about me, boss. I'm small. I got a dance. I wouldn't be any good at leathering. Thinking for everyone, Dark Tan thought, like the white rat. Where is Dangerous Beans? he said, looking around. Isn't he here? Haven't seen him, boss. What? We need him. He's got the map in his head. Map, boss? Sardines looked concerned. I thought you drew maps in the mud. Not a map like a picture of tunnels and traps, Sardines. A map of... of what we are and where we're going. Oh, you mean like that lovely island? Never really believed in it, boss. I don't know about any islands, said Dark Tan, but when I was in that place, I saw the shape of an idea. There's been a war between humans and rats forever. It's got to end. And here, now, in this place with these rats, I can see that it can. This might be the only time and the only place where it can. I can see the shape of an idea in my head, but I can't think of the words for it. Do you understand? So, we need the white rat, because he knows the map for thinking. We've got to think our way out of this. Running around and squeaking won't work any more. You're doing fine so far, boss, said the dancer, patting him on the shoulder. It's all going wrong, said Dark Tan, trying to keep his voice down. We need him. I need him. I'll get some squads together, boss, if you show me where to start looking, said Sardines meekly. In the drains, not far from the cages, said Dark Tan. Morris was with him, he added. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, Gov? said Sardines. You know what Hammond Pork always said? You can always trust a cat to be a cat. Yeah, I know. I wish I knew the answer to that, Sardines. Sardines stepped closer. Can I ask a question, Gov? Of course. What was it Ham and Pork whispered to you just before he died? Special leader wisdom, was it? Good advice, said Dark Tan. Good advice. Morris blinked. Very slowly his tongue wound itself back in. He flattened his ears, and legs moving in silent, slow motion, crept along beside the gutter. Right under the grating there was something pale. The red streak was coming from further upstream, and divided in two as it flowed around the thing before becoming one swirling thread again. Morris reached it. It was a rolled-up scrap of paper, sodden with water and stained with red. He extended a claw and fished it out. It flopped on the side of the gutter, and as Morris gently peeled the paper apart, he saw the smudged pictures drawn in thick pencil. He knew what they were. He learned them one day when he had nothing better to do. They were stupidly simple. No rat shall, he began. Then there was a damp mess down to the bit that read, We are not like other rats. Oh, no, he said. They wouldn't drop this, would they? Not the rules. Peaches carried it around as though it was a hugely precious thing. Will I find them first? said an alien voice in Morris's head. Or oh, perhaps I have... Morris ran, skidding on the slimy stone as the tunnel turned a corner. What strange things they are, cat! Rats that think they are not rats! Shall I be like you? Shall I act like a cat? Shall I keep one of them alive for a while? Morris yowled under his breath. Other smaller tunnels branched off on either side, but the thin red streak led straight on, and there, under another grating, the shape lay in the water, the red leaking gently from it. Morris sagged. He'd been expecting... what? But this... this was... this was worse, in a way. Worse than anything. Soaked in water leaking the red ink from Ratty Rupert the Rat's red waistcoat, was Mr. Bunsey has an adventure. Morris hooked it out on claw tip, and the cheap paper pages fell out one by one and drifted away in the water. 
they dropped it. Had they been running? Or had they thrown it away? What was it Dangerous Beans had said, when nothing but rats? And he'd said it in such a sad, hollow voice. Where are they now, Cat? Can you find them? Which way now? It can see what I see, he thought. It can't read my mind, but it can see what I see, and hear what I hear, and it's good at working out what I must be thinking. It sees what I see. Once again he shut his eyes. In the dark, cat, how will you fight my rats? The ones behind you! Morris spun around, eyes wide. There were rats there, dozens of them, some of them nearly half the size of Morris. They watched him, all with the same blank expression. Well done! Well done! Cat! You see the squeaky creatures, and yet you don't leap! How did a cat learn not to be a cat? The rats, as one rat, moved forward. They rustled as they moved. Morris took a step backwards. Imagine it, cat, said the voice of Spider. Imagine a million clever rats. Rats that don't run. Rats that fight. Rats that share. One mind, one vision, mine. Where are you? said Morris aloud. You will see me soon. Keep going, pussy cat. You have to keep going. One word from me, one mere flicker of a thought, and the rats you see will take you down. Oh, you might kill one or two, but there are always more rats. Always more rats. Morris turned and edged forward. The rats followed. He spun around. They stopped. He turned again, took a couple of steps and looked behind him. The rats followed as if they were on string. There was a familiar smell in the air here of old, stale water. He was somewhere near the flooded cellar, but how close? The stuff stunk worse than tinned cat food. It could be in any direction. He could probably outrun the rats over a short distance. Bloodthirsty rats right behind you can give you wings. "'Are you planning to run to help the white rat?' said his conscience. "'Or are you thinking of making a dash for the daylight?' Morris had to admit that the daylight had never seemed a better idea. There was no point in lying to himself. After all, rats didn't live very long in any case, even if they had wobbly noses. "'They are close, cat. Shall we play a game? Cats like playing. Did you play with additives?' Before you bit his head off! Morris stopped dead. A rat actually bumped into his back legs. You are going to die, he said softly. They are getting closer to me, Morris. So close now. Shall I tell you that the stupid looking kid and the silly sounding girl are going to die? Do you know that rats can eat a human alive? Melissa bolted the shed door. Rat kings are deeply mysterious, she said. A rat king is a group of rats with their tails tied together. How? Well, the stories say it just happens. How does it happen? I read somewhere that their tails become stuck together when they're in the nest because of all the muck and then get twisted up as uh, rats generally have six or seven babies and they have quite short tails and the parents keep the nests quite clean, said Keith. Have the people who tell these stories ever seen rats? I don't know. Maybe the rats just get crowded together and their tails get twisted up? There's a preserved rat king in a big jar of alcohol in the town museum. A dead one. Or very, very drunk. What do you think? said Melissa. It's ten rats, like a sort of star, with a big knot of tail in the middle. Lots of others have been found too. One had thirty-two rats, 
there's folklore about them. But that rat catcher said he made one, said Keith firmly. He said he did it to get into the guild. Do you know what a masterpiece is? Of course, it's anything really good. I mean, a real masterpiece, said Keith. I grew up in a big city with guilds everywhere. That's how I know. A masterpiece is something that an apprentice makes at the end of his training to show the senior members of the guild that he deserves to be a master, a full member. You understand? It might be a great symphony, or a beautiful piece of carving, or a batch of magnificent loaves. His masterpiece. Very interesting. So? So... What sort of master piece would you have to make to become a master rat catcher? To show that you could really control rats. Remember the sign over the door? Melissa frowned the frown of someone faced with an inconvenient fact. Anyone could tie a bunch of rat tails together if they wanted to, she said. I'm sure I could. While they're still alive... You'd have to trap them first, and then you've got slippery bits of string that are moving all the time, and the other end keeps on biting you. Eight of them, twenty of them, thirty-two, thirty-two angry rats. Melissa looked around at the untidy shed, trying out the idea. It works, she said. Yes, it makes almost as good a story. Probably there were one or two real rat kings. All right, all right, maybe just one. And people heard about this and decided that since there was all this interest, they'd try to make one. Yes, it's just like crop circles. No matter how many aliens own up to making them, there are always a few diehards who believe that humans go out with garden rollers in the middle of the night. I just think that some people like to be cruel, said Keith. How would a rat king hunt? They'd all pull in different directions. Ah, well, some of the stories about rat kings say that they can control other rats, said Melissa, with their minds, sort of. Get them to bring them food and go to different places and so on. You're right. Rat kings can't move around easily, so they learn how to see out of the eyes of other rats and hear what they hear. "'Just other rats,' said Keith. "'Well, one or two do say that they can do it to people,' said Melissa. "'How? Has it ever happened, really?' "'It couldn't, could it?' said Melissa. "'Yes!' "'Yes, what?' said Melissa. "'I didn't say anything. You just said yes,' said Keith. "'Silly little minds! Sooner or later there is always a way in.' The cat is much better at resisting. You will obey me. Let the rats go. I think we should let the rats go, said Melissa. It's just too cruel having them packed into those cages like that. I was just thinking that, said Keith. And forget about me. I am just a story. Personally, I think rat kings really are just a story said Melissa, walking over to the trap door and raising it. That rat catcher was a stupid little man. He was just babbling. I wonder if we really should let the rats out, Keith mused. They looked pretty hungry. They can't be worse than the rat catchers, can they? said Melissa. Anyway, Sir Piper will be here soon. He'd lead them all into the river or something. Into the river, muttered Keith. That's what he does, yes. Everyone knows that. Oh, yes. But rats can... Keith began. Obey me. Don't think. Follow the story. Rats can what? Rats can... Rats can... Keith stammered. I can't remember. Something about rats and rivers. Probably not important. Thick, deep darkness. And somewhere in it... A little voice. I dropped Mr. Bunsey, said Peaches. Good, said Dangerous Beans. It was just a lie. Lies drag us down. You said it was important. It was a lie. Endless, dripping darkness. And I've lost the rules, too. 
So, Dangerous Bean's voice was bitter, no one bothered with them. That's not true. People tried to, mostly, and they were sorry when they didn't. They were just another story, too, a story about rats who thought they weren't rats. Why are you talking like this? This isn't like you. You saw them run. They ran and squeaked and forgot how to talk. Underneath were just rats. Falkness. Yes, we are, said Peaches. But what are we on top? That's what you used to say. Come on, please. Let's go back. You're not well. It was all so clear to me, Dangerous Beans mumbled. Lie down. You're tired. I've got a few matches left. You know you always feel better when you see a light. Worried in her heart, and feeling lost and a long way from home, Peaches found a wall that was rough enough and dragged a match from her crude bag. The red head flared and crackled. She raised the match as high as she could. There were eyes everywhere. What's the worst part, she thought, her body rigid with fear, that I can see the eyes, or that I'm going to know they're still there when the match goes out? And I've only got two more matches, she mumbled to herself. The eyes withdrew into the shadows noiselessly. How can rats be so still and so silent, she thought. There's something wrong, said Dangerous Beans. Yes. There's something here, he said. I smelled it on that key key they found in the trap. It's a kind of terror. I can smell it on you. Yes, said Peaches. The match was burning fast. Can you see what we should do? said Dangerous Beans. Yes. The eyes in front were gone, but Peaches could still see them on either side. What can we do? said Dangerous Beans. Peaches swallowed. We could wish we had more matches, she said. And, in the darkness behind their eyes, a voice said, And so, in your despair, you come at last to me. Light has a smell. In the dark, damp cellars, the sharp sulphur stink of the match flew like a yellow bird, rising on draughts, plunging through cracks. It was a clean and bitter smell, and it cut through the dull underground reek like a knife. It filled the nostrils of sardines, who turned his head. Matches, boss, he said. Head that way, Dark Tan commanded. It's through the room of cages, boss, sardines warned. So... Remember what happened last time, boss? Dark Tan looked around at his squad. It wasn't everything he could have wished for. Rats were still trailing back from their hiding places, and some rats, good, sensible rats, had run into traps and poisons in the panic. But he'd picked the best he could. There were a few of the experienced older ones, like in brine and sardines, but most of them were young. Maybe that wasn't such a bad thing, he thought. It was older rats who'd panicked most. They hadn't been so used to thinking. OK, he said. Now, we don't know what we're going to do, he began, and caught sight of sardines. The rat was shaking his head slightly. Oh, yes, leaders weren't allowed not to know. He stared at the young worried faces, thought for a long moment, took a deep breath, and started again. There's something new down here, he said, and suddenly he knew what to say. The words came. Something that no one's ever seen before. Something tough. Something strong. The squad was almost cowering, except for Nourishing, who was staring at Dark Tan with shining eyes. Something fearful. Something new. Something sudden, said Dark Tan, leaning forward. And it's you. All of you. Rats with brains. Rats who can think. Rats who don't turn and run. Rats who aren't afraid of the dark, or fire, or noises, or traps, or poisons. Nothing can stop rats like you, right? He remembered something else. You read about the dark wood in the book? Well, we're in the dark wood now. Oh, yes. There's something else down here. Something terrible. It hides behind your fear. It thinks it can stop you, and it's wrong. We're going to find it, and drag it out, and we're going to make it wish we'd never been born. And if we die, well, and he saw them as one rat stare at the livid wound across his chest, death ain't so bad. Shall I tell you about the bone rat? Me and the bone rat, we've got a little understanding. 
He waits for those who break and run, who hide, who falter. But if you stare right into his eyes, he'll give you a nod and pass on. Now he could smell their excitement. In the world behind their eyes, they were the bravest rats there ever was. Now he had to lock that thought there. Without thinking, he touched the wound. It was healing badly, still leaking blood, and there was going to be a huge scar there forever. He brought his hand up, red with his own blood, and the idea came to him right out of his bones. He walked along the rows, touching each rat just above the eyes, leaving a red mark. And afterwards, he said quietly, people will say, they went there and they did it. They came back out of the dark wood, and this is how they know their own. He looked across their heads to sardines who raised his hat. That broke a spell. The rats started to breathe again, but something of the spell was still there, lodged in the gleam of an eye and the twitch of a tail. "'Ready to die for the clan, sardines!' Dark Tan shouted. "'No, boss! Ready to kill!' "'Good!' said Dark Tan. "'Let's go! We love the dark wood! It belongs to us!' The smell of light drifted along the tunnels and reached the face of Morris, who sniffed it up. Peaches! She was mad about light. It was more or less all dangerous beans could see. She always carried a few matches. Mad! Creatures that lived in darkness carrying matches. Well, obviously not mad when you thought about it, but even so. The rats behind were pushing him in that direction. I'm being played with, he thought. Batted from paw to paw so Spider can hear me squeak. He heard in his head the voice of Spider. And so in your despair you come at last to me. And heard with his ears, far off and faint, the voice of dangerous beans. Who are you? I am the big rat that lives underground. You are, really? I have thought a lot about you. There was a hole in the wall here, and beyond it the brilliance of a lighted match. Sensing the press of the rats behind him, Morris sidled through. There were big rats everywhere, on the floor, on boxes, clinging to the walls. And in the centre, a circle of lights from one half-burned match, held aloft by a trembling peaches. Dangerous Beans was standing a little in front of her, staring up at a stack of boxes and sacks. Peaches spun around. As she did so, the flame of the match blew wide and flared. The nearest rats jerked away as it did so, bending like a wave. Morris, she said. The cat will not move, said the voice of Spider. Morris tried to, and his paws wouldn't obey him. Be still, cat, or shall I command your lungs to stop? See, little rat, even a cat obeys me. Yes, command, obey, yes, I see you have a power, said Dangerous Beans, tiny in the circle of light. Clever rat, I have heard you talk to the others. You understand the truth. You know that by facing the dark we become strong. You know about the darkness in front of us and the darkness behind the eyes. You know that we cooperate or die. Will you cooperate? Cooperate? said Morris, his nose wrinkled. Like these other rats I smell here, they smell strong and stupid. But the strong survive, said the voice of Spider. They dodge the rat catchers and bite their way out of the cages. And like you, they are called to me. As for their minds, I can think for everyone. I, alas, am not strong, said Dangerous Beans carefully. You have an interesting mind. You too look forward to the domination of rats. Domination? said Dangerous Beans. Do I? You will have worked out that there is a race in this world which steals and kills and spreads disease and despoils what it cannot use, said the voice of Spider. Yes, said Dangerous Beans. That's easy. It's called humanity. Well done. See my fine rats. In a few hours the silly piper will come and play his silly pipe. And yes, 
My rats will scamper after him out of the town. Do you know how a piper kills rats? No. He leads them to the river. Where are you listening? Where they all drown. But rats are good swimmers, said Dangerous Beans. Yes. Never trust a rat catcher. They will leave themselves work for tomorrow. But humans like to believe stories. They would prefer to believe stories rather than the truth. But we, we are rats. And my rats will swim, believe me. Big rats. Different rats. Rats who survive. Rats with part of my mind in them. And they will spread from town to town, and then there will be destruction such as people cannot imagine. We will pay them back a thousandfold for every trap. Humans have tortured and poisoned and killed, and all of that is now given form in me, and there will be revenge. Given form in you, yes, I think I begin to understand, said Dangerous Beans. There was a crackle and flare behind him. Peaches had lit the second match from the dying, flickering flame of the first one. The ring of rats, which had been creeping closer, swayed back again. Two more matches, said Spider. And then, one way or another, little rat, you belong to me. I want to see who I am talking to, said Dangerous Beans firmly. You are blind, little white rat. Through your pink eyes I see only mist. They see more than you think, said Dangerous Beans. And if you are, as you say, the big rat, then show yourself to me. Smelling is believing. There was a scrabbling, and Spider came out of the shadows. It looked to Morris like a bundle of rats. Rats! scampering across the boxes, but flowing, as if all the legs were being operated by one creature. As it crawled into the light, over the top of a sack, Morris saw that the tails were twisted together in one huge, ugly knot. And each rat was blind. As the voice of Spider thundered in his head, the eight rats reared and tugged at the knot. "'Then tell me the truth, white rat. Do you see me?' Come closer. Yes, you see me in your mist. You see me. Men made me for sport. Tie the rat's tails together and watch them struggle. But I did not struggle. Together we are strong. One mind is as strong as one mind, and two minds are as strong as two minds. But three minds are four minds, and four minds are eight minds. And eight minds are one. One mind stronger than eight. My time is near. The stupid men let rats fight, and the strong survive, and then they fight, and the strongest of the strong survive, and soon the cages will open, and men shall know the meaning of the word plague. See the stupid cat? It wants to leap, but I hold it so easily. No mind can withstand me. Get you? You are interesting. You have a mind like mine that thinks for many rats, not just one rat. We want the same things. We have plans. We want the triumph of rats. Join us. Together we will be strong. There was a long pause. It was, Morris thought. Too long. And then... Yes, your offer is interesting, said Dangerous Beans. There was a gasp from Peaches. And Dangerous Beans went on in a small voice. The world is big and dangerous indeed. And we are weak, and I am tired. Together we can be strong. Indeed. But what of those who aren't strong, please? The weak are food. That is how it has always been. 
Ah, said Dangerous Beans. How it has always been. Things are becoming clearer. Don't listen to it, Peaches hissed. It's affecting your mind. No, my mind is working perfectly, thank you, said Dangerous Beans, still in the same calm voice. Yes, the proposition is beguiling. And we would rule the rat world together, would we? We would cooperate. And Morris, on the sidelines, thought, Yeah, right. You cooperate. They rule. Surely you can't fall for this. But Dangerous Beans said, Cooperate, yes. And together we could give the humans a war they won't believe. Of course, millions of rats would die. They die anyway. Mm, yes, 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 that is true. And this rat here, said Dangerous Beans, suddenly waving a paw towards one of the big rats that was hypnotized by the flame. Can you tell me what she thinks about this? Spider sounded taken aback. Thinks? Why should it think anything? It is a rat. Ah, said Dangerous Beans. How clear it is now. But it would not work. Would not work? Dangerous Beans raised his head. Because, you see, you just think for many rats, he said. But you don't think of them. Nor are you, for all that you say, the big rat. Every word you utter is a lie. If there is a big rat, and I hope there is, it would not talk of war and death. It would be made of the best we could be, not the worst that we are. No, I will not join you, liar in the dark. I prefer our way. We are silly and weak sometimes, but together we are strong. You have plans for rats, while well, I have dreams for them. Spider reared up, quivering. The voice raged in Morris's mind. Oh, so you think you are a good rat. But a good rat is one that steals most. You think a good rat is a rat in a waistcoat? A little human with fur? Oh, yes, I know about the stupid, stupid book. Traitor. Traitor to rats. Will you feel my pain? Morris did. It was like a blast of red-hot air, leaving his head full of steam. He recognized the sensation. It was how he used to feel before he was changed. It was how he used to feel before he was Morris. He'd just been a cat, a bright cat, but nothing more than a cat. You defy me! Spider screamed at the bowed form of Dangerous Beans, when I am everything that truly is rat. I am filth and darkness. I am the noise and the floor, the rustling in the walls. I am the thing that undermines and despoils. I am the sum of all that you deny. I am your true self. Will you obey me? Never said Dangerous Beans. You are nothing but shadows. Feel my pain. Morris was more than a cat, he knew. He knew the world was big and complex and involved a lot more than wondering if the next meal was going to be beetles or chicken legs. The world was huge and difficult and full of amazing things and... The red-hot flame of that horrible voice was boiling his mind away. The memories were unwinding and whirling into the darkness. All the other little voices, not the horrible voice, but the Morris voices, the ones that nagged at him and argued amongst themselves and told him he was doing wrong or could be better, were getting fainter. And still Dangerous Bean stood there, small and wobbly, staring up into the dark. Yes, said Dangerous Beans, I feel the pain. You are nothing but a rat, a little rat, and I am the very soul of ratdom. Admit it, little blind rat, little blind pet rat. Dangerous beans swayed, and Morris heard him say, I am not so blind that I can't see darkness. Morris sniffed and realized that Dangerous Beans was whittling himself in terror. But the little rat didn't move, even so. Oh, yes, whispered the voice of Spider. And you can control the dark, yes? You told a little rat that. 
You can learn to control the dark. I am a rat, whispered Dangerous Beans, but I am not vermin. Vermin! Once we were just another squeaking thing in the forest, and then humans built barns and pantries full of food. Of course, we took what we could, and so they called us vermin, and they have trapped us and covered us in poison, and somehow, out of that wretchedness, you have come. But you are no answer. You are just another bad thing humans made. You offer rats nothing except more pain. You just have a power that lets you enter people's minds when they are tired or stupid or upset, and you are in mine now. Yes, oh, yes. And still I stand here, said Dangerous Beans. Now that I have smelled you, I know you. You have the smell of the bone rat about you. Even though my body is shaking, I can keep a place free from you. I can feel you running around in my head, you see. But all the doors are closed to you now. I can control the shadows inside, which is where all darkness is. I am more than just a rat. If I am not more than a rat, I am nothing at all. The many heads of spider turned this way and that. There wasn't much left of Morris's mind to do any thinking now, but it looked as though the rat king was trying to reach a conclusion. Its reply came in a roar. Then be nothing! Keith blinked. He had his hand on the latch of one of the rat cages. The rats were watching him, all standing the same way, all watching his fingers, hundreds of rats. They looked hungry. Did you hear something? said Melissa. Keith lowered his hand very carefully and took a couple of steps back. Why are we letting these out? he said. It was like I'd been dreaming. I don't know yours are that boy. But we agreed to let them out. I... it was... I had a feeling that... Rat kings can talk to people, can't they? said Keith. Has it been talking to us? But this is real life, said Melissa. I thought it was an adventure, said Keith. Damn, I forgot, said Melissa. What are they doing? It was almost as if the rats were melting. They were no longer upright, attentive statues. Something like panic was spreading through them again. Then other rats poured out of the walls, running madly across the floor. They were much bigger than the caged ones. One of them bit Keith on the ankle, and he kicked it away. "'Try to stamp on them, but don't lose your balance, whatever you do,' he said. "'These are not friendly.' "'Try it on them?' said Melissa. "'Yuck!' "'You mean you haven't got anything in your bag to fight rats? "'This is a rat-catcher's lair. "'You've got plenty of stuff for pirates and bandits and robbers.' "'Yes, but there's never been a book about having an adventure in a rat-catcher's hut.' Melissa shouted. Ow! One's on my neck! One's on my neck! One says another one! She bent down frantically to shake the rats loose and reared up as one leapt at her face. Keith grabbed her hand. Don't fall over. They'll go mad if you do. Try to get to the door. They're so fast! Melissa panted. No, there's another one on my hair! Hold still, stupid female, said a voice in her ear. Hold quite still or I'll gnaw you. There was a scrabble of claws, a swish, and a rat dropped past her eyes. Then another rat thumped onto her shoulder and slid away. Right, said the voice at the back of her neck. Now don't move, don't tread on anyone, and keep out of the way. What was that? she hissed, as she felt something slide down her skirt. I think it was the one they called Big Savings, said Keith. Here comes the clan. More rats were pouring into the room, but these moved differently. They stayed together and spread out into a line that moved forward slowly. When an enemy rat attacked it, the line would close up over it quickly, like a fist, and when it opened again, the rat was dead. Only when the surviving rats smelled the terror of their fellows and tried to escape from the room did the attacking line break, becoming pairs of rats that, with terrible purpose, hunted down one scurrying enemy after another and brought them down with a bite. And then, seconds after it started, the war was over. The squeaking of a few lucky refugees faded in the walls. There was a ragged cheer from the clan rats, the cheer which says, I'm still alive, after all that. Dark Tan, said Keith, what happened to you? Dark Tan reared up and pointed a paw to the door at the other end of the cellar. If you want to help, open that door, he shouted. Move it. Then he darted into a drain with the rest of the squad pouring in after him. One of them tap-danced as he went. Chapter 11 
and there he found Mr. Bunsey, tangled in the brambles, and his blue coat all torn. From Mr. Bunsey has an adventure. The Rat King raged. The watching rats clutched at their heads. Peaches shrieked and stumbled back, the last flaring match flying out of her hand. But something of Morris survived that roar, that storm of thought. Some tiny part hid behind some brain cell and cowered as the rest of Morris was blown away. Thoughts peeled back and vanished in the gale. No more talking, no more wondering, no more seeing the world as something out there. Layers of his mind streamed past as the blast stripped away everything that he'd thought of as me, leaving only the brain of a cat. A clever cat, but still just a cat. Nothing but a cat, all the way back to the forest and the cave, the tusk and the claw. Just a cat. And you can always trust a cat to be a cat. The cat blinked. It was bewildered and angry. Its ears went flat. Its eyes flashed green. It couldn't think. It didn't think. It was instinct that moved it now, something that operated right down at the level of its roaring blood. It was a cat, and there was a twitching, squeaky thing, and what cats do to twitching, squeaking things is this. They leap. The Rat King fought back. Teeth snapped at the cat. It was tangled in fighting rats, and it yowled as it rolled across the floor. More rats poured in, rats that could kill a dog, but now, just for a few seconds, this cat could have brought down a wolf. It didn't notice the crackling flame as the dropped match set fire to some straw. It ignored the other rats breaking ranks and running. It paid no attention to the thickening smoke. What it wanted to do was kill things. Some dark river deep inside had been dammed up over the months. It had spent too much time helpless and fuming while little squeaky people ran around in front of it. It had longed to leap and bite and kill. It had longed to be a proper cat. And now the cat was out of the bag, and so much ancestral fight and spite and viciousness was flowing through Morris's veins that it sparked off his claws. And as the cat rolled and struggled and bit, a weak little voice right at the back of his tiny brain, cowering out of the way, the last tiny bit of him that was still Morris and not a blood-crazed maniac, said, "'Now, bite here!' Teeth and claws closed on a lump made of eight knotted tails and tore it apart. The tiny part of what had once been the me of Morris heard a thought shoot past. No! And then it died away, and the room was full of rats. Just rats. Nothing more than rats. Fighting to get out of the way of a furious, spitting, snarling, bloodthirsty cat, catching up on catsness. It clawed and bit and ripped and pounced and turned to see a small white rat that had not moved throughout the whole fight. It brought its claws down. Dangerous beans screamed, Morris! The door rattled and rattled again as Keith's boot hit the lock for the second time. On the third blow the wood split and burst apart. There was a wall of fire at the other end of the cellar. The flames were dark and evil, as much thick smoke as fire. The clan were scrambling in through the grating, and spreading out on either side, staring at the flames. "'Oh, no! Come on, there's buckets next door,' said Keith. "'But,' Melissa began, "'we've got to do it quickly. This is a big people job.' The flames hissed and popped. Everywhere, on fire or lying in the floor, beyond the flames were dead rats. Sometimes there were only bits of dead rats. "'What happened here?' said Dark Tan. "'Looks like a war, Gov,' said Sardine, sniffing the bodies. "'Can we get round it?' "'Too hot, boss. Sorry, but we... Isn't that Peaches?' She was sprawled close to the flames, mumbling to herself and covered in mud. Dark Tan crouched down. She opened her eyes blearily. "'Are you all right, Peaches? What happened to Dangerous Beans?' Sardines wordlessly tapped him on the shoulder and pointed. Coming through the fire, a shadow. It padded slowly between walls of flame. For a moment the waving air made it look huge, like some monster emerging from a cave, and then it became just a cat. Smoke poured off its fur. What wasn't smoking was caked with mud. One eye was shut. The cat was leaving a trail of blood, and every few footsteps it sagged a little. It had a small bundle of white fur in its mouth. It reached Dark Tan and continued past without a glance. It was growling all the time under its breath. "'Is that Morris?' said Sardines. 
That's dangerous beans he's carrying, shouted Dark Tan. Stop that cat! But Morris had stopped by himself, turned, lay down with his paws in front of him, and looked blearily at the rats. Then he gently dropped the bundle on the floor. He prodded it once or twice to see if it would move. He blinked slowly when it didn't move. He looked puzzled, in a kind of slow-motion way. He opened his mouth to yawn, and smoke came out. Then he put his head down and died. The world seemed to Morris to be full of the ghost light you got before dawn, when it was just bright enough to see things, but not bright enough to see colours. He sat up and washed himself. There were rats and humans running around very, very slowly. Somehow they didn't concern him much. Whatever it was they thought they had to be doing, they were doing it. Other people were rushing about in a silent, ghostly way, and Morris was not. This seemed a pretty good arrangement. And his eye didn't hurt, and his skin wasn't painful, and his paws weren't torn, which was a big improvement on matters as they stood recently. Now he came to think about it, he wasn't quite sure what had happened recently. Something wretchedly bad, obviously. There was something inside him, like a three-dimensional... He stared at it, and then turned when in this soundless ghost world he heard a noise. There was movement near the wall. A small figure was striding across the floor towards a small lump that was dangerous beans. It was rat-sized, but it was much more solid than the rest of the rats, and unlike any rat he'd seen before, it wore a black robe. A rat in clothes, he thought. But this one did not belong in a Mr. Bunsey book. Just poking out from the hood of the robe was the bony nose of a rat's skull and it was carrying a tiny scythe over its shoulder. The other rats and the humans, who were drifting back and forth with buckets, paid it no attention. Some of them walked right through it. The rat and Morris seemed to be in a separate world of their own. It's the bone rat, thought Morris. It's the grim squeaker. He's come for dangerous beans. After all I've been through, that is not happening. He sprang into the air and landed on the bone rat. The little scythe skidded across the floor. OK, mister, let's hear you talk, Morris began. Squeak! Er, uh, said Morris, as the horrible awareness of what he'd done caught up with him. A hand grabbed him by the back of the neck and lifted him up, higher and higher, and then turned him around. Morris stopped struggling immediately. He was being held by another figure, much taller human size, but with the same style of black robe, a much bigger scythe, and a definite lack of skin around the face. Strictly speaking, there was a considerable lack of face about the face, too. It was just bone. "'Desist from attacking my associate, Morris,' said Death. "'Yes, sir, Mr. Death, sir. At once, sir,' said Morris quickly. "'No problem, sir.' "'I haven't seen you lately, Morris.' "'No, sir.' said Morris, relaxing slightly. Been very careful, sir, looking both ways when I crossed the street and everything, sir. And how many do you have left now? Six, sir. Six. Six out of nine. Very definitely. Very definitely six lives, sir. Death looked surprised. But you were run over by a cart only last month, weren't you? That, sir, barely grazed me, sir. Got away with hardly a scratch, sir. Exactly. Oh, that makes five lives, Morris, up until today's adventure. Fair enough, sir, fair enough. Morris swallowed. Oh, well, might as well try. So let's say I am left with three, right? Three? I was only going to take one. You can't lose more than one life at a time, even if you're a cat. That leaves you four, Morris. And I say take two, sir, said Morris urgently. Two, and call it quits? Death and Morris looked down at the faint, shadowy outline of dangerous beans. Some other rats were standing around him now, picking him up. "'Are you sure?' said Death. "'After all, he is a rat.' "'Yes, sir. That's where it all gets complicated, sir.' "'You can't explain?' "'Yes, sir. Don't know why, sir. Maybe I just don't want to see it all wasted. Everything's been a bit odd lately, sir.' That is very uncat-like of you, Morris. I'm amazed. I'm pretty shocked, too, sir. I just hope no one finds out, sir. Death lowered Morris to the floor next to his body. You leave me little choice. The sum is correct, even though it is amazing. 
We came for two, and two we will take. The balance is preserved. Can I ask a question, sir? said Morris, as death turned to go. You may not get an answer. I suppose there isn't a big cat in the sky, is there? I'm surprised at you, Morris. Of course there are no cat gods. That would be too much like work. Morris nodded. One good thing about being a cat, apart from the extra lives, was that the theology was a lot simpler. I won't remember all this, will I, sir? he said. It'll be just too embarrassing. Of course not, Morris. Morris? Colours returned to the world, and Keith was stroking him. Every bit of Morris stung or ached. How could fur ache? And his paws screamed at him, and one eye felt like a lump of ice, and his lungs were full of fire. We thought you were dead, said Keith. Melissa was going to bury you at the bottom of her garden. She says she's already got a black veil. What, in her adventuring bag? Certainly, said Melissa. Supposing we'd ended up on a raft in a river full of flesh-eating— Yeah, yeah, right, thanks, growled Morris. The air stank of burnt wood and dirty steam. Are you all right? said Keith, still looking worried. You're a real black cat now. Ha, ha, yes, ha, ha, said Morris gloomily. He pushed himself up painfully. The little rat okay? he said, trying to look round. He was out, just like you, but when they tried to move him he coughed up a lot of muck. He's not well, but he's getting better. All's well that ends, Morris began and then winced. I can't turn my head very well, he said. You're covered in rat bites, that's why. What's my tail like? said Morris. Oh, fine. It's uh, nearly all there. Oh, well. All's well that ends well, then. Adventure over. Time for tea and buns, just like the girl says. No, said Keith. There's still the piper. Can't they just give him a dollar for his trouble and turn to go away? Not the rat piper, said Keith. You don't say that sort of thing to the rat piper. Nasty piece of work, is he? I don't know. He sounds like it. But we've got a plan. Morris growled. You've got a plan, he said. You made it up? Me and Dark Tan and Melissa. Tell me your wonderful plan, sighed Morris. We are going to keep the key keys caged up, and no rats will come out to follow the piper. That way he'll look pretty silly, eh? said Melissa. That's it? That's your plan? You don't think it'll work? said Keith. Melissa says he'll be so embarrassed he'll leave. You don't know anything about people, do you? sighed Morris. What? I'm a person, said Melissa. So? Cats know about people. We have to. No one else can open cupboards. Look, even the Rat King had a better plan than that. A good plan isn't one where someone wins. It's where nobody thinks they've lost. Understand? This is what you have to do. No, it wouldn't work. We need a lot of cotton wool. Melissa swung her bag around with a look of triumph. As a matter of fact, she said, I'd worked out that if I was ever taken prisoner in a giant underwater mechanical squid and needed to block up... You're going to say you've got a lot of cotton wool, haven't you? said Morris flatly. Yes! It was silly of me to worry, wasn't it? said Morris. Dark Tan stuck his sword in the mud. The senior rats gathered round him, but seniority had changed. Among the older rats were younger ones, each one with a dirty red mark on his head, and they were pushing to the front. All of them were chattering. He could smell the relief that came when the bone rat had gone past and had not turned aside. Silence! he yelled. It struck like a gong. Every red eye turned to him. He felt tired, he couldn't breathe properly, and he was streaked with soot and blood. Some of the blood wasn't his. It's not over, he said. But we just... It's not over! Dark Tan looked around the circle. We didn't get all of those big rats, the real fighters, he panted. In brine, take twenty rats and go back and help guard the nests. Big savings and the old females are back there, and they'll tear any attacker in half, but I want to be certain. For a moment, Inbrine glared at Dark Tan. I don't see why you, he began, do it! Inbrine crouched hurriedly, waved at the rats behind him, and scudded away. Dark Tan looked at the others. As his gaze passed across them, some of them leaned back, as if it was a flame. We'll form into squads, he said. All of the clan that we can spare from guarding will form into squads. At least one trap disposal rat in each squad. 
take fire with you. And some of the younger rats will be runners, so you can keep in touch. Don't go near the cages, those poor creatures can wait. But you'll work through all these tunnels, all these tunnels, and these holes, and all these corners. And if you meet a strange rat and it cowers, then take it prisoner. Drag it to the cages. But if it tries to fight, and the big ones will try to fight, because that's all they know, then you will kill it. Burn it or bite it. Kill it dead. Do you hear me? There was a murmur of agreement. I said, do you hear me? This time there was a roar. Good. And we'll go on and on until these tunnels are safe from end to end. Then we'll do it again, until these tunnels are ours. Because... Dark Tan grasped his sword, but leaned on it for a moment to catch his breath. And when he spoke next, it was almost in a whisper. Because we're in the heart of the dark wood now, and we've found the dark wood in our hearts. And, for tonight, we are something terrible. He took another breath, and his next words were heard only by the rats closest to him. And we have nowhere else to go. It was dawn. Sergeant Doppelpunkt, who was one half of the city's official watch, and the largest half, awoke with a snort in the tiny office by the main gates. He got dressed a little unsteadily, and washed his face in the stone sink, peering at himself in the scrap of mirror hanging on the wall. He stopped. There was a faint but desperate squeaking sound, and then the little grill over the plug hole was pushed aside, and a rat plunged out. It was big and grey, and it ran up his arm before leaping onto the floor. Water dripping from his face, Sergeant Doppelpunkt watched as three smaller rats erupted from the pipe and chased after it. It turned to fight in the middle of the floor, but the small rats hit it together from three sides at once. There was a brief struggle, a screech, and then the big rat was dead. There was an old rat hole in the wall. Two of the rats grabbed the tail and dragged the body into the hole and out of sight. But the third rat stopped at the hole and turned, standing up on its hind legs. The sergeant felt... It was staring at him. It didn't look like an animal watching a human to see if it was dangerous. The rats didn't look scared, merely curious. It had some kind of red blob on its head, the sergeant noticed. Then it saluted him. It was definitely a salute, even though it only took a second. Then all the rats had gone. The sergeant stared at the hole for some time, and then he heard the singing. It was drifting up from the sink's plug hole, and it echoed a lot as if it was coming from a long way away. We fight dogs and we chase cats. Ain't no trap can stop the rats. Got no plague and got no fleas. We drink poison, we steal cheese. Mess with us and you will see. We'll put poison in your tea. Here we fight and here we'll stay. We will never go away. The sound faded. Sergeant Doppelpunkt blinked and looked at the bottle of beer he'd drunk last night. He thought it would probably be a good idea not to mention this to anyone. It probably hadn't happened. The guardhouse door opened, and Corporal Knopf stepped in. "'Morning, Sergeant,' he began. "'It's that. What's up with you?' "'Nothing, Corporal,' said Doppelpunkt quickly, wiping his face. "'I certainly haven't seen anything strange at all. Why are you standing around? Time to get those gates open, Corporal.' The watchman stepped out and swung open the city gates, and the sunlight streamed through. It brought with it a long, long shadow. Oh dear, thought Sergeant Doppelpunkt, this is not going to be a nice day. The man on horseback rode past them without a glance, and on into the town square. The guards hurried after him. People aren't supposed to ignore people with weapons. Out! What is your business here? demanded Corporal Knopf. But he had to run crabwise to keep up with the horse. The rider was dressed in white and black, like a magpie. He didn't answer, but just smiled faintly to himself. All right, maybe you haven't any actual business, but it won't cost you anything just to say who you are, will it? said Corporal Knopf, who was not interested in any trouble. The rider looked down at him and then stared ahead again. Sergeant Doppelpunkt spotted a small covered wagon coming through the gates, drawn by a donkey which was accompanied by an old man. He was a sergeant, he told himself, which meant that he was paid more than the corporal which meant that he thought more expensive thoughts. And this one was, they didn't have to check everyone that came through the gates, did they? Especially if they were busy. They had to pick people at random. And if you were going to pick people at random, it was a good idea to randomly pick a little old man looking small enough and old enough to be frightened of a rather grubby uniform with rusty chain mail. Halt! <laughs> Not gonna, 
said the old man. Mind a donkey can give you a nasty bite when he's roused. Not that I care. Are you trying to show contempt of the law? demanded Sergeant Doublepoint. Well, I'm not trying to conceal it, mister. You want to make something of it, you talk to my boss. That's him on the horse. The big horse. The black and white stranger had dismounted by the fountain in the centre of the square, and was opening his saddlebags. Oh, and talk to him, shall I? said the sergeant. By the time he'd reached the stranger, walking as slowly as he dared, the man had propped a small mirror against the fountain and was having a shave. Corporal Knopf was watching him. He'd been given the horse to hold. "'Why haven't you arrested him?' the sergeant whispered. "'What, for illegal shaving? Tell you what, sergeant, you do it.' Sergeant Doppelpunkt cleared his throat. A few early risers amongst the population were already watching him. "'Er, uh, no, listen, friend, I'm sure you didn't mean—' he began. The man straightened up, and gave the guards a look which made both men take a step backwards. He reached out and undid the thong holding the thick roll of leather behind the saddle. It unrolled. Corporal Knopf whistled. All down the length of leather, held in place by straps, were dozens of pipes. They glistened in the rising sun. "'Oh, you're the pipe!' the sergeant began, but the other man turned back to the mirror and said, as if talking to his reflection, "'Where can a man get a breakfast around here?' "'Oh, if it's breakfast you want, then Mrs. Shover adds the blue cabbage will... "'Sausages,' said the piper, still shaving. "'Burned on one side. Three. Here. Ten minutes. Where is the mare?' "'If you go down that street and take the first lift, fetch him.' "'Here. You can't,' the sergeant began. But Corporal Knopf grabbed his arm and pulled him away. "'He's a piper,' he hissed. "'You don't mess with the piper.' "'Don't you know about him? If he blows the right note on his pipes, your legs will fall off.' "'What, like the plague?' "'They say that in Pork Scratchens the council didn't pay him, and he played his special pipe, and led all the kids up into the mountains, and they was never seen again.' "'Good. Do you think he'd do that here? The place would be a lot crater. "'Ha! Did you ever hear about that place in Cratch? They hired him to get rid of a plague of my martists, and when they didn't pay up, he made all the town's watchmen dodge into the river and drown. No, did he? The devil, said Sergeant Doublepoint. Three hundred dollars he charges, did you know that? Three hundred dollars? We'd better get going, Sarge, said Corporal Knopf. You get the sausages, and I'll get some air. No, Knopf. You get the sausages, and I'll get the mare, cause the mare's free, and Mrs. Shover will want paying. The mare was already up when the sergeant arrived, and wandering around the house with a worried expression. He looked more worried when the sergeant arrived. What's she done this time? he said. Sir? said the watchman. Sir, like that, meant what are you talking about. Malicia hasn't been home all night, said the mare. So you think something might have happened to her, sir? No, I think she might have happened to someone, man. Remember last month, when she tracked down the mysterious headless horseman? Well, you must admit he was a horseman, sir. That is true, but he was also a short man with a very high collar. And he was the chief tax-gatherer from Mintz. I'm still getting official letters about it. Tax-gatherers do not, as a rule, like young ladies dropping on them out of trees. And then, in September, there was that business about the, 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 the mystery of smugglers' windmill, sir, said the sergeant, rolling his eyes, which turned out to be Mr. Vogel, the town clerk, and Mrs. Schumann, the shoemaker's wife, who happened to be there merely because of their shared interest in studying the habits of barn owls. And Mr. Vogel had his trousers off because he torn them on a nail, said the sergeant, not looking at the mare. "'Which Mrs. Schumann was very kindly repairing for him,' said the mayor, not looking at the sergeant. "'Bay moonlight,' said the sergeant. "'She happens to have very good eyesight,' snapped the mayor. "'And she didn't deserve to be bound and gagged along with Mr. Vogel, who caught quite a chill as a result. "'I had complaints from him and from her, and from Mrs. Vogel, and from Mr. Schumann, "'and from Mr. Vogel after Mr. Schumann went round to his house and hit him with a last— "'And from Mrs. Schumann, after Mrs. Vogel called her a—' "'A last what, sir?' said the sergeant. "'What?' "'Hit him with a last what?' 
The mayor stared at the sergeant's honest but puzzled expression. "'At last, men!' he said. "'It's a kind of wooden foot shoemakers yours when they're making shoes. Heaven knows what Malicia's doing this time.' I expect we'll find out when we hear the bang, sir. And what was it you wanted me for, Sergeant? Uh, the red papers here, sir. The mayor went pale. Already? He said. Yes, sir. He's having a shave in the fountain. Where's my official chain? said the mayor, staring around wildly. My official robe, my official hat. Quick, man, help me. He looks like quite a slow shaver, sir said the sergeant, following the mayor out of the room at a run. Over in Klotz, the mayor kept the pipe of waiting too long, and he played his pipe and turned him into a badger, said the mayor, flinging open a cupboard. Ah, here they are. Help me on, Wisdom Willow. When they arrived in the town square out of breath, the piper was sitting on a bench, surrounded at a safe distance by a very large crowd. He was examining half a sausage on the end of a fork. Corporal Knopf was standing next to him like a schoolboy who has turned in a nasty piece of work and is waiting to be told exactly how bad it is. And this is called, er, uh, the piper was saying. A sausage, sir, Corporal Knopf muttered. This is what you think is a sausage here, is it? There was a gasp from the crowd. Bart Blintz was very proud of its traditional vole and pork sausages. Yes, sir, said Corporal Knopf. Amazing, said the piper. He looked up at the mayor. And you are? I am the mayor of this town, and... The piper held up a hand, and then nodded towards the old man who was sitting on his cart, grinning broadly. My agent will deal with you, he said. He threw away the sausage, put his feet up on the other end of the bench, pulled his hat down over his eyes, and lay back. The mayor went red in the face. Sergeant Doppelpunkt leaned towards him. Remember the badger, sir, he whispered. Ah, yes. The mayor, with what little dignity he had left, walked over to the cart. I believe the fee for running the town of rats will be three hundred dollars, he said. Then I expect you'll believe anything, said the old man. He glanced at a footnote on his knee. Let's see, uh, call out fee plus special charge because it's St. Prodnitz's Day plus pipe tax. Looks like a medium-sized town, so that's extra wear and tear on car. Travelling costs at dollar a mile. Miscellaneous expenses, taxes, charges. He looked up. Tell you what, let's say one thousand dollars, okay? One thousand dollars? We haven't got one thousand dollars. That's outright. Badger, sir. Hissed Sergeant Doppelpunkt. You can't pay, said the old man. We don't have that kind of money. We've had to spend a lot of money bringing in food. You don't have any money, said the old man. Nothing like that amount, no. The old man scratched his chin. Hmm, he said. I can see where that's going to be a bit difficult because... Ooh, let's see. He scribbled in his notebook for a moment and then looked up. You already owe us $467.19 for call-out, travel and miscellaneous sundries. What? He hasn't blown a note. Ah, oh, but he's ready to, said the old man. We've come all this way. You can't pay. Bit what they call an imp arse, then. He's got to lead something out of town, you see. Otherwise the news will get round and no one will show him any respect. And if you haven't got respect, what have you got? If a piper doesn't have respect, he's rubbish, said a voice. I think he's rubbish. The piper raised the brim of his hat. The crowd in front of Keith parted in a hurry. Yeah, said the piper. I don't think he can pipe up even one rat, said Keith. He's just a fraud and a bully. Ha! I bet I can pipe up more rats than him. Some of the people in the crowd began to creep away. No one wanted to be around when the rat piper lost his temper. The piper swung his boots down onto the ground and pushed his hat back on his head. You're a rat piper, kid, he said softly. Keith stuck out his chin defiantly. Yes, and don't call me kid, old man. The piper grinned. Ah, he said, I knew I was going to like this place. And you can make a rat dance, can you, kid? More than you can, piper. Sounds like a challenge to me, said the piper. The piper doesn't accept challenges from... The old man on the cart began, but the rat piper waved him into silence. You know, kid, 
he said. This isn't the first time some kid has tried this. I'm walking down the street and someone yells, Go for your piccolo, mister. And I turn around, and it's always a kid like you with a stupid-looking face. Now, I don't want anyone to say I'm an unfair man, kid. So, if you just care to apologise, you might walk away from here with the same number of legs you started with. You're frightened! Melissa stepped out of the crowd. The piper grinned at her, and then stopped grinning. Melissa could do that to people. Yeah, he said. Yes, because everyone knows what happens at a time like this. Let me ask this stupid-looking kid, who I've never seen before, are you an orphan? Yes, said Keith. Do you know nothing about your background at all? No. Aha, said Melissa. That proves it. We all know what happens when a mysterious orphan turns up and challenges someone big and powerful, don't we? It's like being the third and youngest son of a king. He can't help but win. She looked triumphantly at the crowd. But the crowd looked doubtful. They hadn't read as many stories as Melissa, and were rather more attached to the experience of real life, which is that when someone small and righteous takes on someone big and nasty, he is grilled bread product very quickly. However, someone at the back shouted, Give the stupid-looking kid a chance! At least it'll be cheaper! And someone else shouted, Yeah, that's right! And someone else shouted, I agree with the other two! And no one seemed to notice that all the voices came from near ground level and were associated with the progress around the crowd of a scruffy-looking cat with half its fur missing. Instead, there was a general murmuring, no real words, nothing that would get anyone into trouble if the piper turned nasty, but a muttering, indicating, in a general sense, without wishing to cause umbrage, and seeing everyone's point of view, and taking one thing with another, and all things being equal, that people would like to see the boy given a chance, if it's all right with you, no offence meant. The piper shrugged. Fine, he said. It'll be something to talk about, and when I win, what will I get? The mayor coughed. Uh, is a daughter's hand in marriage usual in these circumstances? He said. She has very good teeth and would make a good uh, a wife for anyone with plenty of free wall space. Father, said Melissa. Uh, later on, uh, later on, obviously, he, he is unpleasant, but he is rich. No, I'll just take my payment, said the piper. One way or another. And I said we can't afford it, said the mayor. And I said, one way or the other, said the piper. And you, kid? Your rat pipe, said Keith. No, it's magic, kid. Then why are you scared to bet it? The piper narrowed his eyes. Scared? No. Okay, kid, the rat pipe, he said. And the town must let me solve its rat problem, said Keith. "'And how much will you charge?' said the mayor. Thirty gold pieces! Thirty gold pieces! Go on, say it!' shouted the voice at the back of the crowd. "'No, it won't cost you a thing,' said Keith. "'Idiot!' shouted the voice in the crowd. People looked around, puzzled. "'Nothing at all?' said the mayor. "'No, nothing. Uh, "'The hand in marriage thing is still an offer if you—' "'Fall, sir!' "'No, that only happens in stories,' said Keith. "'And I shall also bring back a lot of the food that the rats stole.' "'They ate it,' said the mayor. "'What are you going to do, stick your fingers down their throats?' "'I said that I'll solve your rat problem,' said Keith. "'Agreed, Mr. Mayor?' "'Well, if you're not charging—' "'But first I shall need to borrow a pipe,' Keith went on. "'You haven't got one?' said the mayor. "'It got broken.' Corporal Knopf nudged the mayor. "'I've got a trombone when I was in the army,' he said. "'It won't take a mo to nip and get it.' The rat piper burst out laughing. "'Doesn't that count?' said the mayor, as Corporal Knopf hurried off. "'What? A trombone for charming rats? No, no, let him try. Can't blame a kid for trying. Good with a trombone, are you?' "'I don't know,' said Keith. "'What do you mean, you don't know?' "'I mean I never played one. I'd be a lot happier with a flute, trumpet, piccolo, trombone, or lanka bagpipe, but I've seen people playing the trombone, and it doesn't look too difficult. It's only an overgrown trumpet, really. Huh, said the piper. This I'd like to see, but not here. The watchman came running back, rubbing a battered trombone with his sleeve, and therefore making it just a bit more grimy. Keith took it, wiped the mouthpiece, put it to his mouth, pressed the keys a few times, and then blew one long note. Seems to work, he said. I expect I can learn as I go along. He gave the rat piper a brief smile. Do you want to go first? 
"'You won't charm one rat with that mess, kid,' said the piper. "'But I'm glad I'm here to see you try.' Keith gave him a smile again, took a breath, and played. There was a tune there. The instrument squeaked and wheezed, because Corporal Knopf had occasionally used the thing as a hammer, but there was a tune quite fast, almost jaunting. You could tap your feet to it. Someone tapped their feet to it. Sardines emerged from a crack in a nearby wall, going, Hoin, two, three, four, under his breath. The crowds watched him dance ferociously across the cobbles until he disappeared into a drain. Then they broke into applause. The piper looked at Keith. "'Did that one have a hat on?' he said. "'I didn't notice,' said Keith. "'Your go.' The piper pulled a short length of pipe from inside his jacket. He took another length from his pocket and slotted it into place on the first piece. It went click in a military kind of way. Still watching Keith and still grinning, the piper took a mouthpiece from his top pocket and screwed it into the rest of the pipe with another very final click. Then he put it to his mouth and played. From her lookout on the roof... Big Savings shouted down a drain pipe, Now! Then she pushed two lumps of cotton wool in her ears. At the bottom of the pipe, In Brian shouted into a drain, No! And then he, too, snatched up his earplugs. Oh, ow, oh, ow! Oh. Echoed through the pipes. Now! shouted Dark Tan in the room of cages. He rammed some straw onto the end of the pipe. Everyone block their ears! They'd done their best with the cages. Melissa had brought blankets, and the rest had spent a feverish hour blocking up holes in mud. They'd done their best to feed the prisoners properly, too. Even though they were only kikis, it was heartbreaking to see them cower so desperately. Dark Tan turned to Nourishing. "'Got your ears blocked,' he said. "'Pardon?' "'Good.' Dark Tan picked up two lumps of cotton wool. "'The silly-sounding girl better be right about this stuff,' he said. "'I don't think many of us have got any strength left to dance.' The piper blew again, and then stared at his pipe. "'Just one rat,' said Keith, helpfully. "'Anywhere you like. No rush.' The piper glared at him and blew again. "'I can't hear anything,' said the mayor. "'Humans can't,' muttered the piper. "'Perhaps it's broken,' said Keith helpfully. The piper tried again. There was murmuring from the crowd. "'You've done something,' he hissed. "'Oh, yes,' said Melissa, loudly. "'What could he have done? Told the rats to stay underground with their ears blocked up?' The murmuring turned into muffled laughter. The piper tried one more time. Keith felt the hair stand up on the back of his neck. A rat emerged. It moved slowly across the cobbles, bouncing from side to side, until it reached the piper's feet, where it fell over and started making a whirring noise. People's mouths fell open. It was Mr. Clicky. The piper nudged it with his foot. The clockwork rat rolled over a few times, and then its spring, as a result of months of being punished in traps, gave up. There was a poing and a brief shower of cogwheels. The crowd burst out laughing. Hmm, said the piper. And this time the look he gave Keith was shaded with grudging admiration. Okay, kid, he said. Shall you and I have a little talk? Piper to piper, over by the fountain. Provided people can see us, said Keith. You don't trust me, kid. Of course not, the piper grinned. Good. You've got the makings of a piper, I can see that. Over by the fountain, he sat down with his booted legs in front of him, and held out the pipe. It was bronze, with a raised pattern of brass rats on it, and it glinted in the sunlight. Here, said the piper, take it. It's a good one. I've got plenty of others. Go on, take it. I'd like to hear you play it. Keith looked at it uncertainly, turning it over and over in his hands. It's all trickery, kid said the piper, as the pipe shone like a sunbeam. See the little slider there? Move it down, and the pipe plays a special note humans can't hear. Rats can. Send them nuts. They come rushing out of the ground, and you drive them into the river, just like a sheepdog. That's all there is to it, said Keith. You were expecting something more? Well, yes. They say you turn people into badgers, and lead children into magic caves, and... The piper leaned forward conspiratorially. It always pays to advertise, kid. Sometimes these little towns can be pretty slow when it comes to parting with the cash. Cause the thing about turning people into badgers and all the rest of that stuff is this. It never happens round here. Most of the people in these mountains never go more than ten miles away in their lives. They'll believe just about anything could happen fifty miles away. 
Once the story gets around, it does your work for you. Half the things people say I've done, even I didn't make up. Tell me, said Keith, have you ever met someone called Morris? 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 I don't think so. Amazing, said Keith. He took the pipe and gave the piper a long, slow stare. And now, piper, he said, I think you're going to lead the rats out of town. It's going to be the most impressive job you've ever done. Eh? What? You won, kid. You'll lead out the rats because that's how it should go, said Keith, polishing the pipe on his sleeve. Why do you charge us a lot? Because I give them a show, said the piper. The fancy clothes, the bullying, charging a lot is part of the whole thing. You've got to give them magic, kid. Let them think you're just a fancy rat catcher and you'll be lucky to get a cheese lunch and a warm handshake. We'll do it together, and the rats will follow us. Really follow us into the river. Don't bother about the trick note. This will be even better. It'll be... It'll be a great story, said Keith. And you'll get your money. Three hundred dollars, wasn't it? But you'll settle for half because I'm helping you. What are you playing at, kid? I told you, you won. Everyone wins, trust me. They called you in, they should pay the piper. Besides, Keith smiled, I don't want people to think pipers shouldn't get paid, do I? And I thought you were just a stupid-looking kid, said the piper. What kind of a deal have you got with the rats? You wouldn't believe it, piper. You wouldn't believe it. In Brian scurried through the tunnels, scrabbled through the mud and straw that had been used to block the last one, and jumped into the cage room. The clan rats unblocked their ears when they saw him. He's doing it, said Dark Tan. Yes, sir, right now. Dark Tan looked up at the cages. The key keys were more subdued now that the Rat King was dead and they'd been fed. But by the smell of it, they were desperate to leave this place, and rats in a panic will follow other rats. OK, he said. Runners, get ready. Open the cages. Make sure they're following you. Go, go, go. And that was almost the end of the story. How the crowd yelled when rats erupted from every hole and drain! How they cheered when both pipers danced out of the town with the rats racing along behind them! How they whistled when the rats plunged off the bridge into the river! They didn't notice that some rats stayed on the bridge, urging the others along with shouts of, Remember, strong regular strokes, and there's a nice beach just downstream, and hit the water feet first, it won't hurt so much. Even if they had noticed, they probably wouldn't have said anything. Details like that don't fit in and the big piper danced off over the hills and never, ever came back. There was general applause. It had been a good show, everyone agreed, even if it had been expensive. It was definitely something to tell the children. The stupid-looking kid, the one that had dueled with the piper, strolled back into the square. He got a round of applause too. It was turning out to be a good day all round. People wondered if they'd have to have extra children to make room for all the stories but they realised they'd have enough to say for the grandchildren when the other rats arrived. They were suddenly there, pouring up out of the drains and gutters and cracks. They didn't squeak, and they weren't running. They sat there, watching everyone. "'You piper!' shouted the mayor. "'You missed some!' "'No, we're not the rats who follow pipers,' said a voice. "'We're the rats you have to deal with.' The mayor looked down. A rat was standing by his boots, looking up at him. It appeared to be holding a sword. Father said Melissa, suddenly behind him. It would be a good idea to listen to this rat. But it's a rat! He knows, father. And he knows how to get your money back, and a lot of the food, and where to find some of the people who've been stealing food from you. But he's a rat! Yes, father, but if you talk to him properly, he can help us. The mayor stared at the assembled ranks of the clan. We should talk to rats, he said. It would be a very good idea, father. But they're rats! The mayor seemed to be trying to hold on to this thought, as if it was a life belt on a stormy sea, and he'd drown if he let go of it. Excuse me, excuse me, said a voice from beside him. He looked down this time at a dirty, half-scorched cat, which grinned at him. Did that cat just speak? said the mayor. Morris looked around. Which one? he said. You! Did you just talk? "'Would you feel better if I said no?' said Morris. "'But cats can't talk!' 
Well, I can't promise that I could give you a, you know, full-length after-dinner speech, and don't ask me to do a comic monologue, said Morris, and I can't pronounce difficult words like marmalade and lumbago, but I'm pretty happy with basic repartee and simple wholesome conversation. Speaking as a cat, I'd like to hear what the rat says. Uh, Mr. Mayor, said Keith, strolling up and twirling the new rat pipe in his fingers, don't you think it's time I sorted out your rat problem once and for all? Sort it out, but all you have to do is talk to them. Get your town council together and talk to them. It's up to you, Mr. Mayor. You can yell and shout and call out the dogs and people can run around and fly at the rats with a broom and, yes, they'll run away. But they won't run far and they'll come back. When he was standing next to the bewildered man, he leaned towards him and whispered, And they live under your floorboard, sir. They know how to use fire. They know all about poison. Oh, yes. So, listen to this rat. Is it threatening us? said the mayor, looking down at Dark Tan. No, Mr. Mayor, said Dark Tan. I'm offering you, he glanced at Morris, who nodded, a wonderful opportunity. You really can talk? You can think? said the mayor. Dark Tan looked up at him. It had been a long night. He didn't want to remember any of it, and now it was going to be a longer, harder day. He took a deep breath. "'Here's what I suggest,' he said. "'You pretend that rats can think, and I'll promise to pretend that humans can think too.'" Chapter 12 "'Well done, Ratty Rupert!' cried the animals of Fairy Bottom. From Mr. Bunsey Has an Adventure. The crowd clustered into the council hall. Most of it had to stay outside, craning over other people's heads to see what was going on. The town council was crammed around one end of their long table. A dozen or so of the senior rats were crouched at the other end. And in the middle was Morris. He was suddenly there, leaping up from the floor. Hopwick, the clockmaker, glared at the other members of the council. "'We are talking to rats?' he snapped, trying to make himself heard above the hubbub. "'We'll be a laughing stock if this gets out. The town that talked to its rats. Can't you just see it?' "'Rats aren't dare to be spoken to,' said Ralphman, the bootmaker, prodding the mayor with a finger. "'A mayor who knew this business would send for the rat-catchers.' "'According to my daughter, they are locked in a cellar,' said the mayor. He stared at the finger. "'Locked in by your talking rats,' said Ralphman. "'Locked in by my daughter,' said the mayor calmly. "'Take your finger away, Mr. Alfman. "'She's taken the watchman down there. "'She's making very serious allegations, Mr. Alfman. "'She says there's a lot of food stored under their shed. "'She says they've been stealing it and selling it to the river traders. "'The head rat-catcher is your brother-in-law, isn't he, Mr. Alfman?' I remember you were very keen to see him appointed, weren't you? There was a commotion outside. Sergeant Doppelpunkt pushed his way through, grinning broadly, and laid a big sausage on the table. One sausage is hardly theft, said Ralphman. There was rather more commotion in the crowd, which parted to reveal what was, strictly speaking, a very slowly moving Corporal Knopf. This fact only became clear, though, when he'd been stripped of three bags of grain, eight strings of sausages, a barrel of pickled beetroot, and fifteen cabbages. Sergeant Doppelpunkt saluted smartly, to the sound of muffled swearing and falling cabbages. "'Requesting permission to take six men to help us to bring up the rest of the stuff, sir,' he said, beaming happily. "'Where are the rat-catchers?' said the mayor. "'In deep d trouble, sir,' said the sergeant. I asked them if they wanted to come out, but they said they'd like to stay in there a bit longer, thanks all the same, although they'd like a drink of water and some fresh trousers. Was that all they said? Sergeant Doppelpunkt pulled out his notebook. No, sir, they said quite a lot. They were crying, actually. They said they'd confess to everything in exchange for fresh trousers. Also, sir, there was this. Another watchman came in, carrying a heavy box, which he thumped down onto the polished table. Acting on information received from a rat, sir, V took a look under one of the floorboards in their shed. There must have been more than four hundred dollars in its ill-gotten gain, sir. You got information from a rat? The sergeant pulled sardines out of his pocket. 
The rat was eating a biscuit, but he raised his hat politely. "'Isn't that a bit unhygienic?' said the mayor. "'No, Gavi's washed his hands,' said Sardines. "'I was talking to the sergeant!' "'He's a nice little chap, sir, very clean,' said Sergeant Doublepoint. "'Reminds me of an empster I used to have when I was a lad, sir.' "'Well, thank you, Sergeant. Well done. Uh, please go on.' "'His name was Horace,' added the sergeant helpfully. Uh, "'Thank you, Sergeant. And now, does me good to see the little cheeks bulging with grub again, sir. Thank you, Sergeant.' When the sergeant had left, the mayor turned and stared at Mr. Ralphman. The man had the grace to look embarrassed. "'I hardly know the man,' he said hurriedly. "'He's just somebody my sister married, that's all. I hardly ever see him.' "'I quite understand,' said the mayor. "'And I've no intention of asking the sergeant to go and search your larder.' And he gave another little smile, and a sniff, and added, "'Yet. Now, where were we?' "'I was about to tell you a story,' said Morris. The town council stared at him. "'And your name is?' said the mayor, who was feeling in quite a good mood now. "'Morris,' said Morris. "'I'm a freelance negotiator, style of thing. I can see it's difficult for you to talk to rats, but humans like talking to cats, right?' "'Like him, Dick Livingstone?' said Hopwit, the clockmaker. "'Yeah, right, him, yeah, and—' Morris began. "'And uh, pushing boots,' said Corporal Knopf. "'Yeah, right, just like in books,' said Morris, scowling. "'Anyway, cats can talk to rats, okay, and I'm going to tell you a story. But first, I'm going to tell you that my clients, the rats, will all leave this town if you want them to, and they won't come back ever.' The humans stared at him. "'So did the rats.' "'Will we?' said Dark Tan. "'Will they?' said the mayor. "'Yes,' said Morris. "'And now I'm going to tell you a story about the Lucky Town. I don't know its name yet. Let's suppose my clients leave here and move down river, shall we? There are lots of towns on this river, I'll be bound. And somewhere there's a town that'll say, Why, we can do a deal with the rats. And that will be a very lucky town, because then there'll be rules, see?' Uh, "'Not exactly, no,' said the mayor. "'Well, in this lucky town, right, a lady making, as it might be, a tray of cakes, well, all she'll need to do is shout down the nearest rat hole and say, "'Good morning, rats. There's one cake for you. I'll be much obliged if and you didn't touch the rest of them.' And the rats will say, "'Right you are, missus. No problem at all.' And then, "'Are you saying we should bribe the rats?' said the mayor. "'Cheaper than pipers. Cheaper than rat-catchers,' said Morris. "'Anyway, it'll be wages. Wages for what, I hear you cry?' "'Did I cry that?' said the mayor. "'You were going to,' said Morris. "'And I was going to tell you that it'll be wages for vermin control.' "'What? But rats are ver—' "'Don't say it,' said Dark Ten. "'Vermin like cockroaches,' said Morris smoothly. I can see you've got a lot of them here. Can they talk? said the mayor. Now he had the slightly hunted expression of anyone who'd been talked at by Morris for any length of time. It said, I'm going where I don't want to go, but I don't know how to get off. No, said Morris, nor can the mice, nor can normal, nor can other rats. Well, vermin will be a thing of the past in that lucky town, because its new rats will be like a police force. Why, the clan will guard your larders. Sorry, I mean, the larders in that town. No rat catchers required. Think of the savings. But that'll only be the start. The woodcarvers will be getting richer, too, in the lucky town. How? said Houtman, the woodcarver, sharply. Because the rats will be working for them, said Morris. They have to gnaw all the time to wear their teeth down, so they might as well be making cuckoo clocks. And the clockmakers will be doing well, too. Why? said Hopwick, the clockmaker. Tiny little paws, very good with little springs and things, said Morris. And then... Uh, would they just do cuckoo clocks, or could they do other stuff, said Houtman. And then there's the whole tourism aspect, said Morris. For example, the rat clock. You know that clock they got in Bionk, in the town square, 
Little figures come out every quarter of an hour and bang the bells. Cling, bong, bang. Bing, clong, bong. Very popular. You can get postcards and everything. Big attraction. People come a long way just to stand there waiting for it. So what you're saying, said the clockmaker, is that if he, that is, if the lucky town had a special big clock under rats, people might come to see it. And stand around waiting for up to a quarter of an hour, said someone. A perfect time to buy tooth-crafted models of the clock, said the clockmaker, at very reasonable prices. People began to think about this. Uh, mugs with rats on, said the potter. hand nord souvenir wooden plates, said Hapman. Cuddly toy rats, rats on a stick. Dark Tan took a deep breath. Morris said quickly, a good idea made of toffee, naturally. He glanced towards Keith. And I expect the town would want to employ its very own rat piper, even, you know, for ceremonial purposes. Have your picture drawn with the official rat piper and his rat sort of thing? Any chance of a small theatre? said a little voice. Dark Tan spun round. Sardines, he said. Well, Gov, I thought if everyone was getting in on the act, Sardines protested. Morris, we ought to talk about this, said Dangerous Beans, tugging at the cat's leg. "'Excuse me a moment,' said Morris, giving the mayor a quick grin. "'I need to consult with my clients.' "'Of course,' he added. "'I'm talking about the lucky town, which won't be this one, because, of course, when my clients move out, some new rats will move in. There are always more rats, and they won't talk, and they won't have rules, and they'll whittle in the cream, and you'll have to find some new rat catchers, ones you can trust, and you won't have as much money, because everyone will be going to the other town. Just a thought. He marched down the table and turned to the rats. I was doing so well, he said. You could be on ten percent, you know. Your face is on mugs everything. And this is what we fought for all night, spat Dark Tan. To be pets. Morris, this isn't right, said Dangerous Beans. Surely it is better to appeal to the common bond between intelligent species than... I don't know about intelligent species. We're dealing with humans here, said Morris. Do you know about wars? Very popular with humans. They fight other humans. Not hugely big on common bonding. Yes, but we are not... Now listen, said Morris. Ten minutes ago, these people thought you were pests. Now they think you're useful. Who knows what I can make them think if you give me half an hour? You want us to work for them, said Dark Tan. We've won our place here. You'll be working for yourself, said Morris. Look, these people aren't philosophers. They're just every day. They don't understand about the tunnels. This is a market town. You've got to approach them in the right way. Anyway, you will keep other rats away, and you won't go around whittling in the jam, so you might as well get thanked for it. He tried again. There is going to be a lot of shouting, right, dear? And then sooner or later you have to talk. He saw the bewilderment still glazing their eyes, and turned to sardines in desperation. Help me, he said. He's right, boss. You've got to give him a show, said sardines, dancing a few steps nervously. They'll laugh at us said Dark Tan. Better laugh than scream, boss. It's a start. You've got to dance, boss. You can think and you can fight, but the world's always move in, and if you want to stay ahead, you've got to dance. He raised his hat and twirled his cane. On the other side of the room, a couple of humans saw him and chuckled. See? he said. I doped. There was an island somewhere, said Dangerous Beans, a place where rats could really be rats. And we've seen where that leads, said Dark Tan. And you know... I don't think there's any wonderful islands in the distance for people like us. Not for us, he sighed. If there's a wonderful island anywhere, it's here. But I'm not intending to dance. Figure of speech, boss. Figure of speech, said Sardines, hopping from one foot to the other. There was a thump from the other end of the table. The mayor, who had been arguing with some of the councillors, had hit it with his fist. We've got to be practical, he shouted. How much worse off can we be? They can talk. I'm not going to go all through this again, understand? We've got food. We've got a lot of money back. We survived the piper. These are lucky rats. The figures of Keith and Melissa loomed over them. It sounds as if my father's coming round to the idea, said Melissa. What about you? Discussions are continuing, said Morris. 
Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, look, look. Morris told me where to look, and I found this in the tunnel, said Melissa. She put something down on the table. Pages were stuck together, and they were all stained, but it was still recognisable as Mr. Bunsey has an adventure. I had to lift up a lot of drain gratings, she said. The rats looked at it. Then they looked at dangerous beans. It's Mr. Flop, Peaches began. I know, I can smell it, said Dangerous Beans. The rats all looked again at the remains of the book. It's a lie, said Peaches. Maybe it's just a pretty story, said Sardines. Yes, said Dangerous Beans. Yes. He turned his misty pink eyes to Dark Tan, who had to stop himself from stepping back, and added, Perhaps it's a map. If it was a story and not real life, then humans and rats would have shaken hands and gone on into a bright new future. But since it was real life, there had to be a contract. A war that had been going on since people first lived in houses could not end with just a happy smile. And there had to be a committee. There was so much detail to be discussed. The town council were on it, and most of the senior rats. And Morris marched up and down the table, joining in. Dark Tan sat at one end. He wanted to sleep. His wound ached, his teeth ached, and he hadn't eaten for ages. For hours the argument flowed back and forwards over his drooping head. He didn't pay attention to who was doing the talking. Most of the time it seemed to be everyone. Next item. Compulsory bells on all cats. Agreed? Can we just get back to Clause 30, Mr. Air Morris? You're saying killing a rat would be murder? Yes, of course. But it's just... Talk to the poor, mister, because the whiskers don't want to know. The cat is right, said the mayor. You're out of order, Mr. Ralphman. We've been through this. Then what about if a rat steals from me? Ahem. <clears throat> then that'll be theft, and the rat will have to go before the justices. Oh, young, said Ralphman. Peaches, I'm a rat, sir. And, uh, and the watch officers will be able to get down the rat tunnels, will they? Yes, because there will be rat officers in the watch. There'll have to be, said Morris. No problem. Really? And what does Sergeant Doppelpunkt think about that? Sergeant Doppelpunkt? Er, uh, do you, sir? Could be all right, I suppose. I know I couldn't get down a rat hole. We've had to mix the badges smaller, of course. I take it that rat watchman would only arrest rats, yes? The sergeant scratched his head. No, sir. The way I see it, they'd arrest anyone who needed arresting. What? Surely you wouldn't suggest a rat officer could be allowed to arrest a human? Oh, yes, sir, said the sergeant. What? Well, if your rat's a proper spawning watchman... I mean, a watch rat, then you can't go around saying you're not allowed to arrest anyone bigger than you, can you? Could be useful, a rat watchman. I understand they have this trick where they run up your trouser leg. Gentlemen, we should move on. I suggest this one goes to the subcommittee. Which one, sir? We've already got seventeen. There was a snort from one of the councillors. This was Mr. Schlummer, who was ninety-five and had been peacefully asleep all morning. The snort meant that he was waking up. He stared at the other side of the table. His whiskers moved. Um, there's a rat there, he said, pointing. Look, um, bold as brass, a rat in a hat. Yes, sir, this is a meeting to talk to the rats, sir, said the person beside him. He looked down and fumbled for his glasses. "'What's that?' he said. He looked closer. "'Yeah, yeah, yeah he said. And, "'And you are that, too?' "'Yes, sir. Name of nourishing, sir. "'We're here to talk to humans to stop all the trouble.' Mr. Schlummer stared at the rat. Then he looked across the table at Sardines, who raised his hat. Then he looked at the mare, who nodded. He looked at everyone again, his lips moving as he tried to sort this out. "'You're all talking,' he said at last. "'Yes, sir,' said Nourishing. "'So who's doing the listening?' he said. "'I expect that'll happen later on,' said Morris. Mr. Schlummer glared at him. "'Are you a cat?' he demanded. "'Yes, sir,' said Morris. 
Mr. Schlummer digested this point too. "'I thought we used to kill the rats,' he said, as if it wasn't quite certain any more. "'Yes, but you see, sir, this is the future,' said Morris. "'Is it?' said Mr. Schlummer. "'Really? I always wondered when the future was going to happen. No, no, well, cats talk now, too. Well, well done. Got to move with the, um, with the things that move, obviously. Wake me up when they bring the tea in.' He settled happily back in his chair, and after a while began to snore. Around him the arguments started again and kept going. A lot of people talked, some people listened, occasionally they agreed, and moved on, and argued about other things. But the piles of paper on the table grew bigger, and looked more and more official. Dark Tan realised that someone was watching him. At the other end of the table the mayor was giving him a long, thoughtful stare. As he watched, the man leaned back and said something to a clerk, who nodded and walked around the table, past the arguing people, until he reached Dark Tan. He leaned down. "'Can you understand me?' he said, pronouncing each word very carefully. "'Yes, because I'm not stupid,' said Dark Tan. "'Oh!' Uh, the mayor wonders if he can see you in his private office, said the clerk. The door over there. I could help you down if you like. I could bite your finger if you like, said Dark Tan. The mayor was already walking away from the table. Dark Tan slid down and followed him. No one paid any attention to either of them. The mayor waited until Dark Tan's tail was out of the way and carefully shut the door. The room was small and untidy. Paper occupied most flat surfaces. Bookcases filled several of the walls. Extra books and more paper were stuffed in between the tops of the books and any space in the shelves. The mayor, moving with exaggerated delicacy, went and sat in a big, rather tatty swivel chair and looked down at Dark Tan. "'I'm going to get this wrong,' he said. "'I thought we should have uh, a little talk. Can I pick you up? I mean, it'll be easier to talk to you if you were on my desk.' "'Really,' said Dark Tan. "'I might say... "'It'd be easier to talk to you if you lay flat on the floor,' he sighed. He was too tired for these games. "'Look, if you put your hand flat on the floor, I'll stand on it, and you can raise it up to the height of the desk,' he said. "'But if you try any tricks, I'll bite your thumb off.' The mayor lifted him up with extreme caution. Dark Tan hopped off into the mass of papers, empty teacups, and old pens that covered the battered leather top, and stood looking up at the embarrassed man. "'Ah!' Uh, "'Do you have to do much paperwork in your job?' said the mayor. "'Peaches writes things down,' said Dark Tan bluntly. "'That's the little female rat that coughs before she speaks, isn't it?' said the mayor. "'That's right.' "'She's very definite, isn't she?' said the mayor. And now Dark Tan could see that he was sweating. "'She's rather frightening some of the councillors.' <laughs> "'Ha-ha!' said Dark Tan. The mayor looked miserable. He seemed to be searching for something to say. "'You are uh, settling in well,' he said. "'I spent part of last night fighting a dog in a rat pit, and then I think I was stuck in a rat trap for a while,' said Dark Tan, in a voice like ice. "'And then there was a bit of a wall. Apart from that, I can't complain.' The mayor gave him a long, worried stare. For the first time he could remember, Dark Tan felt sorry for a human— the mayor seemed to be as tired as Dark Tan felt. Look, he said, I think it might work if that's what you want to ask me. The mayor brightened up. You do, he said. There's a lot of arguing. That's why I think it might work, said Dark Tan. Men and rats arguing. You're not poisoning our cheese, and we're not whittling in your jam. It's not going to be easy, but it's a start. But there's something I have to know, said the mayor. Yes? "'You could have poisoned our wells. "'You could have set fire to our houses. "'My daughter tells me you are very advanced. "'You don't owe us anything. "'Why didn't you?' "'I asked myself that, too,' said Dark Tan. "'And I told myself, what good would it do? "'What would we have done afterwards? "'Gone to another town? "'Gone through all this again? "'Would killing you have made anything better for us? "'Sooner or later... "'We'd have to talk to humans. It might as well be you.' "'I'm glad you like us,' said the mayor. 
Dark Tan opened his mouth to say, Like you? No, we just don't hate you enough. We're not friends. But there would be no more rat pits. No more traps. No more poisons. True, he was going to have to explain to the clan what a policeman was, and why rat policemen might chase rats who broke the new rules. They weren't going to like that. They weren't going to like that at all. Even a rat with the marks of the bone rat's teeth on him was going to have difficulty with that. But Morris had said, They'll do this, you'll do that. No one will lose very much, and everyone will gain a lot. The town will prosper, everyone's children will grow up, and suddenly it'll all be normal. And everyone likes things to be normal. They don't like to see normal things changed. It must be worth a try, thought Dark Tan. Now, I want to ask you a question, he said. You've been the leader for how long? Ten years, said the mayor. Isn't it odd? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Everyone argues with me all the time, said the mayor. Although I must say I'm expecting a little less arguing if all this works out. But it's not an easy job. It's ridiculous to have to shout all the time just to get things done, said Dark Tan. That's right, said the mayor. And everyone expects you to decide things, said Dark Tan. True. The last leader gave me some advice just before he died, and do you know what it was? Don't eat the green wobbly bit. Good advice, said the mayor. In his world, yes, said Dark Tan. But all he had to do was be big and tough and fight all the other rats that wanted to be leader. It's a bit like that with the council, said the mayor. What? said Dark Tan. You bite him in the neck. Not yet, said the mayor, but it's a tempting thought, I must say. It's just all a lot more complicated than I ever thought it would be, said Dark Tan, bewildered. To be a leader, you have to learn to shout. But after you've learned to shout, you have to learn not to. Right again, said the mayor. That's how it works. He put his hand down on the desk, palm up. May I? he said. I want to show you something. Dark Tan stepped aboard and kept his balance as the mayor carried him over to the window and set him down on the sill. "'See the river,' said the mayor. "'See the houses. See the people in the streets. I have to make it work. Well, not the river, obviously, that works by itself. And every year it turns out that I haven't upset enough people for them to choose anyone else as mayor. So I have to do it again. It's a lot more complicated than I ever thought it would be.' "'You too? But you're isn't. Ha! You'll think that makes it easier. I thought rats were wild and free. Ha! said Dark Tan. They both stared out the window. Down in the square they could see Keith and Melissa walking along deep in conversation. If you like, said the mayor after a while, you could have a little desk here in my office. I'll live underground, thank you all the same, said Dark Tan, pulling himself together. Little desks are a bit too Mr. Bunsey. The mayor sighed. I suppose so. Um, he looked as if he was about to share some guilty secret, and in a way he was. I did like those books when I was a boy, though. Of course, I knew it was all nonsense, but all the same it was nice to think that— Yeah, yeah, said Dark Tan. But the rabbit was stupid. Who ever heard of a rabbit talking? Oh, yes, I never liked the rabbit, said the mayor. No one likes the rabbit, said Dark Tan. It was the minor characters everyone liked, said the mayor. Ratty Rupert, and Phil the Pheasant, and Ollie the Snake. Oh, come on, said Dark Tan. Ollie the Snake had a collar and tie. Well? Well, how did it stay on? A snake is tube-shaped. Do you know, I never thought of it like that, said the mayor. Silly, really. He'd wriggle out of it, wouldn't he? And waistcoats on rats don't work. No? No, said Dark Tan. I tried it. Tool belts are fine, but not waistcoats. Dangerous Beans got quite upset about that, but I told him, you've got to be practical. It's just like I always tell my daughter, said the man. Stories are just stories. Life is complicated enough as it is. We have to plan for the real world. There's no room for the fantastic. Exactly, said the Rat. And man and rat talked as the long light faded into the evening. A man was painting very carefully a little picture underneath the street sign that said River Street. It was a long way underneath, only just higher than the pavement. 
and he had to kneel down. He kept referring to a small piece of paper in his hand. The picture looked like three concentric circles followed by a short wiggly line followed by a group of small circles overlapping like a handful of pebbles. Keith laughed. What's funny? said Melissa. It's in the rat alphabet, said Keith. It says water plus fast plus stones. The streets have got cobbles on, right? So rats see them as stones. It means river street. Both languages on the street signs. Clause 193, said Melissa. That's fast. They only agreed that two hours ago. I suppose that means there will be tiny signs in human language in the rat tunnels. I hope not, said Keith. Why not? Because rats mostly mark their tunnels by whittling on them. He was impressed at the way Melissa's expression didn't change a bit. I can see we're all going to have to make some important mental adjustments, she said thoughtfully. It was odd about Morris, though, after my father told him there were plenty of kindly old ladies in the town that would be happy to give him a home. You mean when he said that wouldn't be any fun getting it that way, said Keith? Yes. Do you know what he meant? Sort of. He meant he's Morris, said Keith. I think he had the time of his life, strutting up and down the table, ordering everyone around. He even said me and the rats could keep the money we buried. He said a little voice in his head told him it was really ours. Melissa appeared to think about things for a while, and then she said, as if it wasn't very important, really, And, er, uh, you're staying, yes? Clause 9, Resident Rat Piper, said Keith. I'll get an official suit so I don't have to share with anyone, a hat with a feather, and a pipe allowance. That will be quite satisfactory, said Melissa. Um, yes. When I told you that I had two sisters, uh, that wasn't entirely true, she said. And it wasn't a lie, of course, but it was just enhanced a bit. Yes. I mean, it would be more literally true to say that I have, in fact, no sisters at all. Ah, said Keith. But I have millions of friends, of course, Melissa went on. She looked, Keith thought, absolutely miserable. That's amazing, he said. Most people just have a few dozen. Millions, said Melissa. Obviously, there's always room for another one. Good, said Keith. And uh, there's clause five, said Melissa, still looking a bit nervous. Oh, yes, said Keith. That one puzzled everyone. A slap-up tea with cream buns and a medal, right? Yes, said Melissa. It wouldn't be properly over otherwise. Would you, er, uh, join me? Keith nodded. He stared around at the town. It seemed a nice place. Just the right size. A man could find a future here. Yes, he said. Yes, I think I'll stay. There's a town where... Every time the clock shows a quarter of an hour, the rats come out and strike the bells, and people watch and cheer, and buy the souvenir hands gnawed mugs and plates and spoons, clocks and other things, which have no use whatsoever other than to be bought and taken home. And they go into the rat's museum, and they eat rat burgers, guaranteed no rat, and buy rat ears that you can wear, and buy the books of rat poetry in rat language, and say, how odd, when they see the street signs in rat and marvel at how the whole place seems so clean. And once a day, the town's rat piper, who is rather young, plays his pipes, and the rats dance to the music, usually in a conga line. It's very popular. On special days, a little tap-dancing rat organises vast dancing spectaculars, with hundreds of rats in sequins, and water ballet in the fountains, and elaborate sets. And there are lectures about the rat tax, and how the whole system works and how the rats have a town of their own under the human town and get free use of the library and sometimes even send their young rats to the school and everyone says how perfect how well organised how amazing and then most of them go back to their own towns and set their traps and put down their poisons because some minds you couldn't change with a hatchet but a few see the world as a different place it's not perfect but it works the thing about stories is that you have to pick the ones that last. And far downstream, a handsome cat, with only a few bare patches still in his fur, jumped off a barge, sauntered along the dock, and entered a large and prosperous town. 
it spent a few days beating up the local cats and getting the feel of the place, and, most of all, in sitting and watching. Finally, it saw what it wanted. It followed a young lad out of the city. He was carrying a stick over his back, which was a knotted handkerchief of the kind used by people in story circumstances to carry all their worldly goods. The cat grins to himself. If you knew their dreams, you could handle people. The cat followed the boy all the way to the first milestone along the road, where the boy sat down for a rest, and heard, Hey, stupid-looking kid, want to be Lord Mayor? Nah, down here, kid. Because some stories end, but old stories go on, and you've got to dance to the music if you want to stay ahead.